brighter and you know you know you are strong and you definitely are better than everyone else if we went down through history yeah. and we looked at like who those bike riders were every single race they're trying to blow everyone else apart that's right and then you know whatever they have left for the run they have left for the the run yeah yeah i mean these days you know you have to be a little bit more savvy because there's definitely a lot of guys that can ride the bike fast but definitely when that's your strength and and you have the mentality of, of being an uber bike rider you are going to push it you know because they just have this uncanny ability to be able to do that and they can do it every time they sign up for a race yeah, well, great points, great points as well as we're looking at uh, Richard Varga from Slovakia having a little discussion here uh, with the officials. So anytime an official talks to you, you got to pay attention. He's back into Arrow and getting after it. Remember, Richard Varga, a short core superstar, new to the Ironman game, certainly not new to racing a triathlon and certainly not new to high level performance, but uh, it is something you got to watch out for. We're very strict on our 12 meter drafting rule and just to touch on that for those of you that are not aware uh the rules state that you must be 12 meters between bikes from the front of the wheel the guy in front of you to your front wheel and here's the story you get 25 seconds to pass the tricky thing that hangs people up mj when they come to this um ironman format is if you enter that zone so if you you're if you enter the draft zone intentionally or unintentionally if you're inside 12 meters you can't just hit the brakes and slow back out of it you cannot do that once in the zone there's only one exit path and that is through the front of the zone so if you roll inside the 12 meters because you look down and the person slowed and you're in the zone you've got to hit the gas go around and do so in 25 seconds a really important distinction there for uh, for these riders because when you don't know that, if you roll in and roll out, roll in, roll out, guess what? You've just drafted, even though maybe you didn't get the benefit. So something that I think will hang people up. Let's talk about the specifics since I'm blabbing. You get a blue card, which is a five-minute penalty. So if you do find yourself with a drafting penalty, the protocol for our sport is you head to the next penalty tent. You'll pull into that tent. And you'll say, look, I got a blue card because I was drafting. You, you don't always have to say all that. And they and they sit you down for five minutes. You'll get a stopwatch. You'll get a photo. You'll sign in. It's pretty official. And uh, they track that for you. And then you head on out uh, again after five minutes is up. No, yeah, yeah. You know, it's the rules have a purpose. That's for sure. And, like, as a racer, it's like you have to be a little careful when you're on this type of course as well. Because, you know, you can sort of get your head down and sort of get into that that zone where you like have to make a pass and you know it's really really important that you do stay conscious of where your positioning is and you know as the if we get bigger and bigger packs it gets a little more complicated because then you've got to upset your rhythm because you put your head down you're feeling good and then you get inside a zone and sometimes you've got to put that little once you're in the zone you've got to you've got to pass that's it so you know that can really like spike your heart rate fatigue your legs out, especially if it's happening a, a, for a lot during the race. So the ideal situation is, you know, to be able to race your race at your level of power and not have to like keep burning matches to stay in that legal position rather than illegal position. And, you know, you don't want to get a penalty because five minutes is is a lot of time it's still in a yeah. nine man it may not sound like that much but five minutes when you're sitting there in the penalty tent <laughs> and they've started the the clock it's like it's going to feel like eternity feels but like a year and a half yeah, yeah. And, but it's been interesting you know as you know the rules work its way through the system and people get used to it and then you know we've had races where people actually have benefit by sitting in the penalty tent you know because they've had a chance to get their heart For rate sure. down they yeah. like they can't they don't offer any outside nutrition, but, you know, yeah. you can have your own nutrition. So it can work to your advantage as well. I mean, you never want it to happen, but, you know, it has been cases in the past where it has benefited I, the athlete. I can I can agree with you, and I can say that Tim DeBoom and uh, Luke Van Leerda both won Ironman Hawaii with penalties the years that they, that they, two of the years, one of the years that each of them won, they've won multiples. But so talking about that, that is a point you can win. So here's the big thing. As you as you talk about that, 
Um, and and I'm <laughs> I'm going to say this: it's how you address it mentally, right? So if you're an athlete that gets a penalty and completely freaks out you're toast. It's going to really affect you. It's going to really grind you down. As we look at the the smooth form of Lauren Brandon, you can't mistake that aerodynamics. Um, although it actually looks like, uh, hopefully I'm correct on that one. If I said I can't mistake it, I'm mistaken it. Um, but nonetheless, I think it really comes back to that, McKeely, where you, you're talking about, because this could be Rachel, we're, ta- we're talking about mental, right? If you If you address it mentally in a good fashion, you're okay. You just keep going. You 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 don't want to um, sort of stew on it too much. You just want to get in and get out if you get that penalty. Let's talk about some more positive stuff as we get back here on course and we watch this uh, women's race. Super exciting. We want to talk about some of the other athletes we haven't seen yet, of course, in the race. Um, and, and yeah, I will say I was completely wrong. That is Rachel. Uh, now as we come around, it's really easy to see. She's coming around as Rachel Zlinska. She's 24 years old and she is cranking it. Uh, she looks great. You talked about her Ironman Florida performance. Really, really well done there, um, where she was able to get in and have a great race. A lot of young talent today, uh, MJ. And now we're back with Lauren Brandon up front. So, uh, if I even just paid attention to my graphics instead of trying to check out these ladies' legs, I might actually have a better shot of doing a good job. But Lauren Brandon up front, pushing away McKeeley, and uh, no surprise really here to see her um, get away as she's doing. No, definitely this is her race strategy. And, you know, both uh, Brandon and Zalaskas, they actually have a probably a gap of her over five minutes right now on the rest of the field. Uh, Macaulay is sitting in third right now. And then we have Vok in fourth. Melanie McQuaid is doing really, really good in fifth. Um, she's right alongside Dee Dee. Um, and then we have Smith. And then we also have our Japanese athlete um, sitting in eighth right now. That She's making her Ironman debut. But one thing that I did want to, to bring up is the fact that You may not be seeing Ben Hoffman right now. Apparently, he did lose his chip, but he still is in the race. So just wanted to bring that point up, even though we are on the women's race right now. um, If people are frantically searching and going, what happened to Ben Hoffman? Apparently, he's still on course, and he lost his timing chip, unfortunately. There you go. And I love what you were going through, kind of calling out some names. Of course, the Japanese athlete, Ai Ueda, she's in there about 13 minutes down. Let's keep going because two players that are moving forward in the women's race that I do expect they'll find their way into that top five pretty soon is Danielle Lewis, uh, previously Danielle Dingman. She is fantastic on the 70.3 distance, an exceptional uh, bike runner, someone that I think is going to do really well today, her first Ironman. Watch out for Danielle Lewis. She's just a a great talent and a great, great hard worker. So look out for her as we're um, also saying Jen Annett, the Canadian athlete based in Penticton, home of Ironman Canada again. So Jen Annett, she's she's hit the world championship title, uh, got that to her credit for I2 long course. So Jen Annett, another bike runner to watch out for. But talking about the bike and the running, we have that to come. We're going to watch more of Lauren Brandon and the cast of characters here. Stay with us. We'll be back in a couple short minutes. And we are back here with Lauren Brandon from Texas by way of Utah. 
Here she is. She's in first place. She loves to be up front. She's got an hour and 41 minutes of racing under her belt. She looks great, smooth as butter. And, uh, McKeely, here's here's the thing. We're early. It's probably feeling kind of cool, wouldn't you say, as far as air? I mean, it doesn't feel hot. Let's say that. I don't know if it feels cool. But don't you feel like early on when you're in this kind of uh, zone from a temperature standpoint where it's maybe – low 70s and some humid air it feels kind of good does that trick you into bad it, or maybe i'm wrong uh, maybe i'm wrong what do you think well i the one thing on the bike right you do get a little bit of that wind chill so because you're moving at such a, a a fast speed uh you know 70s if you're running is different to 70s when when you're biking so that little bit of a wind chill is going to feel really comfortable like 70 is sort of like if you were going to race an Ironman, that would be a nice temperature for all yes. day long. You yes. know, you would see some super fast times. But right now, it's like they're not thinking about the temperature. They're so focused on, on what they're doing in the moment right now. And that's super important because, you know, what happens now will have a big impact later on. You know, am I riding the power that I need to ride? Yes. Am I hydrating to the point that I... I'm going to get through the race. Um, how are my calorie intake? Yeah. You know, all those sort of things. They're the sort of things that you you want to concentrate on, you know, concentrating, staying in that aerodynamic position for as long as you can. Um, you know, Lauren is doing a great job in terms of aerodynamics. And we also saw Richard Varga on, on the men's side as well. So, you know, they're the sort of things earlier in the race. It's like you've got to keep to that pattern of, okay, how's my pacing? How's my hydration? How's my energy level? You know, a lot of things don't happen until we reach 120K, um, 80 miles in the bike. You know, that's where the you start to see how good this part of the race was for you. You know, was my pacing great? Was my nutrition ga- great? And, and it's also like, that's when the race starts to happen because, you know, any of those Uber bike riders, they would have made up big amounts of time as well. So early in the race, you know, you just want to stay smooth. You want to stay comfortable. And, you know, the weather helps as well. You know, the, if the weather's not heating up as quickly as you expected, that's sort of going to put a little bit of a smile on your face if you can smile on an Ironman. Yes, and we're looking at Jesper Svensson here pushing some big watts up this overpass. A reports here from on course are actually that it's quite breezy out there on uh, the tollway. So looking at actually some footage, some pictures from some of our key spotters out there on the ground and the wind's blowing. You can see those flags kind of ripping it. So winds are picking up. Remember, those are going to be into your head on the way out uh, into your uh, tailwind pushing you home. But how did we get here today to this bike course? We started, of course, in the Roca swim. Let's have a look back at how it played out. Early hours, 625 a.m., the professional men Got after it. Non-wetsuit swim Slovakia's Richard Varga took off, but he couldn't ditch everyone. He dragged some company throughout most of his swim. He came out in not record time. The women, five minutes later, they got underway with Lauren Brandon doing what she does best, which is just set that early tempo. She dragged along with her. I shouldn't say it that way. Rachel Zelinskis kept up with her throughout that swim, came out of the water in tandem, but Throughout this course, a lot of separation, upwards of three to five minutes between some of our our leaders and our key players. But how about that Richard Vargas in the pink cap? He did everything he could to get rid of company and couldn't do it. He uh, dragged, you know, a handful of folks came out of the water with this young man. But there she was, Lauren Brandon and Rachel Zelinskis. Zelinskis those two just really the American athletes really gapped themselves, had five minutes on Jocelyn McCauley, uh, but out of the water here in about 47-47, Richard Varga in his first Ironman, really, really well done, hitting solid ground. Lauren Brandon, she is used to having swim records and first places out of the water. She did so today off her own course record. Five minutes back, that was Jocelyn McCauley. Wow, what a start to the day before we got onto this beautiful bike course. And we're back to the, the men's race right now. And 
you know, Richard Vargas was leading the swim and he's still leading the bike right now. So he's definitely having a, a, a great day out there um, to be in the lead. Uh, in his, this is his first ever Ironman, I believe, right? With Richard they, Vargas. Richard Vargas, first, that's yeah. right, first. So, you know, to, to make an Ironman debut and to be sitting in first, and obviously we knew he was going to lead in the swim and still leading on the bike. So, you know, great to see. Um, right now we also have in fourth Jesper Stempson. Uh, uh, you know, I think he's definitely one to watch. You know, he's a solid character. Um, I, I like his confidence too. You know, going into this race, he, he was confident that he had done the training that he needed to do. Um, he felt like he'd put in a nice block of, of training. And I think he's he's definitely going to be one as he, he makes the pass right now. Yeah, so now we're on Dietlev. So Dietlev and Svensson riding together. And, and Jesper Svensson absolutely should be confident. He's... He's a guy that a couple years ago, back in 18, he did two, he did back-to-back -back Ironman wins, Barcelona, Brazil. He he really impressed with that turnaround form. Confident, young, a great, you know, great guy and really strong on the bike. Dietlev also unproven at the distance, but certainly someone to watch out for. The two, uh, the Dane and the Swede riding together, interchanging their lead as they chase down. Up the road, Sam Laidlow, uh, the 23-year-old out of France. What I love about him is is your whole background. He's got this family of triathletes and this family of sport. Um, he's still in first, back and forth a little bit with Richard Varga. So it's interesting. But those are your top four. As we come back, we want to do this. We want to get inside the head of the guy on camera, Magnus Dietlieve. We caught up with him him earlier this week, and here's what he had to say. Hey, I'm Magnus. Welcome and thanks for joining. Let's go for the last interval session before the Ironman. Hello. Hello. <laughs> this is uh, my coach. Hello. Hey. He's also racing. So it's my first full distance and uh, I think it fits quite nice in the schedule timing wise already planned to do a big block of just pure endurance uh, stuff to make me more like uh, resilient for 70.3 also because that has been like my weakness in those races my goal for the race it's uh, since it's my first full distance it's a little bit hard to say <laughs> or to know what i can expect 100 percent also because of the tricky conditions here with the it can be extremely hot and humid so but we've done some testing at home and know approximately where like what my paces should be on the bike and run uh, but for sure my goal is to compete for the win here in Texas that's also what I'm aiming for is to qualify for Kona we are actually on the run course now and this is Wednesday <laughs> and my last uh, hard run session before the race. Uh, for me it's quite important not to like to still keep a decent volume in race week so that the body doesn't go to sleep. So today I'm doing 5 by 2 kilometers at uh, yeah, low threshold pace. So that's uh, running with my coach and then another training mate also. It's going to be fun. I think it's very hot, but my core temperature is still under control. So <laughs> I think if it, these conditions is okay, but it looks to be maybe a little bit <laughs> warmer. So, <laughs> but it was a good workout. It's easy to run fast when you have the race shoes on. And we are back. And what a great episode of Fighting Chance. You know, I, I actually watch all the episodes. I love them. Uh, and, you know, the great thing is you can catch all the full episodes of our, of the Race Week series. Um, I'm in Texas. You can get online right now. A fighting chance on all the social media channels at Iron Man Try. Yeah, check it out. It's kind of cool to see that you just mentioned kind of the lab rat status. And and here's 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 what I love. So Magnus did leave a lot of that I like. You know, he's in there training. He's on course. He's getting that. He's doing five times two kids, a big workout. 
He's doing that in the heat, and they're tracking that data. They're tracking that core temperature uh, back to second place. Richard Varga chasing Sam Laidlow. Uh, these two men are really pushing it down the highway together, alternating. So depending on when the camera's on, I'm one's in first, then the next is in first. But they're really they're really pushing away. Nice big gap. I mean, still four minutes. A, a spotter on the ground as well said that gap just looks massive out there on the um, on the tollway. So second place now, Dietlev. I'm sorry, um, second place for Varga behind Sam Laidlow from France. Um, but come back to this. How cool to be able to get out there with a training partner, with your coach, train on the course, and track what your core temperature is doing. This is stuff that, to be quite frank, didn't you know doesn't exist for everyone and, and didn't exist a few years ago just to have that technology and have that ability. So great, and it shows that scientific approach of these athletes uh, that are trying to win this race. And I think the nice thing, too, with technology is the fact that, you know, you know, previous you'd have to do it in a lab. But now with, like, all the, the gadgets that you can use, you can actually get out in the field and actually, like, see what real life is all about. Because that's the thing, you know, you can get in a lab, but it doesn't always transfer to real life. And I think that's the nice thing with, like, technology these days. It's like you get a chance to test stuff out and then you can sort of refine, you know, not just your power zones, not just your heart rate zones, but, you know, your carbohydrate absorption and intake, uh, your sodium intake. You know, you can get instant feedback very, very quickly. You know, the lactate testing um, has been around for a, a long, long time. So what I like about the lactate testing, it, it really allows you when you're in that in that training environment to go, you know what, I need a little bit more recovery. No, I'm recovered. So I think, you know, some athletes, as they say, love it. Other athletes still like to go by that perceived effort. Yeah, that's right. And now you're looking at a nice little shot here, comparison shopping, if you will. That is uh, on the left side. Um, you're looking at Magnus Dietliv. And on the right side, you're looking at uh, Lauren Brandon here. When, now that we have a full screen shot here of the American superstar, check out how well she does this aero positioning. The helmet seamlessly integrated to the upper back and shoulders. Uh, position dialed. The aero bar, she's tucked in and comfortable. A great cadence, pushing probably an 80 two to 84. Um, she does go a little lower, but in this section, it, it kind of comes up high. Here, here's what I'm seeing as well. She's got her head tucked down, but it's she doesn't have to drop it, right? You can see she's looking at the top of her visor, but it just really looks like a sustainably arrow position. Um, so I always, I always like to call attention to that. She hasn't gone extreme, but there's nothing I would, you know, there's nothing I would change. You can't get really any lower than that and maintain that power and comfort. So I feel like she's doing a great job and the numbers don't lie. Two minutes and 50 seconds ahead of Rachel Zelinska. She's got 4.10. So Jocelyn McCauley has clawed back almost a minute after after leaving T, um, T1. And Didi Griesbauer also making a move in fourth place now. No surprise. No, I mean, Didi is like consistent. You know, it's like it, you just can't ever count her out. She's always going to, you know, be hovering around that top five, uh, especially after the, the swim. And then on the bike, you know, she's she's very solid on, on the bike. And Melanie McQuaid, who's sitting in fifth, is, is sort of a little bit the same um, as we now also look at Rachel. I mean, she's slightly different in positioning to Brandon. Um, she's a little bit shorter in the aero bar set up. But still, like when you're talking about that shoulder position, not having to duck your head up and down because you don't want to fatigue out your, sh your shoulders. I do like Lauren's position um, from the top of her shoulder down to the elbow to her extensions through her wrist. It looks like, as you said, very sustainable. Um, she's got an, a nice cadence right now. Um, she's very, very steady. I mean... The nice thing on this course, you know, you, you, you do get it to get out of the saddle a little bit. That'll be a nice chance to, you know, stretch your back a little bit, get the quads working um, over time that you've been, you, you know, you spend a lot of time on the quads, a lot of overuse because you're on a flat course. So, I mean, she staying in an aero bar position for as much as she can and it looks very, very comfortable. And, you know, 
right now she's sort of going through, am I going to get out of the saddle? Am I going to go back down? Because really there's only so much time you can spend out of the saddle on a, on a, on a flat course like this. Yeah, you almost want to look for those overpasses and get out just because you don't need to, but just to give your back and your uh, – your, the back of your legs and your low back, a stretch, um, just to take that break, if you will. We all need them. We all take them. So uh, don't bust us when we do so. Here's the story, Lauren Brandon. She is getting away with it, and we're getting away for a quick break. We'll see you in just a minute. That thing John Moran has, that's a hypervolt. That thing he uses to warm up and stay loose before he throws it down. That thing Tony Finau uses on course between shots. Ooh, that's money. That thing Robin and I use before and after we're on the bike so we can ride harder tomorrow. That thing Erlen Holland uses before smashing it into the back of the net. That thing that's for everyone. The hypervolt from Hyper Ice. Give your body the daily relief it's been asking for. Oh, I'm so excited to be back here with Lauren Brandon. She's out front. She's pushing along. So some great racing as we talk about uh, this um, all-American field so far at the front. We've got Lauren Brandon, Rachel Zelinska. Then we've got Jocelyn McCauley and Dee Dee Griesbauer moved into fourth place. Um, and this is all our top four, um, a very elite field here. And I just want to make another mention of Dee Dee Griesbauer's last Ironman when she put forth the best bike time on the day in 4.30 down at Ironman Cozumel in Mexico on a flatter, you know, flatter course, not unlike this one. So look to her to really be able to put that together, McKeeley. When you're talking about 4.30, I think Lauren Brandon also in that territory. Um, really something to look forward to is just these finish times and this impressive show. And then if we just kind of back it up, we haven't seen Jocelyn McCauley but a couple times on camera she is someone that not only has she won three Ironmans, uh, but she's done so in style. She can swim, bike, and run it consistently well. She's She doesn't have a weakness. Uh, she'll never necessarily have to put the best split out there. She just puts three great splits together and then sneaks away with the win. So look out for, for them. And, and, of course, we talked about Danielle Lewis, Mel McQuay, Jen Annett. Those women are also I wouldn't even say dark horses because I'll say true threats. Uh, shame as we look at someone getting a, a flat change there, a little help from the tech support on the left side of your screen, screen as we go up a hill. Talk about flat. Look at that hill. Yeah, there's definitely uh, a little reprieve from uh, the the flatness of this course, that's for sure, and the athletes definitely enjoy that. But it does also mess up your rhythm a little bit, you know, if you're really, like, in that little zone and then you have to get out like some athletes don't like that transition but you know most athletes sort of appreciate it but i did want to go back to the and talk a little bit about bike times for some of the women yeah like we definitely have lauren brandon who has you know gone like 440 on the bike uh joshlyn mccauley has gone 440 on the bike um and then you sort of look at some of the other athletes like Jen Annette, who we haven't really talked about, you know, she went 425 at Ironman Texas. <laughs> so, you know, she's not a great swimmer, but she definitely is one to watch to see come up through the field. You know, Danielle Lewis, we really don't know what she's capable of at the moment because this is making her debut. Right there, we see Jocelyn McCauley, who's sitting in third right now. She's definitely making up some time on Lauren Brandon. Because after the swim, she was uh, around that five-minute deficit. And now she's sitting within that four-minute. So, you know, when we look, will a pass happen? You know, we're probably looking way, way later in the race. Because if we're thinking every 20 miles, she's taking maybe like 45 seconds out, you know, that's way towards the end of the bike leg. But, you know, when we look at the run splits, you know, definitely Joshua McCauley has it over Lauren Brandon. Um, so that will be interesting. And, you know, 
even though Jocelyn's done this course like many times and, you know, she was second in 2019, you know, in terms of age, she's fairly young. You know, she's still 34. Oh, so, yeah. So, you know, in terms of when you're, you're looking at, you know, their athletic age, you know, she has been doing it for a while. But in terms of her Ironman age, she's really, really nice. And it actually looks like she actually has made a pass because Jocelyn McCauley is out actually now in second place. So that just tells you that between Lauren and Jocelyn, that they definitely are the ones that are making the moves right now at the front of the race. And, you know, some of those other athletes that we talked about, like Jen Annette, and, you know, even Dee Dee, you know, Dee Dee's quite com uh, capable of an under five hour bike ride. And on this course, you know, there should be a lot of athletes. If, if it's windy, then it's gonna be closer to that five hours. If there's not as much wind, it'll be close to that 440. Or if it's a great day, it could be down to 425. That's, that's right. So all well said here as we come back to the men's leader, Sam Laidlow from France. He's out front, and we're going to get a nice look here down the leaderboard of everyone else. He's still together with Varga, then Delave, Svensson, Acevedo, and company. So have a look here at what it looks like to lead an Ironman for this guy, 23 years young, a family of triathletes. And now have a look as we go to Xi from USA, He's uh, got probably my favorite kit right now because he's got leopard print accent. So Simon Shi, the American athlete uh, with, with, you know, let's be honest, with style and flair. So he's in there as well. And we're going to kind of get a nice look at everyone. So folks who have been dying to see their peeps, let's have a nice look in here as we get, uh, as we get through this men's chase pack. So right there, Simon Shi, great stuff. I mean, seriously. How cool is that kit? Can Michael, I, say more? I can see you wearing that kit any day of the week. <laughs> I'm wearing it now <laughs> as we as we scroll through and we're going to get a nice look in at as many of these athletes as we can and doing some quick work. That's number 51. We're looking at Elliot Bach, also a former Texas resident, now living in Colorado. Elliot Bach, USA, uh, someone that has also come and been chiseling down his Ironman times. But my favorite part of what our crew is doing now is giving us that nice little look in at everyone. So Elliot Bach currently riding along in a great position. He looks strong, MJ. I mean, I would say um, he looks like he's got a, a pretty well dialed aero position. So folks at home getting a, a nice look at Elliot on camera showcasing what he's capable of today. No, he's definitely looking super, super smooth. Uh, yeah, we've been talking about aerodynamics and how important it is in this particular race. Um, yes, because it's flat. Uh, yes, because it, it gets very, very windy out there. Definitely, you know, you have that 20, basically you have 20 miles of headwind, 20 miles of tailwind. So in terms of watts, you know, definitely you've got to be a little careful because you're definitely going to be pushing more watts uh, in, the, in the headwind. And then sort of when you turn around, you've got to make sure that you actually keep your watts up a little bit higher as well because you're going to be moving at such a high speed. So it's super, super important to also be conscious of the fact that, you know, your race plan is going to change a lot based on um, how that wind is. There you go. Elliot Bach making a move here on the, on the Polish athlete, if I'm seeing that correctly, um, Robert Wilowiecki, unless I've unless I've really got to get my eyes checked. Yeah, Robert Wilowiecki, so nice. Thank you so much. The graphic comes in, makes me look what I know, like I know what I'm doing. So Robert Wilowiecki from Poland. We've got a nice crew here, McKeeley. We're getting a good look in on everyone. Um, yeah, I think he was eighth out of the water. Um, and so he's probably, he's definitely sitting in the top 10 right now. So he's got to be pretty happy with that because, you know, in the men's race, there's so many athletes who are pretty close in terms of what they've done in the past in terms of finish times. Definitely we have some standouts, but then there's a nice group. And I think that's why you're seeing this pack of guys right now, because there's definitely like a nice group of athletes that, that, are, that are pretty consistent in terms of their Ironman times. There you go. And, and early on like this, because let's be honest, two hours into uh, an eight and sub hour a seven, eight hour race is just a drop in the bucket. It really is. So we're jumping ahead. That was Elliot Bach as we leap forward and grab another look in at some of our athletes here. Uh, you can tell um, that that this 
that this man is churning it out there um, in fine form. And, and if I'm not mistaken, it looks like uh, Pedro uh, Gomez, but I'm going to get a better a better number here um, in a second if that is. No. Uh, so that actually might be Jesse Vondracek. So uh, Jesse Vondracek, I'm seeing bib number 50 uh, from USA pushing along. Nice compact form. I'm all over the place. I'll wait for my graphic to join me. Uh, that's Pam Fielperin from Belgium. So apologies uh, to all listening. That is actually uh, number 54 from Belgium, Pam Field. So he's rolling along nicely. And again, a compact form. I say that a lot of the runners that are smaller, like compact like that, they get in and they get into a great position. I call him, I'm going to call him a runner because I bet you anything this guy's going to run away with it later. Uh, he has that He has that form, uh, and it's real efficient to be uh, forward and tight like that, I think, for, for a runner um, as we come back, currently running in sixth place. All right. I just wanted to also remind everyone about one of the most awesome races that you can do on the circuit. Um, it's Ironman Switzerland in Tune. You can actually drink the water. It's absolutely the most pristine water you could ever see or race in. Um, and it was recently crowned the winner of Ironman's bucket list bracket by fans on social media. And you can see by you can see why. Look at these awesome <laughs> scenic pictures that we have on our screen. You know, as I said, you will race in the Crystal Lake around Toon. You're surrounded by snow-capped Alps. How awesome is that? Um, you know, it's it's just such an iconic race with the peaks. And then, of course, the run is fantastic because you run through the old town and it's quite a rolling course with the lakeshore views and castles. So you can see why I'm a fan of this race and it's a fan favorite. Register at ironman.com before it sells out. Don't miss out. There you go. I would love to do that one. Well, you know, talk about that one. Milan Bronze, he's on camera from the Netherlands. This guy looks tight. He looks ready to roll Milan Bronze from the Netherlands. Again, we are scrolling through, folks. All of these men in that chase pack, we are getting a nice look at each of them. High, high cadence here in the mid-90s uh, for Milan. He's doing a great job um, as we kind of come around here and jump up the road again uh, to the next one. Um, which uh, is here on camera, and it, it's so great. I just have to give a big thanks uh, to our crew for giving us the opportunity to look in and watch all of these athletes at this moment uh, where we do know that the front runners are important, but we're getting a, a good peek here as well. And from uh, Poland, we've got Tomasz Szala, and he gave a wave to the camera. Tomasz uh, Szala, he looks great back into aero. Um, it is also interesting to have this peak, Didi. I mean, uh, MJ, sorry, I was thinking ahead because I just got a text, a DD text um, update um, about the wind out there. But let's come back to this. Tomas sitting up. So what does that tell you about pack effort here? He's really, you know, he's really minding his P's and Q's, right? This is to that point. You have to be 12 meters. You have to ease up because if you pass, you got to pass everyone. So pack dynamics very different to being a one or a two on the road. No, that's exactly right. And you you have to maintain your effort, but be conscious that you don't want to get too close. And, you know, sometimes that pack gets very, very comfortable, and that's where you can run a risk of getting a penalty. But also you're running a, a risk of, like, maybe letting a gap form and then you drop off the pack. So, you know, that danger position is definitely uh, at the back of the pack. You sort of want to be more in the middle or up the front because then if somebody does make a, a move, you have a chance to counteract that because you want to get, definitely as an athlete, you want to get the benefit of being in that pack. Especially when you got 17.27 miles per hour wind tracked out on course. Again, getting updates from uh, folks on the beat. And right now, we're going to take a quick beat here to have a break. Stay with us. We'll be right back.
And we are back onto the tollway here where we talked about 17 plus mile per hour winds. And we're looking at this chase pack. Um, and again, this is Thomas Rent from the Czech Republic. He looks great aboard his steed, pushing along. And um, Makili, tell me this. When you've got a big pack like this, is it more stressful, less stressful, easier? We were talking about it a minute ago, but but like, where would you want to be? Would you want to be away and in the front, or would you want to be in this mix? That's an easy answer. I would rather be in front. There you go. You know, you know, then you're sort of controlling your own destiny. In a pack, you don't really get to control your own destiny. I mean, definitely it could be an advantage, though, for somebody. You know, maybe you're slightly weaker cyclist. So definitely being in a pack can be very, very helpful. It can also be great if, you know, you sort of, like, aren't great at keeping a constant effort. The pack will definitely, like you know, keep you conscious of like your pacing and trying to stay with the pack and, you know, but then, you know, as I said, it can disrupt your pacing as well. But, you know, you definitely, like if you're in that situation, some people love it. Some people like hate it because, you know, definitely you've got to deal with the risk of getting a penalty, um, the risk of sp heart rate spikes, but it's also not lonely. <laughs> you know, that's the big a, thing, right? Yeah. It's not like lonely out there. When you're out the front, you don't know what's happening. You know, you maybe rely on, you know, somebody telling you something or a leaderboard. But, you know, when you're in the pack, you sort of can go, well, I'm with so-and-so. So, -and -so, so I know he's great at Iron Man. So if I'm with him, we must be having a great day. Yes. And, you know, sometimes it's like if you look around, you go, oh, my goodness. I've never ridden with this person before. It's like, maybe I'm not feeling as great as I can. So, you know, you can work on the positive and you can work on the negative. But the bottom line is, you know, it's keeping company. It's, you know, there's not as, there's things that you have to do and think about. But, you know, there's also the fact that, you know, if you are out in front, you know, you can just put your head down and go. Who's got his head down and going? Ben Hoffman, part of this group. Again, we knew we'd find him in that colorful kit, the tie-dye top. I have to say I love it. A uh, little bit of – I think – I think my brain is freaking out when I see the the contrast to that uh, paint scheme on the bike and the but I like it. This man, seven times Ironman winner, doing this race uh, for glory and for a tune-up for the Ironman World Championships in St. George uh, in in just a sh uh, three short weeks. Uh, so Ben making that turnaround, but this guy is uh, based in Arizona. Uh, lives in Arizona with his wife and two kids. Trained in Colorado for a long time. He's a Colorado native. Uh, sc went to school up in Montana. Lived in some great places for triathlon. And and the guy is an absolute workhorse. Trains uh, extremely hard, as as do the majority of the uh, professional ranks. But Ben Hoffman, this is the first time we've seen him race an event here uh, this year. So he's getting out there and pushing it. Um, and it's great to see. So, He's, he looks smooth. I would say he looks really smooth. And we t we kind of joked earlier that this is like a normal training weekend for him. It could actually be lighter because sometimes he goes out for 170-mile <laughs> bike rides. So it's really a short drop in the bucket today. Well, he actually hasn't raced um, Ironman Texas, and he's only done it once before, and that was back in 2015. And uh, he definitely suffered in the heat and uh, was fading um, from the front of the pack and ended up eighth. Oh, there you go. Good stats as we come to Portugal's Felipe Acevedo, he is rolling along. He was one at one point second in the water, came out, uh, got gapped eventually. But Felipe Acevedo, he looks great, uh, very aerodynamic, and and rolling through well in the pack. Uh, once again, folks, as we kind of summarize, you're looking at the chase pack. So up the road, it's still Sam Laidlow from France with Richard Varga from Slovakia. That's a duo. And then as we come back about f uh, three and a half, four minutes, you're going to see uh, the the ch the lead of the chase there with Jesper Svensson and also Magnus Dietlev, those two. And then now we've got the pack. So this is our chase crew. This is the long line, the long and lean line of men rolling through. I should have said the long, lean line of legs uh, <laughs> laying it down. That would have been a full, full alliteration here. Who have we got on camera now? Cody Beals, uh, three-time Ironman winner from Canada. And this guy... Uh, making a move here, making a pass. As uh, we talked about, you got to get around if you get in that zone. He's going for it. Cody Beal such a fun athlete to watch. Uh, I think one of my highlights of this man was watching him 
when he battled Lionel Sanders and Montremblant, took the win. Uh, those two guys came up the ranks together in uh, the young days of, of Ironman, uh, tri sorry, triathlon in Canada. So Cody Beal's fun to watch. Yeah, and this is actually the first time he's ever done Ironman Texas. He's done like the 70.3 Texas races a few times. And uh, he sort of felt his 2020 and his 2021 seasons were really challenging and disappointing. So I'm sure today he would like to uh, avenge that and yeah. turn a new, over a new leaf and, you know, show that he is back in form because he has had some fantastic races over his career, that's for sure. That's right, he has. And he's just a fan favorite. Follow his social. He's very forthcoming. He's very open about uh, the life of a pro triathlete. He he uh, he rides the highs and he and he surfs the lows with us together. So big fan of Cody Beals, as a lot of people are. Um, and we did catch up with him just earlier this week. Here's what he had to say. Timing's good. Just putting the bike together. Come on in. Had a monster sleep in today, as planned, and uh, just getting the bike together this afternoon. Got a little swim in. Going to do a ride out in the heat. One of the uh, things I've learned from doing a few of these Ironmans is to get in about six days out. Any more, and I give myself too much time to mess things up. Any less, and I just never properly relax. So I've learned I need two days or so with like nothing on the schedule. Well, I got this bike last year, but um, I've been pretty much exclusively on the trainer all winter training in Canada. I think I got out for three rides, so maybe a cumulative total of like 10 hours outside coming down here. It's quite a luxury to have a garage set up like this and all these tools. Oh, I have such a long history with Texas and the woodlands in particular. I was first down here working with a couple coaches during my very first pro season back in 2014. And then the timing didn't work out for a couple years after that. And of course the pandemic, finally the stars aligned this year. And you know, this is exactly where I need to be. What's, what's your goal for race day? Win. What's your goal for race day? Win. You know, the sport can't be all about external validation. It's not gonna get you far enough. It's not gonna justify the other 364 days a year of, of toil basically. But um, yeah, a little external validation would go a long way right now. As I said, so honest and so real, and everyone's thinking it. Look, a little external validation. We don't always get it. We don't always need it. But gosh, Cody's so real. And what does he want to do? Win. 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 Now. What? No, win. He wants to win it. <laughs> Good stuff, Cody. Uh, we're pulling for you here. But we're pulling for everyone. Look at that pull there, MJ. That is a long line of pulling. It sure is. And, you know, his uh, preparation hasn't been ideal. You know, he got... Uh, a mild case of COVID about a month ago. Um, and he said that it did set him back a little bit and his lung function still doesn't feel at a hundred percent. But right now he's looking a hundred percent leading, leading that group. And I mean, this is how the race is definitely going to play out. You know, we've got the, the couple of leaders out front with Richard Vargas, and then you've got a pack of contenders who could podium and win this race. So um, our leader, of course, is Sam Laidlow. I mean, he's having a great race as well. You yeah. know, he's been in the front of the race now for for uh, almost two hours. That's right. You know, in another 20 minutes, you know, he has made it to the front of the race. And, you know, even though there's that big pack behind, they're really not making up any time. And and that's one of the disadvantages also that can happen being in, in a pack, that you can sort of get sucked into – well, I'm just going to stay here, this is good, and not be aware that, you know, the leaders are actually getting away and you, or you're not making time or you're, you're losing time. So, you know, a pack situation is, is great in terms of, like, keeping yourself motivated. Um, when you're out front, you can ride your own race, but you also don't know what's happening behind. But it's like, as I said, it can be to your advantage because – the pack can get complacent. 
I, I Yeah, that's a great point to highlight. When you see Cody Beals at the long line of that train, at the head of that train, it, it shows he really is going for the win because what happens is if you play the game of there's a group of people saving energy behind me, I better save energy. Everybody plays that game, and you slow down and you lose the lead. That's when these 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 twos and, and fours get away. Right now, Cody's making sure that doesn't happen. First place, Sam Laidlow. Second place, Richard Varga. And then four minutes back is the duo of Svensson and Ditlev. And then two minutes back is that Chase Pack. So everyone very much within reasonable contact of one, one another. Uh, but certainly, uh, I have to give credit to the, the guys that are out there pushing away and getting that gap, as is this young lady, Lauren Brandon. She is in first place and has been since the gun, uh, the way she likes it, the way she feels comfortable, a front runner to be certain. Uh, she's pushing well. Uh, and, uh, then second place behind her is bib number one, Jocelyn McCauley. Then we've got Rachel Zelinskis. But I would venture to bet, not for long, Dee Dee Griesbauer is putting time into her and we're going to see another lead change here in a minute. Well, actually, you could see a lead change between Lauren Brandon and Jocelyn McCauley um, at the 40.6 mile mark. Um, it looks like Jocelyn has made up a lot of time. She's now only one minute and 35 seconds back. But, you know, it's going to be interesting because if that pass does happen, that could actually help Lauren. I think that will give her a little bit of an energy boost. And, you know, we might see Lauren... Um, and Jocelyn riding into T2, T2 together. So, I mean, Jocelyn, you know, is the number one. She is definitely the one to beat. And, you know, as we said, you know, she's consistent. She may not be the fastest swimmer, but she's very solid on the swim. She's super great on, on the bike. And, you know, she can run. I mean, she's definitely run a low three hour marathon um i haven't seen her run under three hours but the thing is she chooses usually tough courses and yep. you know she she loves this course this is like her hometown race her parents live fairly close by um her eldest daughter i believe is going to be volunteering at one of the last aid stations how cool is that and her youngest is actually going to be with her with her mum and dad and 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 her biggest thing is right having family at the end seeing her do this so For you know sure. she's definitely got her priorities right she talks a lot about balance and she goes the balance is a lifetime it's not in the moment when she's racing triathlon it's the lifetime balance because right now all she's thinking about is winning this race right now. There you go. And and she's getting there closer and closer. Minute 34. Thanks for that update, MJ. Look, she's closing in on Brandon. Two athletes know each other very well. Uh, Jocelyn almost won this race three years ago. Almost doesn't cut it. Uh, Daniela Reef took her out, but she was still a super close second, and that gives you confidence. Uh, so we'll watch these two. She's also, I would dare say uh, a, a tad more confident in her running abilities than Lauren Brandon. Lauren gaining confidence and, and getting uh, more and more as we go. But I certainly think that uh, you're right. When they get together, Lauren's not going to feel really good about just her riding away. She'll try and kind of up the ante. Um, also, we could say this. If you have the choice of throwing down early, Jocelyn McCauley, and throw down late, Perhaps Jocelyn said, I'm going to get in there, get in while I'm fresh and while it's easy, early in the miles, get in, catch up to Lauren, and then settle. So they both may be at a matched pace. We'll see that here soon enough. And then we can we can talk about this. I, I know you, you – hopefully you're not hearing the beeps of my Wahoo Element watch, but you are seeing Wahoo – here strapped right on to Lauren Brandon, our leader. And here's the cool thing that, that many of you are aware of as, as we've recently announced this partnership with Wahoo. Um, they're the only brand that's out there doing something super cool, helping endurance athletes train indoors and outdoors, which helps all of our global athletes, all of these Wahoo athletes prepare for any of these Ironman events, regardless of time constraints, limited daylight, Sunrise, sunset, <laughs> the weather. We hope this partnership, I mean, it's it's like we hope it grows and continues to offer these awesome um, connected fitness uh, opportunities and, and just really helps people get to their best. Because I know 
just having the watch is cool. We've been talking about those features, you and me, Makila. You know, it's good stuff. Just a quick mention. Oh, I'm a long-time user of uh, the Wahoo line. And, uh, I mean, I'm the type of athlete, you know, I love riding outside, but I love getting on my kicker. I love it. It's like it's time efficient. I can watch my favorite movie or my favorite television show. Um, I can duplicate a race course. I can come up with fun ways and uh, to train, design different programs, and I can go and race anyone if I want. You it, know, it, there's lots yeah, of group rides. Cool. Um, there's no drop rides. Um, I just love everything about the company, the fact that they're trying to make it better. Everything that they produce is like a step up and a step above. Well said. And here we are talking about a step above. Lauren Brandon, she's just a step ahead of second place. Joss McCauley crushing it, looking great. There we see them both, these two athletes, riding that same rig, looking great, pushing forward down the roads here are the tollways of the Woodlands, Texas. This Memorial Hermann Ironman, Texas. We'll be right back. Please do stay with us. That's a hyperbole. That thing he uses to warm up and stay loose before he throws it down. That thing Tony Finau uses on course between shots. Ooh, that's money. That thing Robin and I use before and after we're on the bike so we can ride harder tomorrow. That thing Erlen Holland uses before smashing it into the back of the net. That thing that's for everyone. The hyperbole from Hyper Ice. Give your body the daily relief it's been asking for. Right here, we are back with Jocelyn McCauley, bib number one, a nice close shot of that high cadence. Another thing I really like about uh, this athlete and this individual on camera is she gets right after it. Uh, she doesn't, ah, she races smart. Look, she's well-trained. She's a smart Ironman athlete, but she gets right into it and she plays, she kind of smokes them while she's got them. You know what I mean? She gives it when it feels good. And I think that's a good strategy. This is why she's got three wins to her credit at the Ironman distance. Uh, this is, you know, that's not even to say she's she's also won at the 70.3 distance, um, but she goes for it and she's doing a great job here catching Lauren Brandon, trying to catch Lauren Brandon, and we're going to have a nice race up up here. here in a, well, we're having a great race. We're going to have a nice head-to-head -head battle here in just a second if, um, yeah, if I'm not mistaken, again. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I mean, there's going to be a pass. There's no doubt about it. I mean, Lauren Brandon is doing a, a great job. And, you know, that pack that is actually behind Jocelyn, Lauren is actually holding her own. Um, I think Dee Dee is currently leading, Dee Dee Greasebauer is currently leading that pack, but, you know, over seven minutes behind. Um, and then, but, you know, Jocelyn McCauley, you know, she's the one that, you know, we knew was going to be at the front of the race at some time. And we are waiting for that pass to happen. But, you know, still... You know, a minute 20 is still a, a long time to to make a pass. I mean, you know, you might see, you know, it's 112 miles, but it still takes, you know, a fair few miles to, to make up over a minute. But, you know, definitely, you know, unless Jocelyn has some sort of mechanical issue between now and passing, you know, I think it's going to happen sooner rather than later. But, you know, as I said, if, if Lauren can use that momentum as Jocelyn um, comes past her, she can sustain a substantial amount of time on that on that group that's chasing from behind. And there is a nice little pack behind. There's no doubt about it. It's like, you know, you've got someone like Dee Dee who's who's right up there. Um, you know, you've got Rachel Zizinskis who's sitting in third, but she's definitely losing time. But she's hanging in there. You know, she's still around four and a half minutes off the lead. Um, and then I said, you know, I think Dee Dee was the one that made the move. She's sitting in fourth right now at around seven minutes behind. So she's having a great bike ride. Um, and then you've got the group of Melanie McQuaid um, and also Danielle Lewis, who are now over 11 minutes behind. So, 
definitely the race right now is between Brandon and Macaulay. Uh, 135 is the time. So Lauren's actually like held off a little bit since the last time check. So they're riding very, very similar times um, at the moment. Although Jocelyn obviously is riding faster because her average is around 20 miles an hour compared to Lauren Brandon, who is averaging 18.58 miles an hour. Um, Dee Dee right now, and it, like she's moving steadily in front. That's why she's sitting at seven minutes. So she's at 19.7 miles an hour. Uh, Melanie McQuaid's down to 18.19. And, and Daniel Lewis is moving up because she's riding at 19.71. So, you know, you can definitely see in terms of pacing, Jocelyn is the one that is 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 the speed demon right now. And uh, we're we're just kind of waiting here because our assumption is that these two might come together. But but, Makili, the point was brilliant because I I really I I feel like I was falling victim to that as well. Think a minute and a half is just going to be gone in a second. So she's taken back three and a half minutes. We'll say in the first thirty miles, uh, we still have notably. 80 miles from that time check to the end. So, so much time. Uh, anyway, I think uh, some great things to examine. Looking down that leaderboard, we just we, you just called them out. McQuaid, Lewis, then Valk. As you go down, you can see Smith, Anna, Ueda, Sand, Ryder. Some of the women that we talked about early on, some newer women that we're not as familiar with yet on the Ironman circuit, uh, but also some women that haven't just haven't tested this distance yet. Uh, so the cool thing about this race is that most of the determining action happens in the run later on. So we're not we're not there yet. We're still having to navigate a lot of these uh, early hours. The decisions you make now certainly matter later. Uh, but uh, but yeah, a lot can change. So upper part of your screen, the men's race. Bottom part of your screen, the women's race. Some exciting action here in the woodlands, and and nothing has really changed on the on the front. For the fellas, where we still have Sam Laidlow leading with Richard Varga there in the tall white socks in second place, chasing him down. No, I mean, they they are really doing well to hold the position. That's for sure. You know, there's a lot of great guys right behind them. I mean, Laidlow and, you know, he is a great athlete and it's not surprising to see him in the first place right now. And then Richard, we haven't seen him do an Ironman. No. So he's definitely an unknown. And, you know, he had a great career as an ITU athlete. So I'm sure he's pretty happy and expected to be at the front because we knew he was such a great swimmer. Um, and then when you scroll down and you see the likes of Butterfield, you know, he's seven and a half minutes back. But don't count him out because, you know, he's solid on the run. And then you have someone like Cody Beals, who is another guy that, you know, he's got a little bit of a question mark because he did get COVID about a month ago. But, you know, he's rock solid. If he can find the form that he had before he got COVID, I'm sure that he's going to be, you know, nudging that podium spot as we get to the closing stages. So it's really going to be interesting to see what those camps those time checks look like when we get to the next time check because someone like Stepherson, you know, he's a danger horse. He's a real danger horse. So if he can claw some time back on the leaders, you know, the run could be a different story. I like the way you think. I like it a lot. It's exciting to see that, you know, there's so many dynamics in here. And as we start to see the racing and the elements heat up, uh, so much is going to come to the play. Did you just notice what I did? Butterfield and Beals moving up through the field, finding the way to the front of that, uh, that pack. This could be dangerous. Butterfield, I'll say this. I've watched a lot of Ironman, as have you, over my uh, uh, lifespan. And when Tyler Butterfield won the Ironman Cozumel event a couple years ago, uh, 2020, it was one of the best runs, performances I've seen. And again, last year, uh, Christian Blum Blum Blumenfeld won it. And, and that was crazy good in perfect conditions. Crazy good. But when Butterfield ran a 238, I believe he did, or a 237 in the 2020 Ironman Cozumel, it was 
blazing hot and humid. And he had, it, it really just was an impressive show. All this to say, this is one of the guys that when he puts forth his best effort, when he has a great day, he's really one of the best of the best. I mean, I, I think he's just, he's, he's so good. He's not always there. Sometimes he'll go top five and just be like, yeah, it's a training day. But when he is on form, he's dangerous. I mean, just really a threat. Well, dangerous because if it gets hot, we know he's capable of having a great race in the heat. You know, he has finished top five in the Ironman World Championships in, in Kona. So another race that we know is hot, humid, difficult. So if it does start to heat yeah. up, which is forecast later, maybe not to the extent that it happened in 2019, but definitely someone like him who has that that running ability that is a standout compared to anyone on the Correct. field. To, to run under 240, there's still only a little group of guys yes. that can have that claim to fame. So, Correct. you know, if Tyler can put a solid bike and then run as well as he's capable, don't count him out. We have to remember, too, he was a pro cyclist in between triathlon careers, <laughs> right? So he has a well-rounded game. So, yeah, and then Cody is another one who always impresses me. He's a Canadian, and you, you often will kind of – I will often pigeonhole a Canadian and say, well, they're, war they're northern climate. They're, they don't always have the heat that we do down south. And But he does great in the heat. He does great in, the, in all elements, Cody. So he's another guy. Put well, it – yeah, sixth at Ironman Coeur d'Alene in, in 2021. In the, in the smoker last year, yeah. Yeah, I mean, hot, difficult conditions, and he still managed to get top six. And he didn't feel, you know what, he had, a, he had kind of a bad race there, too. I remember that was, the that was you know, Lionel kind of blew up that day. We watched that event. Sam Long was in there, won, won that event uh, for, for his first, well, not his first, he won. But here's the thing. Cody Beals always has that ability to kind of perform when, not always, but perform when he needs to. And I think he's ready for that now. So exciting stuff. We're looking well down the road. But take a look at that leaderboard. Laid low. Varga, Dietlev, Svensson. That's your top four. They're away and they're clear. And you can see high averages um, above this. And then your pack, the chase pack. From fifth on, you've got a lot of talent. Uh, ben Hoffman. We'll also talk about guys that, you know, he was one of these guys. Did a 243 a couple years back in Coeur d'Alene. He's got the wheels on, on the run as well. Uh, so there's there's just a lot of, of uh, excitement. But what just happened there was a big PA double S. That's, uh, of course, um, Jocelyn McCauley uh, getting out there and getting away with it. So exciting stuff. Jocelyn McCauley making the moves and making a few quick words as she does that. Uh, and then now we're back full picture to Sam Laidlow here. Uh, this guy, an Ironman certified coach, by the way, coaches for his dad's business, so this guy knows all sides of the Ironman coin. As we walk away from him for just a second, we want to encourage you to stay with us. We're just taking a quick breather. More action in a minute. There's this beautiful moment in time when neither foot is touching the ground. We are free of gravity and weight, moving above the doubts, past limits. When we are light, transformed and hopeful, and if we were to collect all these moments, join them together, well, this is when anything becomes possible. This is when we fly. Throughout my career, people have doubted my ability and I've had it even more so when I've come into triathlon. I think this year will be very different. There will be bigger expectations on me. I love the way that I race. With my swim background, I'm almost in the driving seat from the gun. I'm the person that everyone is chasing. I want to be the best, and I'm willing to work as hard as possible to get there. Back here with first place in the men's race has been out front since they left transition. This is Sam Laidlow from France. He looks great. He looks confident. He looks like he's working. I can also see sweat beating and rolling <laughs> off his face. Uh, there's no joke when it comes to Houston weather, when it comes to the Woodlands weather. I'll just say Texas weather this time of year. It's It gets sticky. It gets hot. It makes you really pay attention to that fourth discipline, the fueling focus, right? I mean, you got to watch it. But, McKeely, how did we get to where we are now? 
Well, there was a great, great race out of transition. And when we saw this, right, back and forth, I'm first onto the bike, you're first onto the bike, who will it be? Um, does it really matter? Not so much, but Richard Varga, he let go of that first place position. And then we saw Sam Laidlow roll in. We saw kind of a lot of back and forth, didn't we, as they navigated those early turns. Some of this could be considered incidental. But there, Lauren Brandon and Rachel Zelinskas, those two exited T1 together. And then Lauren Brandon said, thanks for your company, but I'm leaving you for now. She got away and she really pushed it. This is what we expected. Here in the men's race, that's it. Richard Varga chasing Sam Laidlow. And then the men behind, the Dane, there he is, Magnus Ditlev, going, going, going for it, just as Lauren Brandon was also going for it in her race. And then, as we mentioned, on the right side, that's the recap of Sam Laidlow, some of the same on the left side of your picture. And then over one of these massive hills, <laughs> we saw Svensson and Ditlev make some moves. Those two, the Dane and the Swede, got away from the chase pack. And then the big moment that we've been talking about was when we saw chiseling chiseling back jocelyn mccauley chiseling back time on the leader lauren brandon so there you go mj that's what got us up to where we are here two hours 48 minutes into this beautiful race and now here we are at the front of the men's no i mean sam's doing a great job and i think for him it's got to give him some confidence because he actually was injured most of the winter and actually had missed what he felt was some specific Ironman sessions in the lead up to St. George. So then he opted to race Texas. So I think he's pretty happy right now with his decisions. And one of the other reasons why he wanted to race is to sort of get that muscle memory back. And one of the ways you can only really do that is in a race environment. So as I said, I think he's going to be pretty, pretty happy to be in the lead just as our women's leader right now, Jocelyn McCauley, has powered herself to the front of the race right now. She was second here in 2019. So I'm sure she is excited to be finally controlling this race. And here we are looking again at Jocelyn McCauley just in front of Lauren Brandon. You might be saying to yourself, wow, that was quick. When did that happen? Well, let's look back at this. A Morton move of the day, Jocelyn McCauley taking the reins as leader from Lauren. And there she goes. She said quickly, good job. And she kept moving. You got to <laughs> you got to be like, hey, we're friends and all that. But you're also going to try and psych them out, right? Hey, you're like, oh, this is easy for me. I don't know. What's the game? You know, you've got a lot more experience in the front of the race than I do or these, these women do. Come on, tell us what happened there when she passed on that Morton move. I don't know. I think it depends how you're feeling at the moment. Uh, you know, definitely Jocelyn knows that she is riding faster than Lauren. I mean, she knew she had a, would have had a deficit out of the swim. Mm -hmm. So for her to be in the lead this early, as she went past, she would have been like quite happy. And maybe she said, you know, nice job or something. Okay. I probably would have just put my head down and <laughs> kept going. But let's catch up with Jocelyn McCauley right now as we had a chance to catch up with her earlier in the week. Ironman Texas, a race that I've done every year since I began this whole Ironman journey in 2014, my very first amateur race. I need to get my race chain on. So I'm headed here. Hey, how's it going? How I'm you? Jocelyn. <laughs> this rotor likes to rub every now and then. Everyone needs an icebreaker. Uh, everyone else was in Oceanside. I decided to come here. So, <laughs> uh, I mean, it has a special place in my heart. And I think that like, you know, yes, I have a world championship in two weeks, which is like the main target, obviously. But I think you do need a race opener for the season and you have to also do things that make you happy and give you joy and racing here gives me joy. I love it. I've never actually had number one. I'm, I've won other races and every time I've gone back, they've given it to the male pro. So kind of fun because I didn't win this one. I raced Ironman Florida with a broken wrist. I broke it the week 
week before, I think it was, um, broke two bones and tore a ligament. Like, orthopedic said, you're not gonna do any more damage than you've already done, so go ahead, finish your season like you want. And so I did, and that swim was awful to have a broken wrist in, but did it and ended up fourth, but gotta be happy with ending the season how I wanted. I mean, I think you'd be silly to just say you're gonna win a race and you know not ha like talk about other competition because there's a ton of competition out there there's danielle lewis who is her first iron man um she's shown herself really well in 70.3s lauren brandon always like has an amazing swim bike and hangs on for the run and but i mean it's fun and i wouldn't have it any other way You know, I always love listening to see what Jocelyn has to say. It's like she's honest, she's open, and she just like has this good attitude and she's respectful of her com uh, her competitors. And I think that says a lot about how she races. She just gets out there and she just does whatever she needs to do on the day and she never really has anything negative to say. It's like, you know, even when she's down and out, she still like goes, you know what, I'm just going to give it a go. Um, so it's great to see her like sort of living that dream right now of coming into the race, having finished second last year to be leading right now. And, you know, her training over the off season has been pretty smooth. There's been really nothing significant, she said. Um, the only thing is she did change her training slightly versus what she'd been doing over the last couple of years and I think that's always great as an athlete that you don't get caught up in the same old same old I know as a coach when I'm coaching an athlete I try to think about progression okay we start here and maybe in five years we need to get to this point so I'm not going to overload you on the same sessions they might be a little similar but there's definitely a progression on how you do it or change it up. You know, I say a lot of times to my Ironman athletes, you know what, it's time to get back into some short course training. And I think that's where sometimes a lot of athletes sort of lose the vision. It's like they concentrate so much on Ironman, they actually get slower. And sometimes it's a nice to take a step into some faster stuff. And I also like what Jocelyn said about not racing the 70.3 in California. Mm -hmm. You know, she felt that this was a better way to start her season. There was plenty of fast girls at that race. She felt that where she was at, well, let's jump into this. It may not be as competitive of what that 70.3 is. But in a couple of weeks when I race St. George, that's when all the big names yes. are going to be. And she's definitely one of the big names. And it'll be interesting to see how that recovery goes between now and St. George, the Ironman World Championships in St. George. Fantastic. Great commentary as always. Now we're looking at Dee Dee Griesbauer on camera. First time we've caught a nice glimpse of her. Uh, great to see our sometimes co-host here sitting at the desk with us right now, doing what she loves, doing what she does exceptionally well, is just riding through here. How did she get there? Great question. Uh, she crushed it, obviously, but let's have a look back here. Another Morton move as she rolls past old Rachel. Um, uh, now I'm drawing a blank on saying her name. Come on, get it to me. Uh, Z um, Zelinskas. Thank you so much, Zelinskas. I got hung up talking. You know what happened to me? It was almost like a seizure when I saw her kit because it's a, a seizure of happiness. Like I saw all those colors on her race kit and it put my brain did I just blame her kit on my uh, my ineptitude? Anyway, she made the pass on Rachel Zelinskas. This is great stuff. Didi in third place. Here we go. First place on the road, Joss McCauley. Second place, Lauren Brandon. And now Didi Griesbauer. These three women know uh, each other well. They train and race together often. And so now three powerhouses at the front of the bike. Um, gosh, I don't know. I kind of want to go back to what you were talking about with Jocelyn because I thought it was really cool stuff. Uh, just everything you said there, um, really thoughtful, right? And I think that some of the folks that go to Oceanside, they don't realize that's a bit, that's essential. That's one of the most competitive, fastest, hardest events early in the year. And I think we get excited. Everyone wants to do, a lot of people do, but does it set you up for what your season goals are, right? That's important. And you, you know, you brought that home well. 
Well, yeah, sometimes, you know, when you're deciding what to do in the beginning of the season, you know, it could be timing, it could be how it fits into the overall picture, but it's also you've got to look at, well, how am I going to benefit not just physically but mentally as well because some athletes, you know, it's no problem if they have a poor race, it's early season because some athletes need to get a race in to actually get that bump in fitness. So it's always interesting to see how athletes choose races, but we're going to discuss that a lot more because we're about to head in a commercial, but we'll be right back with more action. Whether it's on the road or in the pool, your activity has high demands. Rooted in sweat and grounded in science, we understand your unique fueling needs. That is why we created formulas just for you, endurance athletes, helping you replace what you're losing and keeping you fueled. And there's nowhere we'd rather be than with you along this journey, because together we are formulated for farther. From the creators of Gatorade, Gatorade Endurance, formulated for you, formulated for farther. Right back here, we are together with Didi Griesbauer on the road doing a great job of just chasing, chasing, chasing. There was a time when she was nine minutes back, but she's working her way and has worked her way onto the podium. As you can see down in the, in the, in the background of your shot there, uh, downtown Houston. And so this is why we're indicating you're heading southeast. So from the woodlands down southbound towards Houston proper, and then they're going to turn around and come back. And then they do it all again, don't they, McKeeley, where they have to roll through. But this is what it looks like when you get past this, another kind of pass from Lauren Brandon to Joss McCauley, speaking to what we addressed earlier it's not down and out. It's a it's a it's a bit of a back and forth. Probably we're going to see for a while. Uh, you you predicted this that when they get together, they will probably remain together and work to, work together, so to speak. And they'll that that spells trouble for the for the folks that are chasing back back behind them. Yeah, definitely. If you get to the front of the the pack, and you know Lauren was leading for quite a while, where Jocelyn was sort of like pacing herself up to the front of the bike. So if you've sort of been a little conservative, knowing that a pass is going to happen at a certain point and save a little bit of energy and then use that to your advantage by pacing yourself off in a legal way off Jocelyn McCauley. So they look like they're actually sharing the responsibility right now. So that's definitely going to work to their benefit rather than, what we've seen in past Ironmans where, you know, somebody gets to the front and the person beside's like, well, you're riding faster than me. You got to the front. I'm just going to sit back and, you know, chill out for a while. So in this case, that is not in true, but that's how sort of Lauren also races. You know, she's not going to give up the lead at any point. She's going to go back and, and, and try to maintain that position. Yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a great point. Uh, some great points there uh, in general. So looking at these two, um, yeah, it, it's, God, it's, a, it's just a question, isn't it? Always like you have a strategy, you have a plan, and you're always evolving. So you have to. You have to roll with it. You have to kind of think how it might play out. But whatever, whatever seemed like a good idea may seem like a bad idea at one point. Anyway, it's just about being versatile kind of in your approach. So that's what we see with these guys. And still up front, I wonder if San Laidlo came in here and said, I know exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to get to the front and never look back. Who knows? As we look at another pass here, Jocelyn McCauley this time getting around and saying, I'd rather get in front. Uh, it doesn't. It feels easy, doesn't it, when you're in that second position? So maybe she's not going fast enough, and she comes around. They kind of assess, reassess. So interesting dynamic. And I I have to tie it back to when I asked you earlier, would you rather be up front or in a pack? I, I agree with you. Being up front or pushing away, it's on you. You set your tempo, set your tone. 
What about a two like this where you're back and forth? Does that drive you crazy? Do you like that? Talk to me about that. No, I don't think it drives you crazy as well at all because, I mean, definitely if you've come up from behind and you've made up a lot of time, you know, you know you're the stronger one right now. And it's that little bit of as the person that's been overtaken, that sort of provides motivation for you to like up the ante a little bit. So is that a good race plan if you're at your max in terms of what your power output is? I mean, we may see that eventually that gap is going to get a little bit bigger and a little bit bigger. And then you've got to make the decision, well, do I like sort of make myself known again and get to the front? And that's exactly what Lauren Brandon did. She goes, you know what? You may have caught me, but I'm still here and I'm going to get to the front. And that's going to motivate both of them. Yeah, I agree with you completely. Uh, absolutely. As we come back here to Sam Laidlow in the front of his race, dragging along his his longtime friend, Richard Varga. So uh, here we are uh, back again at the front, and we're going to talk here a little bit about this course, this race, the amazing thing that is Memorial uh, Herman Ironman, Texas. And we're going to get to hear, of course, from Greg Pennington. He is our race director. Let's hear what he has to say about this great race. Hey there, my name is Greg Pennington. I'm the race director here at Ironman Texas. Good to see you this morning. I'm gonna turn it over real quick to Sandra. She has a couple things she wanted to say. We have a great group of staff that come in on race week. Typically I do a lot of stuff behind the scenes beforehand. So it's nice to get the army of uh, Ironman staff that are coming in on race week. And again, they're working all the different areas of that. It turns out that I can be like a symphony conductor that I'm basically working with those leads of those different areas and then letting them loose to do the work that they do, that they know how to do. Okay. Uh, second day of check-in, we checked in 759 people yesterday. Since we got started here, some things have changed. Our bike course has changed completely from going north into the national park and stuff to uh, having to utilize the Hardy Toll Road with a couple of loops here. So you're seeing a different part of uh, Houston than we did previously with that. The transition in area, the finish line, and the run course, very spectator friendly. The swim start is amazing. Again, the Woodlands is a, a city of trees. There's a ton of energy out there. They're running on both sides. Spectators can see them on both sides all day and all night long. And welcome back to the 2022 Memorial Herman Ironman Texas. And what a great race it has been so far. And it's pretty similar in terms of what's happening in the women's race, what's happening in the men's race. We definitely have two leaders in the women's race, two leaders in the men's race. And right now we're looking at Sam Laidlow. And, you know, one of the things that I like about him is – He's quite consistent, you know, and although he's been injured all winter, um, I think he's showing that it didn't affect his biking because he's up front, he's gaining time on the pack behind. And, you know, it's one of those things when sometimes, you know, if, it, if running is the injury, it really gives you a chance to work on your bike riding. And I often see when you're coaching athletes who have a run injury, you know, if you add some water running in, if you add some elliptical, um, if you add some the gravity style of treadmill into the mix, it actually helps your cycling as well. Even though you're rehabbing your run, your cycling can make a giant leap as well. So it's nice to see that, you know, the injury hasn't affected his cycling and it'll be interesting to see if it catches up to him on on the run yeah great stuff good insight into how his winter went uh nobody likes an injury but if you can take a benefit or two out of it hey that's great that's the and, way to be and he also does a lot of training alone so he's actually used to being allowed out there by himself so being up the front is going to be seem very comfortable even though he also has company with Richard Vargas. How about that, Richard Vargas? As you say it, giving a little kiss to his folks back home who are watching him, his people, I should say, his fans, friends, family. Uh, but, yeah, nice to see the Iron Rookie uh, in good position, still holding on to the 
uh, impressive rhythm of Sam Laidlow. I tell you what, I know I get inspired watching these races, and I bet you do too. If you're looking for an event, I would encourage you to experience a whole new world racing in New Zealand and Australia with some incredible options. Tow the line in Topo at the iconic Kellogg's Nutrigain Ironman New Zealand. You can soak up 35 years of history at the National Storage Ironman Australia race in paradise at the Cairns Airport Ironman Cairns or chase a Kona Ironman slot at Ironman Western Australia. Whether you're planning your 2022 season, why not head on down there at Ironman.com. Just plan that ultimate racecation right now. Here we are back with Sam Laidlow. Trains alone, and you know what else goes with that? It gives you the ability to race alone. So I remember you mentioned Paul and Nibby Fraser, a 24-time Ironman winner, right? I mean, come on, chew on that for a minute. She she made me laugh when she said, you know why people cry at the finish line? It's because they've spent all this time alone in their own thoughts. <laughs> and it's true, we do sometimes go deep. But I say that as joking, but also to say, if you train alone, it also gives you, because some people can't, let's be honest. Some people can't be alone. We got training partners. We need everything. We need coaches. We need, you know, devices. If you can get in and go out by yourself and do a six or seven hour bike ride or whatever it is on your own, it gives you immense power in the moment when you're leading an Ironman. You, you embrace that solitary aspect. You like to be pushing, doing your own thing. So to me, that's an asset. I don't discount or disregard the benefit of training partners, coaches, and devices. That's all important. But to have that alone mentality, I think, is also a feather in his cap. No, definitely. It uh, it can help you, especially when you're out front leading the race. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's also, it can hinder you because you're like, <laughs> you don't really know, like, where you're at. You know, you might be feeling good and you sort of get with somebody else and then you're like, you push each other. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it's just one of those things that, yeah, some people prefer that group environment. I personally like my group environment for swimming and running. And then I'd be very choosy on who I rode with on the bike. Just because I always felt like, you know, the bigger the pack, you know, the higher rate that somebody can get a flat tire and then you got to wait for them. So it might be a little selfish in saying that, but it's like, you know, and you also go on the bike, you have to push your own wind. And I think sometimes people get caught up in these pack group rides and they sort of lose that feel of what it's like to actually push your own wind. And let's face it, an Ironman is all about pushing your own wind for 112 miles. And, you know, when you're in a pack, like in this race right now, you know, with that draft zone, you know, it's not like riding directly behind a wheel, but you do get sucked along a little bit as well. So even though you don't want to be in that situation of getting too close, you know, being out front has its advantages as well as being in that pack. And, you know, some people like to, to be at the front. And I always like felt like, well, it's better to be at the front than trying to get to the front. So if you can put yourself in that situation as quick as possible, you know, that's really good. But, you know, then you have some runners who are, a very run Pacific and that's their strength. They're so used to chasing from behind. That's their comfort zone. Great stuff. Great to hear. I, I appreciate all of that insight. As we watch here, the, the fold, if you will, this is when we see some <clears throat> age group athletes on a, on lap one where you've got pro athletes kind of blending in together. So as these guys finish up, we kind of blend in together, share the road. You can see that other side of the road as well, traffic going that way. So when you are in that position, Sam Laidlow and Richard Varga were able to look across the street there and see their competition going the other way. Also in, in, important to note uh, that this is a, a section where you're really kind of, I don't know, three hours, three, three hours into a race, somewhere in that zone, to me, three, four hours in, you really do start to feel, hey, I've been doing this for a little while. Focal point needs to come up. You need to make sure that you're fueling and hydrated well. The brain might start to go a little fatigued. And so that's, I think, a really key point that we're about to enter here. 
so I do I do want to just mention and, and jumping in again over to the Facebook platform and seeing uh, I'm going to call out Robert Driscoll. He he said the same thing I was thinking just a minute ago. How much he loves. Uh, the design and seeing that Ventum because our, our first and second place women are both on Ventum. And this, uh, we just, we also just saw uh, one of our men on, on that. Here's the story. It does remind me as well of Natasha Badman's cheetah back in the day. So like how far you go, how far we've come. Aerodynamics have always been on the forefront of our brain, but it's kind of cool to see just the technology, right? MJ, like all the stuff we're putting into bike technology, pretty cool. Well, you know, it's it's been interesting to see how the bike companies have handled the pandemic and releasing of bikes and the shortage of inventory. And, you know, everyone's keen to see what the latest and greatest thing is out there. It's like, I feel like we've all saved our pennies and, you know, we're waiting to see because there's a few bike companies that haven't released bikes yet. And I think there's some exciting stuff in the works just from my knowledge of working with bike companies that people are going to be surprised by what's out there. I definitely think the more customized bikes are definitely going to be big. I know Felt has completely redesigned and we've seen Daniela out with it, not yet available to the public. Um, and then there is a small company in the Netherlands called Q-Cycle that it's totally customized. It's a full, it's a five piece bike. Um, the top tube sits a little bit higher. So then aerodynamically, you, you can actually get an advantage because naturally, basically, you're lying on the top tube. And then you have companies like Ventum, who are very triathlon specific as well. And then you sort of look at some of the other brands and you're like, oh, that's a little old school with the wing <laughs> off the back with the, the seat post. But, I, you know, it sort of all comes around because ultimately we're trying to get the most aerodynamic, the most comfortable and the fastest machines that we can get out there. And, you know, technology has improved so much over the years with the wind tunnel testing. Um, you've got disc brakes, you know, um, disc wheels took a little bit of a back door to the deep rim wheels. Now in this race, you see the majority of the pro athletes have uh, the disc uh, the disc wheels and the redesign of uh, that rear wheel has changed a lot over the years. <laughs> so, you know, it's just interesting how, you know, everyone's getting faster and technology is, I always ask the question, is it ahead of it or is it still behind? And I think right now the bike companies are doing a really nice job of staying in in front and being on the forefront of making sure that we're using technology to our advantage. I totally agree with you. And as I was thinking back to some history and you, you kind of made me think, I, I, I think we've been around long enough. I have this memory of, and this will just be a quickie of a guy racing in one of my first triathlons and Mikita, I kid you not, he had a front disc. He had a front and rear disc. It was non sanctioned. Showing, your age. showing, You're showing my age. your age. It was a non sanctioned race, but they, they so they didn't have rules against it. And the guy was from the track and he, he oh, brought yeah. a, I was gonna say he had to be a track rider. <laughs> he brought that uh he brought that front and rear disc wheel out on a, a, a windy race down in, in Texas on the coast. Hilarious. I don't think he liked his choice at some point, but <laughs> He did go fast. Here we are, and look at this. Uh, we've got um, Richard Varga, who you can see he's got his choice of Gatorade right there in the top tube, picked that up uh, most likely at an aid station and threw that in. It looks exactly like he did that. We we, we, we see athletes choosing that Gatorade endurance and water, uh, but he's popped that up there on the top tube. And then nice little split screen here where we go down and Jocelyn McCauley rocking it out. And she is, as we mentioned earlier, aboard that uh, beautiful Ventum with, as you said, the disc break. Uh, which is a nice attribute. We didn't used to be able to stop on our tri bikes, and uh, now you can. So great stuff as we watch the women's back and forth lead of Jocelyn McCauley and Lauren Brandon. They're here. They're not going anywhere, and we'll be right back. So please stay with us. Whoa, whoa, whoa. 
See that thing John Morant has? That's a hyperbole. That thing he uses to warm up and stay loose before he throws it down. That thing Tony Finau uses on course between shots. Ooh, that's money. That thing Robin and I use before and after we're on the bike so we can ride harder tomorrow. That thing Erlen Holland uses before smashing it into the back of the net. That thing that's for everyone. The Hyperbolt from Hyper Ice. Give your body the daily relief it's been asking for. And we are right back in the action here. The Woodlands, Texas, and this, the Memorial Hermann Ironman, Texas, a race now that has, ooh, just over a decade history on our circuit, and it is a fan favorite. Jocelyn McCauley, she took second place here back in 2019, pushed uh, the then reigning world champion, Daniela Reeve, to the limit, almost won it. Um, we also had a nice debut, if I remember correctly, Jeannie Seymour from South Africa was third place that day, her first Ironman. Uh, not an Ironman athlete currently, but uh, just mentioning her. That was a great race. With the steamer, the hot, hot day. Uh, Patrick Nielsen took out David Plez, and Patrick Nielsen uh, really just excelled on that hot, hot day. So a lot of history here. We can look back through the, the annals and see all of our champions and see all the people that have done so well. I uh, think about Jordan Rapp, a guy that used to dominate the scene. He won here, and, and just so many. Rachel Joyce has won here. So many champs. Speaking of champs, there she is, Dee Dee Griesbauer. Uh, she loves to get on that bike. This is her comfort place. You know, this is her happy place. She's a great swimmer. She's a great Ironman athlete. But really, you put her on her bike, I think she's happier either on the bike or with her dogs on the couch. What do you think? Uh, I don't know. Right now, I think she's pretty happy that she's in third place. Um, she's definitely one of the mover and shakers out there. Um, Danielle Lewis, who we haven't really mentioned much right now, but she's like a rookie. So she's going to be one to watch, and she's definitely making a move on the on the bike. And, you know, her main goal right now is, you know, to get a Kona slot. She's definitely hungry for that. Um, her coach sort of thinks that this distance is going to suit her more than the 70.3 distance. So... It'll be interesting to see, and she did work a lot on, on her aerodynamics in particular for this race. So we are seeing her move up to the leaderboard just as like we are seeing Dee Dee. Um, right now, if we do a little bit update on the women's race, we have Joshua McCauley who's sitting in first. Right behind her, we have Lauren Brandon who led out of the water. Uh, as we said, Dee Dee made that move into third place. And then sitting right there, we have Rachel Zindakis, who had a top 10 at Ironman Florida. And then, of course, you know, the other big shaker I said was Danielle Lewis, who's moved up to fifth. But, you know, she is over 10 minutes back, but she has made up a lot of the time. And then, you know, you've got Melanie McQuaid that's moved down to six. You've got Britt Vock, who is in seventh. Um, Smith is in eighth, and then you have Jen Annette, who is sort of settling in that place. You know, she's quite good on the on the bike. And then Joanna Ryder is the other mover through the field. But you know, Joanna Ryder is sitting at eight, 18 minutes back. Well, you talk about Kona. You talk about getting to the big dance. If any of you out there have big dreams of making it to Kona, I tell you what. I've got something for you. You've got to take a look at this brand new race happening in Des Moines, Iowa. More qualifying slots than any other North American Ironman certified Piedmontese Beef North American Championship Des Moines is your ticket to the World Championship. Plus, Des Moines is much more than just cornfields. Some people say it's culture without the cost, art without the attitude, travel without the traffic, and walkability without the worry you got to see for yourself this fantastic new race venue. Register today at Ironman.com. Don't miss it. <clears throat> now, uh, as we continue to watch our women's leader, Joanna uh, is on the front right now. Jocelyn McCauley. Jocelyn, sorry. Jocelyn, my mistake I, I, there. I, I, Thanks I for letting me know. I appreciate you <laughs> because I would have made that mistake if you hadn't. I've been doing no, that all day. No, sometimes... Uh, we get a little bit confused, but <laughs> Jocelyn McCauley is definitely our leader right now. Um, if we do a little bit of a recap on how her race has been going, 
you know, she had a solid swim. She was right there where she needed to be in the water and she definitely was moving faster than everyone else and that's why she's moved up from probably just outside the top three in the swim to leading the women's race. Right now, she, you know, it's quite fast out there. So obviously they have a tailwind. It's They're averaging about 30 miles an hour right now. Lauren Brandon is right there with her. Um, and then Dee Dee's riding just as fast. And then also Rachel Zinzaskas is riding just a little bit slower. And that's hence why she's moved to seven minutes back. And Dee Dee Griesbauer has moved to that five minute range. So yeah. she's moved up a little bit as well. And this is where this part of the course is when, you know, you are going to start to see more action happening from those riders that are super strong on the bike. You know, everyone will sort of stay together for a while. And then as the race progresses, you will see them moving further and further ahead. And particularly if you're a strong bike rider in those headwind sections, and we know we have like a significant headwind, if they're clocking over 30 miles an hour in in <laughs> the tailwind section or more, there was a couple of sections where they were moving a lot quicker than that. So it does tell you a tale about the bike course, the fact that there is a significant headwind, but there's also a significant tailwind. So the one thing you have to be careful when you're racing about the tailwind is, you know, you can get, dehyd you can get dehydrated very, very quickly just the way the wind is blowing on, on your skin. And you have to be conscious that, one, you're pushing hard enough also in that tailwind. You can't sort of just, like, cruise it because you also have to make sure you are pushing the power on the pedals. All good information right there as we get a nice tight shot here of Jocelyn McCauley wearing big num bib number one, looking to match her seed, uh, taking a little sip off that integrated hydration system. Ventum does so well. It's tucked in, and you got that straw, all the water inside uh, that uh, – uh, teal colored or uh, turqu light turquoise aqua colored reservoir atop the frame. So something that I think is super clever uh, and aerodynamic. But let's go away here for a second and just mention this. You did a great job recapping splits and I'm not going to match you, but I will say this. Dietlev and Svensson in the men's race. So I should say Dietlev has gotten within two minutes of the lead. So he has dropped Svensson and has really made that chase towards Varga and Laidlow. So Right now, Magnus Dietliv from Denmark, he's making his way in uh, to first place. He's notably faster, one, uh, almost, geez, almost two miles per hour difference uh, from everyone else on the section that he's currently riding. And I'll, I'll say this, because you brought up an excellent point on hydration and wind when it's at our back. But there's something that is also sort of under-discussed. When you have a tailwind, a lot of us think I'm going to ride hard into the headwind, easy with the tailwind. A, a rider that has great power and great ability on the bike can actually make more time on a tailwind, being able to really up the ante. It, it's hard to do, but a combination of cadence and obviously pressure to the power, I mean, to the pedals, just doing that is, is a skill that a lot of great riders have that some of us weaker riders do not have. And so I guess I've mentioned that because I think what you're seeing is with Dietlev, he is in that category where on the bike, he can up the ante with a tailwind and make massive time. Whereas, you know what? You and I push hard into a headwind. We may gain a half a mile per hour. That's that's not the same as gaining two miles per hour with a big tailwind. So I hope that makes sense. Uh, well, if not, it, hit me up on Facebook and I'll explain it. No, no, but it's that's so true in so many ways, but it's also a uh, gearing choice because Super, if you totally. haven't taken into account that there is going to be a significant tailwind, it's like you're going to be spinning out your gear. So it's not like this is a hilly course where you had to really make sure the ratios favor a hilly course. This course, you had to look in the fact, okay, how significant is that tailwind going to be? Yeah, and you, great point. Great a lot point. of it would be interesting to, to see, and, and if we had the opportunity to ask some of the athletes, well, what sort of cassette did you put on the back of your bike? Did you know how significant that tailwind was going to be? Because historically, we do know there is a headwind and a tailwind, but we don't always know what it's, I mean, it's forecast, but until you get out and ride it, and also depending on that 
heat and humidity, that's going to play a role as well because it's like, okay, do I go with a bigger gearing and really max that out? <laughs> but am I going to pay for that because I used all that extra energy in the heat and the humidity? That, yeah, great, great, great uh, addition to that point. I love it. And so as I look here at Didi uh, pushing a nice solid cadence here, rolling back uh, towards town, uh, she looks like she's really going for it. I mean, you can see a little bit of uh, uh, her checking out the digits down on the computer, but really she's just putting the effort. And I think uh, if we really discuss Didi's past in, in uh, the the – Middle portion, I'll say, of her career, she won three Ironmans. She did three top tens in Kona. Uh, she really got in the mix across the globe. And then it transitioned into this part of her career where she's done some ultra racing, which which puts these Ironmans at short distance. So she really put in the miles to be able to handle these long, long rides. Loves it. Loves that time on the bike uh, like, like, like very few people do. Just really thrives. And now here she is just, I think she's able to max out, so to speak, um, on, you know, on a bike like this, 112 miles. She, as I mentioned before in Cozumel, she hit that 430. If this one, if she's, if she's pushing the pedals like she is, you see, you're going to see an elite uh, top class bike time, one that rivals and beats many uh, male times. Uh, so again, some kudos to, to Didi Griesbauer, who's cranking it, pushing along here in third place at the moment. She's definitely cranking it, I can tell you that. You know, she looks so smooth. Uh, she looks physically in great shape. Um, definitely, you know, that the training camp with the other athletes, with her coach. I mean, it, it really, really helps to get in that group environment when you're, like, all doing the sort of same race. It really pushes you along in those training sessions, you know, if – and, and as I said, you know, it's a chance to, like, move away from everything else in your life. And, you know, that's what sort of makes or breaks a lot of athletes. You know, those small little details and how much they can really focus on being a triathlete. Because it's not always the easiest thing to focus on it 100%. It's not always healthy. So sometimes, you know, you do need to step out. And that home environment sometimes is really, really good and really great for the majority of the time, but coming into a, a, a big race focus, it is nice to be able to like avoid some of that noise that comes in from the outside. And, you know, Dee Dee is a talented athlete, you know, to be in your fifties, um, to still be racing professionally, successfully. I mean, I think it's a testament to her mental ability, um, her ability to have fresh goals, because that's the hardest thing, you know, year after year. How do you keep motivating yourself? And, and that's the hardest thing that as a pro that you have, and you don't always see a lot of pros like continue to race for a long and a huge career and then step into age group as well, is because, you know, burnout is a big factor. And that burnout factor is, well, how do I keep myself motivated? Yes. Oh, great, great comments there. Speaking of comments, before we rush off to break, YouTube has us seeing this. That's not leopard print on she. Okay, maybe not. Best commentating ever. Is that Michael? Gosh, thanks, So uh, I will mention that. It is Michael. Thanks. Appreciate your compliments. And then how about this one? This one's good. Um, we. I'm going to say this. I love bikes. Cheryl, that's what you said. I agree. We'll see you here in a minute. That thing John Moran has, that's a hypervolt. That thing he uses to warm up and stay loose before he throws it down. That thing Tony Finau uses on course between shots. Ooh, that's money. That thing Robin and I use before and after we're on the bike so we can ride harder tomorrow. That thing Erlen Holland uses before smashing it into the back of the net. That thing that's for everyone. The hypervolt from Hyperice. Give your body the daily relief it's been asking for. And we're back here with Jocelyn McCauley in the front at the moment. She and Lauren Brandon doing a little back and forth, but but here clear from everyone else. Dee Dee Griesbauer chiseling her way back towards those 
uh, two and trying to make it a threesome up front. And I'll say this, I rushed through a couple of these comments, but I want to say thank you to those of you on YouTube that are commenting in and saying hi to us. We love being on that platform as well. Zoe Mendoz also said, is it windy now? It's so windy in Houston. And this is what's cool because all the folks we have on course are saying that the wind is really kicking up. And so that challenges us, that tests us uh, on both sides. We've, we've discussed that, McKeely and I have. As we go here, I want to also say that um, that we're at, people are asking about speeds and, and overall speeds. I mean, let's talk average or current. So we will see these women averaging in the end, probably in between 24 ish and 25 maybe so around about a 440 24 miles an hour the men they'll be in the in the more in the zone of 26 to 28 miles an hour for the average and that that is shocking but that puts them in the low four hours um some fun stuff and and actually you know what i'm a historian i'm a buff i love this stuff i'm not a historian i i follow iron man history but i remember a couple years ago many years ago about seven years ago when one of the first times i heard the name joe skipper he was racing this event as was lionel sanders and those two guys they went four. if i remember correctly it was about 408 and 410 they biked on this course skipper in front of Sanders. But think about that. That was in the early stages of us breaking a lot of 415s, like consistently. But Joe Skipper, uh, we'll get uh, hopefully a chance to chat with him later today. Lionel Sanders, obviously, he's he's elevated his Ironman game, racing the world champs in, in three weeks' time. But just talking about and thinking back to some of these epic breakthroughs and performances that we've seen on this awesome course. Uh, so, again, I'm a fan of – Texas. I'm a fan of Memorial Hermann Ironman, Texas. And right now, MJ, I'm a fan of Sam Laidlow. He has been out there out front in the in the lead all day long. That is no easy task. As I say that, here is Magnus Ditlev uh, from Denmark, and he's just motoring. You can see the two miles an hour difference now, can't you? No, you definitely can. You know, he's the, probably the most talented bike rider in this field. You know, he grew up bike riding and stepping up from 70.3 to Ironman. I mean, he's got to be feeling pretty confident right now. I mean, yeah, the marathon is still unknown for him, for sure. He's never raced and done a marathon after riding 112 miles. But, you know, he looks smooth. He looks strong. He has a good finish. You know, we talked about his preparation that, you know, He's what I call more of a lab rat. You know, they were very precise. They were in the heat chamber, cham chamber. They knew exactly what to expect. They would set the wind. They would set the heat index. So he is very, very well prepared. But, you know, it's still early. You still got to run a marathon. You still have the closing miles of this race. But, you know, someone like him, if the wind is as strong as everyone's saying as he gets out of the saddle he's going to benefit from that. You know, a strong bike rider will be a strong bike rider. No one, no matter if it's a windy course or a flat course or a hilly course, you know, definitely there's certain types of athletes who do well on hilly courses to flat. But I think overall, he's very, very well-rounded as a, a bike rider. Correct. And now as we come in on a close shot of Sam Laidlow, it's the first time I can say, all right, we mentioned the beating sweat, but now I see the labor in his face. Clearly he took his face covering off. No more. We get a nice look at his eyes. Don't mistake me. He looks great still, but you're starting to see the wear and tear. Um, you're starting to realize that this is the cost of being up front as a 23-year-old young man from France pushing through Ironman, Texas, uh, this is when you start to say, ouch, okay, I've got a lot of racing to go. What am I made of? What Gatorade do I need? What water do I need? What elements can uh, I take in to, to face these external elements? So uh, that's, that's interesting. Varga is still sitting in the appropriate zone behind, uh, watching uh, intently as these two guys uh, get going. Uh, so... <laughs> this is interesting stuff, MJ. No, and I mean, this is what happens, you know, when you are pushing and it's hot and it's humid and, you know, it started off quite pleasant out there and, you know, you really have to face the elements on this course. So it's really, really important to, s to see what athletes are doing to overcome that. 
And this is what we're going to see right now, exactly when that um, visor actually <laughs> came off. That was so I fast. Believe. I mean, that is, again, <laughs> rate of speed and wind. If you, if you kind of took your eyes off the camera for a split second, you missed it. He looked back to see where Varga was. And boom, the visor flew off. He was obviously facing the other way, but you saw a quick flash of that visor flying away. So an unintentional uh, discarding I of know. equipment is not a is not a penalty. Yes. It's it's uh, <laughs> so everyone will say if the if the official said, all right, that was an unintentional littering, unintentional abandoned equipment that technically he could get uh, cited with a one minute penalty, not a four, not a five. It, it's also more than likely the and, official. And this this is going to get a little uncomfortable for him. Correct. Because, you know, he doesn't have sunglasses on. So, that, yeah. you know, the he, visor is a nice addition, but, you know, sometimes things happen. So now he's got to, got to deal with that wind, especially in the headwind, the tailwind, it won't really have any effect. But, you know, the chance of something flying in his eye, you know, you're going to get watery eyes in the, in the headwind. Um, but, you know, it's like he's probably ridden with, no glasses before, mm -hmm. you know, if it gets too rainy and, you know, you need to put your glasses in, in your pocket. But, you know, it, 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 it could be one of those irritating things that when you start to fatigue out and, you know, you start to mentally look focus, lose focus, you know, it could be just a slight little ching in the armour. That's right. But, you know, he's still, and, and I think that's one of the reasons why we'll start to see a little bit more of how he's feeling now because that shield was definitely hiding a lot of emotion. Yes. And that's one of the things when, when you're racing and you're trying to, like, gauge how everyone's feeling, it's that that shield hides a lot of emotion. That's right. So now we're actually going to get to physically see what he actually looks like and not hide by that, that shield. So for us as commentators, it might be for helpful. For him racing, it's going to be a little bit of a hindrance. Yeah, correct. Well said. And uh, either way, it was not planned. So he's dealing with something, again, as we do with Ironman racing. We problem solve. We deal with the unexpected. And he's doing that in fine form. Uh, however, uh, more more to come on that one. I, I think it, it's it, it's sort of a problematic. I've seen it a couple of times. You see him in Kona sometimes. It used to be athletes chose not to race with, with lenses or with a visor. But uh, the let's look at the benefit. Maybe it's cooler without the visor, so maybe a little well, more breeze. This is the other thing that sometimes I don't like about shields is you can't actually feel the wind on your face and you can lose the perception of how fast you're actually going. I yeah. don't know if you've ever experienced that, but for me, like if you're used to doing it, that's a little different. But sometimes like that feel of the wind on your face gives me sort of a perception of how fast I'm going. And with the shield on, yeah, it's great aerodynamically, but you lose a sense of how fast you're actually going. Maybe yeah. that's because I may be a little bit old school, but <laughs> we didn't, I mean, there were shields, but there's definitely more options for yeah. shields these days. But yeah. every time I've ever ridden in a shield, it's always like, I sort of lose a sense of what that speed is. And, you know, power is going to tell you and your speedometer is going to tell you, but that sensory feel you know, has an a, a effect on a lot of things. Agreed. No, those are great points. And, uh, and he's def yeah, he's definitely, so there's a couple benefits, maybe losing that visor, obviously overall wasn't a choice. He's lighter. <laughs> <laughs> so every time he goes over the overpass, he's <laughs> appreciably a gram less. Uh, no, that's great. Great stuff. And three hours and 40 minutes into the race, we are waiting and we will present with you any more exciting action. He's kind of peeking over his shoulder. And it's got to be a little bit annoying uh, to, to realize that you're dragging a uh, sort of uninvited guest along. But in the end, we have to rise above and know that uh, this race is on. Hold on. I actually can see in the background what looks to me like someone matching the pace, which would be Magnus Dietlev. Uh, so I think we got to hold on tight here to see if we have any changes in the order as we come into transition. Sam Laidlow on the side, dropping what he needs to drop, picking up what looked to be a new Morton packet there, looking over his shoulder, safely navigating, going for water, um, going for Gatorade. You call it, you get it. And so he's trying to get that. Remember, too, this is another art, Makili. This is, this is not easy. 
uh, I always kind of crack up, and you're, you know, coming from Australia, you feel this. On some parts of the world, we ride on the left, others yes. on the right. That means a left side or a right side hand up accordingly. So <laughs> you just don't plan that. You know, these guys are maybe European, and they're all used to the right hand grab up, but stuff to factor into the mix. No, you know, he was patient, though. He was, like, super polite getting around some of the age group athletes, which was nice to see. But he also was like he missed a bottle, didn't panic. And, you know, the way the aid stations are set up are, are, are really thoughtful as well because, you know, you get a chance to, if you miss your Gatorade, you can still get your water. If you miss your water, there'll be another chance to get water. So, you know, it's nice when you go to a race that's, that is planned down to little things like that, those little details that could affect your race, particularly when it's hot and humid. It's like... You know, there's only so much hydration you can physically carry over 112 miles. You know, those aid stations play a significant impact uh, in your hydration, keeping your core temperature down. So it's super, super important that, you know, you do get those those bottles. And you also get bottles that are way probably colder than you currently have on your bike. So l lots of things to take into account when you're out there racing and definitely... Nutrition is the fourth discipline. Great stuff, of course. Uh, thank you so much for that commentary. Uh, checking back in with YouTube, I want to just give a shout out uh, to Nick Walda, who said, thanks for visiting us and coming here to the Woodlands. Uh, the, oh, in fact, he is actually from Visit the Woodlands. I'm reading this more properly now, and we want to say that. So that's awesome. Well, thanks for being here. And uh, correct, they, we always, well, there's a whole lot of thanks going on because we love being in the Woodlands, and, and we love that you've got us down there. So um, it is a good, good spot to race, a good spot to visit. And I can't uh, say enough good things about, of course, the race or the area. So thanks so much to uh, Sam Walda. Good to hear it. No, definitely that local advantage is uh, something that when you come home to a, a race and you sort of have a hometown advantage, it it's, it's definitely has a, a positive uh, impact on, you know, when you're out there and everyone's screaming your name. It's like, even though when you're racing, sometimes you block that out, you know, it's just so nice when you have that moment of clarity and you hear all that positive energy I mean, it just helps you and, you know, especially if you're in a difficult situation, you're just going to push that little bit harder. So definitely that home course advantage is uh, something that you, you definitely need to consider when you're racing other athletes. There we are on the bottom right. That's third place, Magnus Dietle. But you can see he is just behind Richard Varga, the second place athlete. And so we have three together close, and I'm expecting another one of our favorite Morton moves coming right up. Dietlev glancing at the camera. I like this man's confidence, and I like just the pure power that you see when he's on the bike. We saw this at 70.3 World Championships last fall in St. George, and I expect over the next 10 years we're going to see more power from the man from Denmark. But here, to summarize and recap what I'm seeing our longtime leader from France, 23 years young. This is the guy that we call laid low. He's out there and leading it out. Varga in second with Dietlev in third. The action just heating up, folks, still easily four-plus hours of racing. Stay with us because in just a second, we'll be back with more coverage.
And here we are back on the roads, the tollway to be certain, racing through uh, the Woodlands area here in Texas. And the action just getting hotter and hotter, as does the temperature of the day. Right here, that is Sam Laidlow. Then we have Richard Varga. Then we have Magnus Dietlaev. This is an exciting race. Uh, that we are watching play out here live. <laughs> I just had to take a pause and look at, there it is. Those are the flags I'm looking for. Folks, you can finally see kind of what we're talking about, a breeze, a stiff breeze here. Uh, by no means am I going to call it hurricane force. Like we're not up there where it's the crushing winds, but it's certainly a nuisance. It's certainly a challenging wind. You know, and Sam like had said that he, uh, he likes to see people suffer after four plus hours. <laughs> So like uh, we're definitely getting ne near that point where uh, he's going to see a lot of suffering going on. So he always feels like he generally feels better after four plus hours. So we'll see, we'll see if he's still smiling and uh, at the front of the race yeah. uh, soon. And uh, it'll be interesting to see. But yeah, it's three guys now in, in the front of this race. Um, definitely... It's been interesting to see who's been moving up and who's who's been sort of like sitting in that major pack. I mean, Magnus did live. I mean, what an amazing bike ride so far, you know, for making an Ironman debut. I mean, we know he's very strong on the bike, but, you know, to actually see him do it, put it on paper, put it down on the race course, and, you know, he's sort of being smart right now. You know, he probably used a lot of energy to get to the front pack. Um, he definitely was riding a lot faster and, you know, that two miles an hour. And now you see him um, hydrating a lot, uh, pouring a lot of water over himself. So, you know, he's smart to sort of like settle in. This is the front of the race. This is where I needed to be. So it'll be interesting to see once he's been riding in this front pack for a while, to see if he made that strategic decision to go, okay, now I'm going to push it. Because that's what he did the last probably like 20 miles that he decided he didn't want to be in no man's land in third place. He wanted to find the front of the race and he did that and he definitely upped his power and that's why he's sitting in third right now. So I think tactically he's making a really nice move right now. Really, I agree with you 100%. So those three... Uh, up the road from this young lady, Jocelyn McCauley from USA, leading the charge here wearing bib number one. You can see Gatorade up front, water, water in her Ventum Reservoir, and her own special concoction behind her seat. Uh, she knows the importance of nutrition. Word out there on the course, because we're inside a comfy studio, is that it's not too muggy, feels almost cool, overcast skies, but the wind seems to be a big, big factor Let's talk about how we got to where we are today. At, I mean, sorry, right now, this is a look back at our bike. This was when Lauren Brandon had that lead. She was out front for so long, and she got caught by fellow American and fellow Ventum rider, Jocelyn McCauley. Then we had a good look at the long chase pack of men who were chasing this guy, Sam Laidlow, for a long, long time, who had been away with Richard Varga. Uh, we did get to catch up briefly as Dee Dee Griesbauer came back into the fold, got onto that podium for the bike, and then a little bit more of the same, laid low, laid low, and laid low until he lost his visor, and uh, he's still in front, though. But he did get caught up, and MJ, this is the cool thing, laid low and Varga, ultimately, they've just been really for three hours in front looking for company the women a little bit of back and forth jocelyn mccauley stretching it out but holding the lead lauren brandon close with dd griesbauer really in that mix and now as we look at a visorless laid low we'll return to live action here with jocelyn mccauley in first place yeah jocelyn's you know done a fantastic job to to get to the lead um, Lauren Brandon's still hanging in there. She's doing a great job. Uh, Didi Grisbauer is about 5.30 back. So riding like pretty steady right now. But, you know, Danielle Lewis is, is the big mover. She's riding slightly faster right down right now than McCauley, than Jocelyn. Um, and then we see a little bit of a trend down for Zinklarkus. 
the hell I pronounce her name? How do you pronounce her name? Rachel. Uh, <laughs> so she's moved down to fifth. So definitely, like, the big shakers were Jocelyn McCauley, which we expected moving into the lead. But Danielle Lewis is having a great day so far on, on the bike because, you know, she had a significant deficit to make up after the swim. And, you know, right now she's riding faster than anyone else. And if you're asking me, I say Zelenskis when I can remember the word. Here's what we're looking at now, a little bit more of um, Jocelyn McCauley here churning it out. She has an interesting stat as well that I'll say as we kind of come back to to uh, this. A Morton move to be certain. Magnus Dietlieb rolling through. And you know what? We saw Sam Laidlow looking back, looking back. Perhaps he had a sense. And then, boom, the Great Dane came through now at the front of the race of his first Ironman. Great to know. So Magnus Dietlieb, folks, we called him Uber. We called him Super. I'm just calling him the front runner here today. He's a rider to be, to be afraid of for certain. However, Sam looks like he's tucked right in. Richard Varga hasn't missed a beat. These athletes pushing along uh, behind this man, um, and it is going to be exciting because no matter how you look at it, we're still super early, very early to be into this race. Three hours, 52 minutes, uh, you know, minimum, we're going to go another, well, close to four hours. So uh, when we talk about that, once the heat, because look, the clouds will help a bit, but they'll burn off and it is going to get hot and tasty and toasty on that run, three laps around uh, the woodlands on those bike paths. Not a lot of breeze in there. Feels real stagnant. So challenging conditions to come, but uh, but exciting stuff. A new leader. No, oh, definitely. Uh, Magnus did live is doing a great job. And, you know, this could benefit Sam and also Richard out there. You know, it'll give them a chance to, you know, get a little bit of further ahead. But they've also got to be careful because we know he's riding two miles an hour faster than everyone else so he definitely settled in made sure he hydrated he was super smart deciding when he was going to take over the lead and i and it's he's gonna make a move i mean he's already made himself known to be a contender being at the start i mean we we knew he was a strong bike rider um so for him right now i think the next 10 miles we're really gonna s see and i think particularly when we get to that tailwind we're going to see that's when he's going to really put a little bit more time on the rest of the field and it's also going to be interesting as we we look down to see who's going to be that fourth place i mean we know who the top three are right now laidlow varga and of course magnus did live in the lead um, and then we have jesper Severson who's been sitting comfortably in fourth place for a while. And, you know, but he's sitting almost at seven minutes back. And then you sort of have that pack. You know, they were sitting at about seven minutes back. Now they're sitting at over eight and a half minutes back. And, and there's and quite a few we, guys sitting back there. And one thing we know, because Hoffman lost his chip, but our, our spotter's on the road. In fact, Julie Dibbon stated she saw Hoffman drop that group. So you have to figure if they're eight minutes back, he's in that mix ahead of them. But, but Ben Hoffman and folks that didn't catch this, he lost his chip in the swim, and we couldn't quite get him a chip in transition. He does have a chip sitting in his run shoe bag, so he will have a chip when he starts the run. We'll get him tracked again. Uh, but Hoff fans, don't worry. He's still in that mix. I think that's interesting to see, and I just got to talk about these women because you mentioned her a minute ago, Danielle Lewis, uh, formerly Dingman. This woman is new to Ironman, but she is so good, and her run caliber is top-notch. I have to agree with her coach when you said that he felt she'd be good at this distance. I think so too. She's got a good positive attitude and she's so she's really just so good on bike and run. So watch, she's moving through the field. She's eight minutes out of first. I'll, t I'll tell you, Makili, you know this, that's, that's gone in a snap of a fingers, that kind of d uh, deficit once the marathon starts. So uh, keep her in your, you know, keep her in your betting pole for probably a top three. Uh, but back to Didi, also someone that we got to, you know, we got to focus on a lot of good history and a lot of good experience in, in her body so she knows what to do as well. Yeah, you know, this 
these two disciplines, the swim and the bike, are her strongest. Um, definitely her weakest is, is the run. I mean, she would agree with that. But, you know, she's still solid on any given day. You know, and I think that's what makes her such a great athlete as, you know, she's in her 50s, which I think is awesome. But that's the why sh that she is so good at these races is because she's very, very consistent. And, you know, she has so much experience and she still finds the motivation to want to push at the level that you, you need to, to push. But, you know, as I said, you know, she has to progress here right now. This is where the biggest impact for her is going to be in that swim and bike combo. And then, you know, you have, as we were talking about a little bit, we'll go back to Danielle Lewis. I mean, her preparation hasn't been, it's been good, but, you know, she did have a little hiccup because she also got a little bit of a cold before uh, the 70.3 in Oceanside, but she has felt like she's put the most amount of hours into her training that she ever has. And I mean, part of that is because she is stepping up to 70.3, Yeah. but it's also the fact that, you know, there's a progression, you know, she started from the 70.3s and now she's just pushing her body that little bit extra to excel at the Ironman distance. Great stuff. And we're back here with Jocelyn McCauley, front of the race here for the women, pushing hard, looking great. You can also start to see four hours into her race, you start to, you know, detect a little bit of wear and tear as you'd expect. Just, hey, I'm working hard. And, and remember, we go up and down. We feel great one minute and, and rough the next. So that's all part of Ironman racing. The roller coaster. Yeah, the roller coaster. And I just want to say, you mentioned Jesper Svensson a minute ago, and you mentioned uh, Didi with the bike, with the bike component. And it, look, Jesper Svensson's another one that when he is on form, he's hard to shake on the bike. The fact that he's lost time and dropped off will tell me, hey, is he going to come through and run his way to the top five? You never know. But uh, I look at the the Swedish athlete, and I think his history has shown that his base ra best races come when he when he's up in the Dietlev position uh, up front there. So either way, something just to think about as we get closer to that Hoka run course, three laps around the woodlands, uh, will Jesper Svensson be in the mix? I don't count him out, but it's uh, it's definitely concerning to see him go backwards. Joshua McCauley looks very comfortable right now. You know, at four hour, almost four hours in, definitely she's in control. You know, she's still riding strong. Yeah, there's a one athlete that's gaining a little bit but still a fair way back and I think one of the things that that I like about Jocelyn is like she's steady yeah she's steady all day long and you know she's quite smooth on the bike she does roll her shoulders a, a little bit as she fatigues out we'll see a little bit more as we progress in the 112 mile bike but she's tough too you know she's a tough cookie and you know her first Ironman that she did, I think she was like, she had a baby like nine months before that or something crazy. <laughs> right. And, you know, she had a second child probably like 12 months ago, you know, so that's tough to do motherhood and triathlon and be competitive 12 months later. Oh, yeah. I mean, I mean look, look at her. Look at her record. She, you know, we've got her down for a total of 13 Ironman finishes. She's 33 years old. Three of those, uh, three of those 13, she's won. She's been in the top five uh, multiple times and, and that top three multiple times. Uh, she's also had a, a decent little number of DNFs. What that tells me, when she goes for it, sometimes she blows and sometimes it goes well. Either way, Joss McCauley, a lot here uh, to see from her, and she's definitely the one to beat. So let's do this. We'll come back in a second. See that thing John Moran has? That's a hyperbole. That thing he uses to warm up and stay loose before he throws it down. That thing Tony Finau uses on course between shots. Ooh, that's money. That thing Robin and I use before and after we're on the bike so we can ride harder tomorrow. That thing Erlen Holland uses before smashing it into the back of the net. That thing that's for everyone. 
the Hyper Bowl from Hyper Ice. Give your body the daily relief it's been asking for. Jocelyn McCauley still up front. This one out of the saddle, get a little stretch to the back, a little stretch to the back of the legs as well. I will say that I do see actually a little bit of wear and tear. Like I think she's starting to get uncomfortable. The side to side uh, is is sort of newer. You can see her kind of stretching out the neck. I, I'm not concerned, but I just like to see you know, what we can do, McKeely, is we can compare how they look at the beginning to how they look at the end. Look at her neck's uncomfortable. You can kind of tell uh, that's because you do have to tuck it down in a race like this and spend a lot of time in that turtle position where you where you tuck in and you stay arrow. Uh, it, it starts to grate on you. But I, but I think overall she's resilient and used to and planned for this sort of thing. Um, but, but keep that in mind. And folks like the kind of the – the commentator trick that I always say is we like to look at how they, how athletes look at the beginning of the swim to the end of the swim, beginning of the bike to the end of the bike. And of course on the run, it, it, it really plays out is who's falling apart. So whose who's, uh, form is going uh, to the trash bin and who's doing great. So other side of that hill, Jocelyn McCauley picking up the cadence. Well, here's a little insight for you. So... One of the confidence workouts that she does leading into a race, well, for the swim, she likes to swim like 35 times 100 at 108 pace or faster. So Ouch. that's pretty significant. And then she also ride, likes to ride like five hours with a normalized power over 210. That's saying a lot. Are we talking about Jocelyn McCauley? Yeah, we are. Yeah, and she, you. you know, oh, like uh, most triathletes, she does a, a, a ton of runs off the bikes. Yeah, one of the questions I had asked her earlier in the week, you know, what's the session that gives her the most confidence? And it was that 35 times 100 and that five hours at over normalized power of 210. So, that's, I mean, I love getting insights like that. Because, that's a great question. You know, it just shows you, oh, my goodness, she's a great bike rider. To be able yeah. to hit 210 for that long, yeah, you know, is amazing. And in a race with fresher legs, obviously, she's probably going to push a little, little bit more power. Yeah, wow, fantastic. Good insight, and thanks to Jocelyn for sharing that, and thanks to you for reaching out to ask the question. I think it it is, it's that unknown, too, sometimes when you're out there, you say, what do I need to do? What does a gal like that do to get uh, fast enough to win an Ironman three times? And there's your answer. Uh, speaking of three-time Ironman winner, Didi Griesbauer back in nice position if we look uh, past that glorious race kit that she has on. You'll see that she's... It's like a spring... It's very springy. It is very. It's, it's Easter. lovely. It's, I love it's, it. It screams Easter or like yeah, daylight savings. It is. It is spring, and uh, it's it's really yeah, it's really pleasing to look. at. You know at. what they say: <laughs> look good, feel good, go good. There you. That's if 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 more people just knew that is the truth, uh, we'd have a lot more uh, good looking outfits on course. You know, my, we, my twin sister always used to say, "Fake it till you make it." Fake it till you make it. That's a good one. And uh, the the thing is. What she has on is in stark contrast to what I refer to as triathlon camouflage, which is black and white. <laughs> so if you want to blend in, black and white. If you want to not be seen, black and white. But if if your goal is for your family to find you or for uh, McKeeley Jones to call your name, wear something bright, <laughs> Ben Hoffman and Didi Griesbauer style. Uh, so that's the method that we use here. Oh, you know, there is actually a disadvantage <laughs> to being bright and colorful totally. because then you're easy to spot. Totally. <laughs> well, it's the, Sometimes it's, you want to hide. So, you know, that camouflage of black and yeah. white. Could be good. Know, for the spectators and family, it's not so good. Correct. But, like, if you're racing and, you know, you don't want anyone to see where you are, sure. it's like, you know, you can easily blend in. But if you've got a lot of color, you are not blending in in no way. That's right. I it, mean, I prefer the color. But you definitely don't blend in. <laughs> well, what about the whole idea that if there is a group of six people that accidentally are drafting, because no one would do that on purpose, but if you're accidentally drafting, the official's going to probably grab the one in the bright kit. It's kind of that red sports car. That guy would be dinged right there <laughs> because he was so bright. That would be a good question for a head referee. <laughs> I, I'm, like if you've got a bunch of guys and subconsciously – do you know who you, and they're all sort of like right on the edge of being legal. It's like, who are you going to pick out first? That's the it, colorful yeah. guy or the camouflage guy. I think it's a, I think it's in the, I think it's a subconscious, but I think you're exactly right. We could ask them and they'd say, no, 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 I'm completely objective. Well, it's, that's why I said subconscious. Yeah, yeah. So we have to hypnotize them and find out, but I do think it's, it, it's a great subject matter. Look, this one, this kit, 
It looks good. It looks sharp. It doesn't catch my eye. What catches my eye is the power she's putting out, and you better believe it's what? You know, 200... when, you're, when you're that fast, you don't, <laughs> you don't have to stand to. out. I know, you're already no. standing out. <laughs> that was the good point. And then, uh, yeah, watching this, she's up out of the saddle again, a little incline, going over one of these little rollers, little overpasses. I see her looking down a lot, like, you know, checking the gear, checking stuff out. I, I think the neck's bugging her. Honestly, I think she's just get feeling like a lot of uh, aerodynamic wear and tear. And uh, that's she's more than happy to sit up and, and be on the base bars for this climb, give that neck a break. But, you know, this, I mean, I've watched her several times now racing, and, and that can be a little bit typical of how – she races definitely towards the later stages. You know, she isn't quite as smooth, but I definitely think you're right in the fact I've seen her quite a few times just, you know, rotating that neck left to right. So obviously the shoulders and back of the neck are getting a little bit fatigued out. And, you know, that could be part of being it so early in the season. You know, you don't always get a lot of time in the aero bars, you know, when you're out in the real life traffic and, you know, you've got to deal with so many things, you don't get to spend a lot of time in the aero bars. So it's really important when you are planning your bike workouts and that you know you're going to be on a course like this that you find places where you can do it. But, you know, in reality, it's not always possible to find places that you can be in the aero bars for four or five-plus hours. And, you know, as I said, you know, it's the beginning of the season. This is her first race. So, you know, that little bit of race fitness doesn't just help you cardiovascular wise it doesn't just help you muscular wise it also helps you in terms of your positioning on the bike because you know you don't always get to spend the amount of time that you need in that position but you know once she sort of gets rolling though she looks very very comfortable that's right so, you know maybe she's using those heels a little bit strategically and you know stretching a little bit so then when she gets those flat long sections, you know, feels comfortable again. I feel like I'm getting comfortable. I need to spice things up. And the only way I can do that is to call in one of our best guests. This guy, you'll recognize his voice. When you see his mug on camera, you'll know we're talking to Joe Skipper. Joe, thank you so much for joining us. It's great to see and hear you. How are you doing? Yeah, I'm good. Thanks. Thanks for having me on the show. I've been uh, watching the race pretty much uh, through most of the day. Um, All right. It's a good one. It's a good one. Hey, you know what? I mentioned this earlier. This is where I first saw you race. Uh, we'll come to that later. I, I first saw you. It must have been 2015 or something. You could correct me there if it was 14 or 15. But let me ask you this first. First, Well, you can answer. When was that you were here in uh, Texas? That, that was 2015, and that was like my first real breakthrough result. That was. Uh, I still remember that really, did, really clearly. Now. Did you ride a 408? Did I remember that correctly? It was in that zone, 408, uh, 410. 4 Yes. Four ten. See, yeah. <laughs> see, it left a mark. I remember that. That was impressive. I was, and everyone in the UK was saying, "Just wait till you see him run." And I'm like, "If this guy can run, and he rides a four ten, then uh, we better watch out." And guess what? We've been watching out ever since. So, um, good stuff. But uh, cut to the question here: How are you? How are you doing after COVID? You, you know, we we saw that you have to skip St. George. We, we know, we feel for you, and we want to know how you're doing uh, the last few weeks with that recovery. Um, well, initially, when I first got it, I, I felt really bad, like I had flu-like symptoms and I was I was feeling bad for about three days. And then I just felt really fatigued and I, w I wasn't really able to do anything for like another four days after that. So it's probably about day seven where I started doing something. And we're talking like a 30 minute ride on on, you know, the indoor trainer. I, I didn't go out on the road in case, like you know, I was going for an hour ride and I got 30 minutes in, had nothing in the tank. So it was literally like taking it really easy to start off with 30 minute sessions and then I've started to build it up a bit now but when I say build it up it's like building it up to what I would normally do on like a recovery day um and I feel all right I mean I feel good when I'm actually training but it's just the recovery from the training which is where you notice it like I've had a couple of days where I've done slightly too much and I notice it the next day you know I feel fatigued the next day and I'll have a, a bit of a headache so it's quite a balancing act because Normally, in, if you're like healthy and you're in normal training, you know, if, you, if you're doing too much, you're going to know because you'll feel it on the day, won't you? You know, you feel a bit heavy legged or you'll feel a bit fatigued, whereas I actually feel good training. But if I do a bit too much, I feel it the next day. So it's actually having to be really careful and just making sure I just build it up gra like really gradually so I don't overdo it and uh, potentially give myself any like long time problems. 
interesting. Yeah, no, I get that. Yeah. Fascinating. That's yeah, it's really really important that you know share that information too because there's so many athlete, athletes out there getting covid and you know definitely it has a significant impact. Um I did want to ask you um recently you raced the Isuzu Ironman African Championships. How do you feel about that performance? I believe you were top 4. Um I, it wasn't one of my better ones to be honest. I mean, like for me it you would think on paper that having a shorter swim would suit me, but it actually just made one massive pack on the bike, which was good for people that wanted to save a bit of energy on the bike because it, it, if everyone's closer, you can kind of sit in the pack and it's a bit harder to break it up. So that kind of didn't really help me, although I was closer to the front starting the bike. Um, but I had a good bike, but it was just really hard to break it, break it up. You know, I tried a few times, didn't come to anything. And then normally on the run, I would be, pretty strong that's normally like uh one of the like strengths of mine that i can run well off a hard bike but just had nothing really on the day it was probably one of the hardest marathons i've had like in terms of how i felt like normally i said to a couple of friends that the first half of the marathon is free isn't it you know you kind of get through that and it doesn't really start to bite until the first half but from the first kilometer of that run i didn't feel good i was slower than the target pace that i wanted to hold and it was just a it was just a real slog to be honest you know um i was getting paid time splits that I wasn't too far away from the front, you know, and I, I never really went to more than it never went to two minutes. And I think it got up to about one minute 50 and then it went back down again. And I was like, you kind of live in hope, don't you? You know, you kind of hope that someone in front breaks, like blows up and you can get a top three. But I just felt that I just felt flat, to be honest, on the run from the from the start to the finish. And it was just a real slog. It, it was a shame because I'd been training so well. Um, all the runs that I'd done off the bike had gone really well. My cycling had gone well and I was really looking forward to having a, a really good day but I guess that's sometimes what happens isn't it you can prepare the best you've ever done you can be in great form but executing it on on the race day sometimes it just doesn't happen does it yeah no you said it, it it's the it's the challenge the frustration uh and and sometimes the glory of Ironman right you you still have to have everything line up but good insight and and we'll ask you this we'll take the focus to today's race you've You've had experience up against Sam Laidlow. He was second to you last year at Ironman UK. Uh, how do you? What do you think about his strategy? He's been out front. He's he's racing hard. You think he's going to get podium today? Well, he was my my pre race pick. Like we, do, I actually do a podcast with a friend of mine, and um, we picked the two people we picked were Sam Laidlow and uh, Jocelyn McCauley. But I would like to see Sam if he was to win it now, sit up a bit. Like I from a tactical point of view he can get he can see where the others are on the you know on the last turn it's a tailwind on the way back because i had a little look at the weather just to see um what the conditions were like so knocking down the power if he is on the power on the front i'd like to see if it was me i would knock the power the power right down you're not going to gain really any time into a tailwind you're just gonna and you know even if you're going easy i've done this court last time when i did this um race the wind was exactly the same direction as this massive headwind on the way out to houston tailwind on the way back and all the times taken out on the way into the headwind and then in the tailwind section there's no point riding hard because even riding easy you're going to be going 50 kilometers an hour 31 miles an hour 32 miles an hour but you push it an extra 50 60 watts more you might only go 33 34 miles an hour and you're not really going to make any time but it's really going to affect your run so i'd like to see him if he's to do a really good race here ease up get his nutrition on board make sure he's hydrated fueled up well and just knock it right down because the biggest challenge for him is going to be running well in this heat and if you're not well fueled you're going to pay for it and they've got a big enough gap to the chasers that they're not going to lose too much time in this tailwind section so i i would and he's been on the front a lot like it's a bit <laughs> worrying to be honest that he's yeah. been on the front so much <laughs> oh that's an outstanding uh answer i appreciate that very in-depth and very contrary to what i speculated earlier so i love that thank you for uh for that insight i'm sure he'd like i, I Laidlo would like to hear that right now if we could get that word to him mj yeah. No, I mean, for I'm, sure, it's always interesting to see, you know, your perspective as a racer and our perspective as we're sitting here commentating. <laughs> and we did discuss, well, what would your gear choice be? Do you go with a big gear? So it was interesting to see that, you know, hey, hang back. You're right. You're not going to make up or lose that much time. But one thing now that you've sort of told us who your race picks are for this race, we actually wanted to ask you for the World Championship battle in St. George in just two weeks' time, who do you think on both the women's and men's side we should be looking out for? Um, 
for the men, I mean, obviously the Norwegians are, are, are well talked about, aren't they? And they're a threat. But I think <laughs> Sam Long's looking good. He's doing a lot of training and um, I think it could go either way. I think he could be absolutely killing it on race day or he could be totally screwed. Um, <laughs> I, you just really don't know what you're going to get, do you? But I mean, I see his training, what he's doing on Strava and he's hitting some impressive sessions and he's he's been on good form from the start of the season. Um, potentially Lionel is a threat. Um, it's hard to know because he's only raced once this this year and um, he hasn't done a full distance since he's been coached, uh, since he's changed coaches. But I mean, he's always, with Lionel in an Ironman distance, you know, so you're either going to get him at the front and he's buying for the win or he's going to blow up, isn't he? You know, it's yeah. just what line turns up on the day. But he's always when he's normally he's always in the mix for at least some of the race, isn't he? even on his bad days. So uh, potentially him. And then on the woman's side, um, maybe, I mean, you would have said if it was a year ago, you would have said Daniela Reed, but she's she's looking vulnerable how she's been in her last few races. But um she's because of her track record you can't count her out can you and um who else i mean Anne haug um cat matthews is looking good from her early season racing um she's a strong runner i mean i think it's open to be honest i think it's a really open race i'd like to see alistair brownley do well as well in the full yes. distance Yes, sir. Awesome. Great contribution, Joe. It's great to see you. We're really sorry we won't have you at St. George, but we really appreciate you taking time to be with us here today. Any one uh, of the fi- Yeah, yeah, of course. Sorry, Final thoughts, for sure. Say, Lay it on me. Um, the race, you can see now, if you're looking at it, like it's a tailwind on the way back, but you can see Richard Varga. Can you see how easy <laughs> he's getting to yeah. be able to take it and get ride in rider free? That's just because into the tailwind as well. But that's that's where you want, you'd like to see Sam now. You know, he's done a lot of the front. The damage has all been done. It's all about saving yourself. I mean, that's a really smart position because you can see the gap what he's leaving in third place is actually quite big, but he's not having to worry about setting the pace. He's just staying with them. And then on the overpasses, he's catching up a bit, but he's been able to save so much extra power. The only thing that puts me off with Varga, where I'd rule him out, is I saw he had he only had one bottle on his bike and the hydration from the bike. And I know how hot and humid that can get in uh, in the woodlands. And I think that if you're not fully hydrated, you're going you're gonna to pay for that on the marathon. That's the only reason I would discount Varga a bit is because I wonder how well, how well he's taken his nutrition. But if, the way he's played it tactically, he's played a blinder, hasn't he? You know, he's been at the front the whole day. He's saved his energy. I mean, considering it's his first race, you can't, you can't fault the tactics. Yes. Excellent. No, I appreciate you uh, adding that bit. And I think uh, there are true words that we'll get to revisit here a little bit later, about three, three hours, three and a half hours time. So Joe Skipper, thank you so much for being here. We wish you all the best on the continued recovery. And we look forward to seeing you at the next race. Uh, You have a great afternoon, evening. Cheers. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah, that was terrific. That was. I, I really liked what Joe Skipper had to say. Yeah, I agree. And it, it's it, like I always I always agree with, you know, so my favorite thing is when people disagree. And, and I think, you, you know, I really do like that because it creates discussion. And I, I think it's a, an important part, especially when you're looking at an Ironman race where we're all just speculating. But the, br- the brilliance there at the end, like Varga. So we always have this as a rookie Ironman, e- either you're just crushed by bad fueling. Or you get it right. It, or, you're not, or you're not feeling good either. That's maybe why he's on the back. Cor- correct. You know, he I might be he's... saying, you know, he's just cruising. But, you know, right could now, be. maybe could he's be. like, he looks like that's he's... where he needs to be. Yeah, he, he's in a good position. I, think I mean, what... he looks comfortable. He looks comfortable. When, when the, the point, the really good point was that on the overpasses, he kind of catches back up. And then he sits up and is kind of not left for dead. Now, here's what happened is we just saw Dietlev jumped ahead. So it's now Dietlev, um, uh laid low. Varga. So with that change, you can see that all of a sudden the pace is up. So now we have, once we had Dietlev go in the front, he did, he did torque it down and Varga is, um, is, uh, you know, Varga is now on the, a little bit on the, on the rivet. You can see that, right? He's not catching up. He's point is, I think that we come back to it. Joe made an excellent observation, but see Varga's working now harder to stay in contact because Dietlev is taking the reins. Great, great stuff. I still think there's something to be said for um, the fueling changes as well with that tailwind. Uh, we'll say this, a dark horse pick from Joe Skipper he added in there was Tyler Butterfield. And we've had that as a dark horse as well. Tyler Butterfield, the guy, the guy's just a talent and he's a fun guy. So we'll probably see him come through 
In the meantime, the women's race heating up. The men's race has been hot. Here's what I have to say to you. We're just going to take a quick breather, but there's a lot more action to come. So stay right where you are. There's this beautiful moment in time when neither foot is touching the ground. We are free of gravity and weight, moving above the doubts, past limits. When we are light, transformed and hopeful, and if we were to collect all these moments, join them together, well, this is when anything becomes possible. This is when we fly. Throughout my career, people have doubted my ability and I've had it even more so when I've come into triathlon. I think this year will be very different. There will be bigger expectations on me. I love the way that I race. With my swim background, I'm almost in the driving seat from the gun. I'm the person that everyone is chasing. I want to be the best, and I'm willing to work as hard as possible to get there. And we're back with the leader, as I said, just before we tucked away. Magnus Dietli from Denmark is the man who came back to the front, and I think that was, again, a little bit of strategy. If we kind of try and get in the head, when you make the catch, to settle in and roll with the punches for a little while is a good way to conserve energy and then get right back on the front and drive it. I think you're seeing that from Magnus, another iron rookie. He's up front. He looks great. You can tell uh, per Joe Skipper's uh, comment, this guy's got a lot of fuel. He's got a front bottle between the air bars. He's got in uh, in the fairing store water storage and one behind. Um, and you can see he's putting about a 20 meter now gap on laid low. Uh, don't hit the panic uh, button just yet. Uh, right behind is still Varga. I think these. I think this is a move though that Dilev planned to make. Let me see if I can conserve and then get away. Uh, again, that great unknown becomes when you hit the streets of Woodland with your running shoes of the Woodlands. It is not steamy yet, but there's one thing we can count of count on. It will get there. It's it's. Does it get oppressively hot or just pretty hot? Does it get muggy or just humid? There, there's various degrees. Yeah, there's hot and hot. There, too. Yeah, yeah. So, so that's coming. But in the meantime, we've also got. I think you had an update over on the women's race from the tracker, MJ. I'll let you uh, share that with everyone. Um, no, we want to keep you updated on what's happening in the women's race for sure because Jocelyn McCauley has definitely taken the lead from Lauren Brandon. Lauren Brandon is now sitting about two and a half minutes back and Didi Groschbauer is actually moving up towards Lauren Bar uh, Brandon right now at six minutes on, on our leader. So that puts her about three and a half minutes before she can hit um, the second place and overtake Lauren Brandon. So the men just went through 90 miles right before our break. Uh, the women are coming up to almost 80 miles. So we are well and truly in, 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 in the hurt part of the race. Yeah. I mean, this is <laughs> where the hurt really happens. You know, anything that you sort of screwed up at the first part of the race will definitely showcase. But, you know, it's interesting to see what the tactics will be these last 20 miles or so because... You know, right there, you just saw Magnus looking back because he definitely did a concerted effort. And look at that. Boom. The drop yeah. is... Uh, and once that happens, you know, it's going to be really hard for yeah. the other two athletes to uh, bridge that because, yeah. you know, it was funny because we had chatted about how this guy is super strong in the tailwind. Yes. And and that's what he's showing right now. And Joe Skipper said, well, you know, you're not going to make up at much time, but... Right now, this is the move that Magnus is made, making. Let's see how it's going to pan out. If that extra energy that he's using now is going to impact the marathon, or you know what, he's so strong on the bike, it's going to have no impact. Yeah, I, I think there's because there's always two sides to every coin, and I, I think with the tailwind uh, question, you also as sitting in, you get more of a benefit when there's a headwind. So if you're so-called so sitting in, if you're if you're second or third wheel, uh, there's still a, a, a draft that we can discuss that hits you. You still get a t uh, energy savings if you're in a headwind. Whereas a tailwind, it starts to be less. There's that little piece, but there's also just the piece that certain riders. Let's be honest. 
bigger, stronger, more gear, you know, power gear oriented riders that push those 55 chain rings and 56 and 58 chain rings, those guys can really get time. They can really ramp it up. So you will get 33 miles an hour versus 31. And that's um, like that gear choice again. And that's that gear you know, choice? A lot on, of On it, the yeah. back cassette or that front chain ring, you know, what did they decide to do with that? Yeah. And here as we look in, the, I'll go to one more thing as we come to Didi. Funny enough, Dietlev has the camouflage we talked about, black and white. He's also in lap traffic now. So when he does this, he can also get a little out of sight, out of mind. He was just real close with Laidlow and Varga. Now he can get away, and they'll, it'll be harder to keep track. Sure, they'll see the motorbike for the cameras. But the bottom line is he can weave and kind of disappear and lose that contact point visually. Uh, so... He can, he can just get away. But back to the fine figure here of Didi Power. She's on the steed, and she's pushing along. Here's the question. When she catches, if she catches Lauren Brandon, which I think she will, will they ride together? These two do a lot of training together. As we said, training camps uh, together, training in Boulder together. Uh, the last time I saw each of those individuals, they were running together uh, in my neighborhood. So the point being, that is uh, something to look for. Will there be a linking up, a, a camaraderie on race course, or will it be so long sayonara as we saw with uh, Jocelyn when she overtook Lauren? No, definitely uh, they're going to know where they are right now, that's for sure. And Jocelyn McCauley is definitely the one that's the mover and shaker. She's riding at about 21.22. Uh, Lauren Brandon definitely has dropped back to 19.96, so almost 20. And then you got Dee Dee at 20.95 and Danielle Lewis at 20.43. So definitely like first, third and fourth, they're still moving quite fast in this part of the course. Definitely though that 21.22 is significant. Um, and then you've got Dee Dee and Daniela riding pretty much around the same. So there's not going to be much movement between now and the finish line if they can maintain that. But someone like Lauren Brandon, who is about one mile per hour slower, that can have a significant impact as we tick over the miles. Mm -hmm. Good stuff. Good stuff indeed. Looking at uh, what we talked about before, where we see changes. I, I mean, I, I in the form, in the in the in the output, in the in the posturing or the disposition, the the look on the face. I like it, but I see a lot of suffer in the face here and the posturing and the, the neck movement, the head movement of Jocelyn McCauley. And I say I like it because I do feel like uh, she races hard. She gets after it and she works it and she has fun while she's doing it. She embraces that pain. But uh, Jocelyn McCauley, certainly a lot of wiggle uh, in the neck, whereas on the left side of your camera, the 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 form we're seeing from Magnus Dilev is just pure, straightforward power, very efficient very uh, forward focused. But, you know, the power is very, very different as well from um, a male to female for sure. And, you know, you're looking at a more petite female rider compared to Magnus, who's definitely a little bit more taller. It's like, you know, that little more, as people would call me, the little giraffe. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, and they are going to look different, but in terms of their aero bar positioning, sort of like very, very similar. That's for sure. They're definitely very aerodynamic. I mean, definitely, I think Jocelyn needs to work a little bit more on where her head positioning is um, because I think that's why she's getting that little bit of tension through the shoulders and the neck and she's rolling around a little bit. But she tends to roll around through the hips a little bit more anyway and that's, you know, a little bit of core strength. But, you know, it's like she's effective. She's riding yeah, faster totally than effective. every everyone else. And, you know, we, we know that she's strong on the bike and we know she's definitely strong on the run. So, you know, she's just got to make sure that she still pays attention to her nutrition. Obviously, she's feeling good because she's riding faster than everyone else. Um, and then you look at Magnus, you know, he's making a big push right now. Obviously, he still feels great. Um, obviously, they had a race plan, and he seems to be doing exactly what he set out to be. You know, definitely he wanted to push it. He definitely is going for the victory. And, you know, the run is still the big question mark for him. But, you know, he is a talented guy, you know, and he's a young guy, and, you know, he knows 
what it feels like to push hard in a 70.3. And I think, especially in the half marathon, and I think that's what makes you a really good marathon runner for the Ironman, is you ha- to run fast, you have to still be able to run fast over that 70.3 half marathon. All great points as we come through another aid station here. You see all the discarded trash there appropriately uh, inside that transition zone. Uh, We always like to discuss and point out the rules. Also, uh, give a shout out and a big thanks to the volunteers that make these races possible because seeing them hand up gear, pick up gear, pick up trash, uh, that's just essential, and that's just one element of, of how these volunteers run these races and help our athletes get across the finish line. Uh, so, and, and many of those volunteers have helped get these athletes to the start line, so their friends and family and coaches and, and club, tri-club members and the like. So talking about volunteers, uh, we could spend a lot, a lot of time giving them a lot of love. In the meantime, let's just say this. We do have our friends on Facebook watching. You're going to want to start the second feed here momentarily. Um, not yet, but I want to give you a heads up. And in the meantime, uh, we are going to take a quick breather. So stay here, and you'll see more of Magnus Dietlieve and company. Whether it's on the road or in the pool, your activity has high demands. Rooted in sweat and grounded in science, we understand your unique fueling needs. That is why we created formulas just for you, endurance athletes, helping you replace what you're losing and keeping you fueled. And there's nowhere we'd rather be than with you along this journey, because together we are formulated for farther. From the creators of Gatorade, Gatorade Endurance, formulated for you, formulated for farther. We are here again with our leader in the men's race from Denmark in his first Ironman, Magnus Dietlieve. He is cranking it, and he dispatched second and third place a couple minutes ago with a nice effort to get away. Uh, there's the stats on paper. His average never less than 22.6, and that, sorry, 21.4, the lowest. But those averages are in sections facing decent headwinds, if not stiff ones. So the man is riding quite well. Uh, We talked earlier with Joe Skipper, looking back at his 2015 results. The 410 that he rode nearly gave him the win, but Mac Hansen ran away with it. So I looked up some results, courtesy of of Tri-Rating. So uh, thanks to that company. Thanks to uh, Torsten for for sharing. But just a, a look back. So, man, some fast times in some tough conditions uh, here in the Woodlands over the years. I expect the same today. No, exactly. And uh, one of Magnus's favorite sessions was a three hours continuous at Ironman race pace with some spikes. And then he would run 20K off the bike at race pace. So uh, uh, right yeah. now, that definitely work out. That three hours at uh, Ironman pace is definitely uh, panning out. But, you know, three hours to four hours is <laughs> a little Big bit jump. different. But, you know, that is a great workout if you can do some steady taste, long race pace efforts. That was one of my favorite things to do is just get out there, get in the aero bars and ride at that continuous pace that you want to achieve. So now we're going to tell everyone who's joined us and is with us on Facebook to please refresh. You're going to want to turn off because broadcast number one ends and broadcast number two starts. So please, Facebook friends, we want you to tune out and we'll be right back with you in a second. The rest of you can stay here. YouTube, don't do a thing. Just stay with us. Keep watching.
So as we said here, we're now talking to you guys about the guy in front, Magnus Dietlev. He is crushing it. First time on Ironman, but not first time at the front of a bike ride, uh, to be certain. I, I just was going to throw a little bit of uh, shade, as you say, these days at, uh, you know, three hours at Ironman pace. You know, Jocelyn McCauley is doing five hours at Ironman pace. So uh, just a little heads up. No, not really. It's the training methods. They're just amazing. So he's doing three hours at Ironman pace with some spikes and a long runoff, 20 Ks off. The prep is there. You know, we, we realize that these guys have super smart coaches. And have, but that also don't have included like the temperature expectated. Totally, totally. The, the wind, the humidity, the sun index. They were measuring lactate, core temperature, oxygen uptake, carbohydrate consumption. They were doing sweat rates with the sodium loss. So, you know, during that time, they were getting a lot of data to ensure his success over this 112 miles. So what you're saying is they've come a long way from jump on the scale, go out and flog yourself in the heat for six or seven hours, come back and jump on the scale again. That doesn't work anymore? No, it tells a story. <laughs> you know, it's just... There's I know. all sorts of ways to do it. I know you're having a little joke with it, and I agree. No, it's, it's like not yeah. everyone has no. the availability to do Correct. a lot of that. And, you know, if it was the only way to go, then we'd only ever have one champion. Correct. So yeah. what works for one person doesn't always work for the other person. So that's what I, I like about sport. You know, you, there's not one straight path that you take. Lots of people can take different paths to get to the, the same point. And I think that's what makes training and racing and getting coached so awesome because, you know, you get little insights from each race. You get little insights from each coach you ever work with. You get little insights from everything that happens. And Correct. I think, and that's one of the things that is so important to be successful at Ironman races is that opportunity to be flexible, because Correct. if you're not flexible, how are you ever going to be flexible in a race? So we'd just like to say welcome to all of our Facebook audience who's here on feed number two. Fa welcome back, Facebook friends. Uh, we appreciate you restarting and coming to us. If you're here for the first time, uh, welcome to you as well. This is, of course, the 2022 Memorial Hermann Ironman Texas, and we welcome you on all platforms today, Facebook, YouTube, and anyone that's uh, there live listening to just the audio. So great stuff. The two leaders on the screen right now are doing just what McKeeley explained. They're coming to the same point from a different path, and it is the beauty of our sport, the training methods, the racing methods, all so different, a million and one options. But right now, Jocelyn McCauley from USA is the front runner for the women, and on the other side, Magnus Dietlieb from Denmark is taking out all his um, competitors at the moment uh, as we approach four hours and 38 minutes here. Sorry, four hours and 38 minutes exactly for the men and 4.33 for the women. Still looking at quite a bit of racing left. The women, another four hours to go, probably. The men, probably another three plus. Uh, so we're chiseling in there, expecting a sub eight, uh, predicting a possibility, a strong possibility of a sub eight. And for those women, a nice sub nine. We'll get closer to predicting as we get closer uh, to the finish line because that makes us smarter. It makes us more accurate. No, and <laughs> I mean, the other thing we have to factor in, you know, how is that heat uh, and the humidity going to play into the later parts of the run? You know, we've got still li uh, quite a lot of cloud coverage right now. If that sun starts peeking out on the run, you know, that's going to make the temperature really increase. And then, you know, it's also that little bit of sunburn that you can get, even though, you know, you have applied your sunscreen, you can still have a little bit of a heat impact from that. So it is going to be interesting to see once they get on the run, even though we've still got quite a few miles left for the women, but the men are definitely getting closer to see because where Jocelyn is, there's definitely some blue clouds compared to where Magnus Ditlev is on the course right now. But they both look really, really strong. They look comfortable. Um, they sort of had very similar races, you know, were behind in the swim, work their way to the front of the race. Uh, one's a veteran, one's making their debut at Ironman. So there's always a question mark there, but a very talented athlete uh, and has done very, very well. Magnus Ditlev has done very well, very well in that 70.3 distance. 
And, you know, it's going to be nice to see him step up. It's always great to see athletes come across to the Ironman distance. And, you know, it's always interesting to see when athletes decide to step up. And, you know, when you have the ITU athletes who have been Olympians, normally you see a big change come through after each Olympic year. And then when you look at some of the 70.3 athletes, you know, not every athlete is suited to that Ironman <coughs> distance. So a lot of them who come from Olympic to 70, like ITU to uh, 70.3, they carry a lot of speed. And then that's a big step up from 70.3 to Ironman because or you still need a lot of speed for that 70.3. But then when you get to an Iron Man, it's definitely a different type of athlete. And definitely a talented athlete is going to do well no matter what. But definitely an Iron Man athlete is definitely very different to a 70.3 athlete sometimes. All well said here as we come back to the experience level of Mag Magnus D. Liv at the half distance at the 70.3. Uh, I can count at least 18 starts for him. He's got a handful of DNFs, but his record shows a lot of experience. 18, let's say, in the last three years, six a year. He's getting the distance. He's getting the, the test. So I think you're right. And now kind of moving to the longer course, a different skill set demanded. Uh, there you see a trash receptacle. There you see some cornhole, if you want to throw your trash in a cornhole hole. Is he allowed to say that, cornhole hole? Or is it just into a cornhole? Let's leave it as we come back to Jocelyn McCauley, pointing out what she wants, doing just what you should. There's water. I want it. There's Gatorade. Be very vocal and clear, and these volunteers will serve you uh, to your specs. Again, she's she's realizing, yep, I got to grab my Gatorade while I'm still drinking the water. I suspect she's going to fill the reservoir uh, or, yep, a little cool off. And this is a great tactic there uh, where you take the cold water that you've just sipped and you pour it all over the rest of yourself uh, clearly. I call that the hydration diamond. Uh, that's, <laughs> I, know, I know. Head, armpits, crutch. Yep, that's it. That's right. That's a diamond. Um, yeah. I'm going to walk away from that one for a second because I like your style. Here, Here's what we'll say, though. From the booth, I feel very comfortable. I can't tell that it's starting to feel hot there on the uh, road. You just saw it from her as she hit that hydration diamond. It is, it is warming up, so she's feeling the need to cool off. It is, I mean, this seems like an obvious statement, but I think it's worth uh, reflecting on when we're watching the race. If, if you... Uh, if you realize that that the realities start to set in, uh, you are starting to now think about a little bit, hey, there is a run, whereas we, we kind of preach this, don't we, McKeely, where you don't want to look too far ahead. Stay in the moment. You do what you can now. Uh, there, there's always that kind of focus on what you can control. But at some point, you have to start to think ahead a little bit. Where are you around other people? How much will you have to do? Who can run well? You start to assess that. And Jocelyn is going to start to get in that zone where she has to examine who she's up against. Yes, there's a lead, but you've got to prepare because the leads evaporate in a snap of the fingers if you're not ready. And, you know, one of the nice things about this course is the fact that there's out and backs. Yes. So she's actually going to have a really nice idea now on – where Lauren Brandon is, we know that she has fallen off the pace. She's probably over three minutes behind or more right now. And she'll see that Dee Dee hasn't really made up any time on her. She's still riding really, really strong. So in terms of where she's seeing the threat right now, I think she'd be pretty comfortable in the position. And she's racing smart. She took her time through the aid stations. Um, she made sure she got everything she needed to get. And, I mean, that's just smart racing. You know, you, it's staying in the moment. That's exactly what staying in the moment is, is knowing that it's still a long day. It's warming up. The run is going to be hot. She has experience on this course. She knows what she's going to face when she actually eventually gets on, on the run. And, like, even right now, you know, she's using a little bit of speed to rest as she comes down like a small little ascent. You know, and that's where that experience plays in. You know, when we talk about the men's race with Magnus Ditlev in the lead and attacking in the tailwind, is that something that later on he's going, going well, experience would have told me to do exactly what Joe Skipper said I should yeah. do? Yeah, yeah. 
great. I mean, it is when you're t when you're 23. There's only so much racing you can have, even if you got to elite level at 17. Uh, and so, new Ironman. Yeah, you're absolutely spot on there. And he has covered the 140.6. I dug up a little race uh, again that he had completed. Um, so there is experience there. Um, but look, back to Jocelyn McCauley. You're spot on. She's going to look across, and we'll do our best to do the same. But you can take a little split, just roughly, if you want to look at your watch and see that it says uh, three, four, you know, four, four thirty-eight. When I hit the turn, you can kind of count it out, and it gives you your own hard evidence of how far back second is and uh, and third, and and so on, because that does give you a little insight. You also have to keep your head up. This is a section. There was Didi going the other way. I saw that green kit. Um, so that that tells you tells her and indicates that gap, uh, but but in the end there's there's a fine balance as well for the pros uh, for everyone. But as we focus on this pro race, that fine balance between caring about what everyone else is doing and and really focusing on what you need to do. So it, it, you can't ever pretend. I, I always get a chuckle when someone says, oh, "I just completely do my own thing," and it's on paper that's a great idea, uh, but a these are professional athletes these are competitive individuals period uh they can't tune that out completely nor should they uh because if you if you if you need to get the the most out of yourself that requires sometimes backing off and speeding up so uh, all this stuff gets factored into the big picture and and becomes a line item on your budget right <laughs> so no, exactly and Jocelyn mccauley you know she's still got at least an hour and a half or more maybe an hour 45 because she's uh, expected to hit 92 miles at 11.32. So she's still got some time to ride, and it's still fairly early. But it's, t yeah, but it's, yeah, yeah, but it's 11, but it's 11.12 now. Ah, I was looking at our clock. That's why I may have got confused. So come in, you're correct. She's got a lot of time, but yeah. it, it, it's, I think as we look at it here, I always like to say, all right, we're deep into the thing. She's cro she's crossed the 74 mile here. That was the last split. She's through at that turn. So so 15 miles, you know, and we're talking two, oh, two yeah, and a half, so yeah. two, two and a half minutes per mile. Uh, she's 30 minutes it, within tw within 15, 20 minutes. She'll be there. But but nonetheless, on the left side of your screen, some excitement starting to build because we do have a return to the woodlands proper and we do have our Danish athlete coming in hot. His name, Magnus Dietlev. He's coming into these ponds, the trees that uh, characterize and populate this city. He is now in the thick of it. This also, funny enough, becomes one of your kind of best and worst nightmares. All those trees on the Woodlands Run Course, what it does for you is it gives you shade so the sun won't burn you up, but it gives you more humidity and less breeze. So that dense thicket of wooded uh, trail network that you'll run through it becomes very stagnant. So uh, fueling, hydration, and cooling become absolutely essential. As uh, as I take a look here, Dietlev, 1 minute 38 seconds at the 104-mile mark over Sam Laidlow and a minute 39 to Richard Varga. So this race, uh, Dietlev has really made a nice gap in that last segment, MJ. Big gap. Yeah, that's significant because it wasn't – very long ago that yeah. he actually made the move and yeah. to be able to put that much time in the tall wind section that's impressive it is impressive and and not unexpected because we know what he's capable of but nonetheless uh you know we're this is a sport that turns your expectations upside down at every chance it gets so uh fun stuff but we're expecting that he is going to be arriving at the next checkpoint here in approximately seven minutes, and that'll be 173 kilometers. The only reason I'm doing this is what I really want to know is how um, how fast he's going to ride the bike, because that ends up being my favorite thing for me. Um, so, wow, a six-minute gap, hey? So now Joss McCauley, six minutes in front of Lauren Brandon. That's notable, uh, and you can see that is going to refresh on your screen on that leaderboard here in a minute. Uh, but for now, we are uh, we're looking at the tracker. No, I mean, Jocelyn McCauley is doing a nice job setting herself up for at least some buffer zone going into the run. And you know, if we were going to see who those threats are in the top three, I mean, in reality, 
Lauren Brandon um, doesn't run as fast as her. Dee Dee doesn't run as fast as her. And then you've got Danielle, who's the unknown because she hasn't done an Ironman before. But if she can have 10 plus minutes in front of someone like Danielle, you know, she's just got to have her usual marathon and she could definitely walk away with this victory today. Absolutely. As but I, there's uh, a long way to go still. There's there's a long way to go. Those are those that should be the 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 phrase of the day. Um, as I come back here and I watch uh, Magnus Dietlieb navigate these uh, final turns, I won't say final because there's still a good bit of a room for him to get there. But it's we're cer we're certainly getting to the point um, where on his side, on Magnus Dietlieb's side, you've got to mind your. Uh, all your P's and Q's, to use a weird expression. I don't know why they say that. But you've got to start to say, all right, I'm in the closing stretch. When I get off the bike, all of the cooling effect from, the, from, the, from riding, the breeze that I feel now is going to go away. I'm going to be standing still in transition. I'm going to be jogging, and that sweat rate is going to jump up. What do I do for that sweat rate? I know he and his team have planned this, but what do you do for that sweat rate? Do I need to up the ante and take in a little bit more hydration over these closing 20 minutes? Do I need to take some electrolyte tablets? What is the protocol? For me, I'll grab a Martin. I'll have that. It's the nice blend of everything. It's a semi-solid. It's got the electrolytes. Probably some caffeine would come in handy. Um, so it, it, it becomes that point where you, you do – sort of future problem solve, right? This is coming my way. What will I need to do to be ready for it? No, I, I agree with all of that. You know, the later stages of the bike, caffeinate up. Um, definitely make sure your absorption is still going well because when you've been in the aero bars for so long, you know, you can get a little distended stomach because, you know, you're in that aero bar position and that fluid does settle in the in that flatter position so when you stand up you know digestive issues can be an issue you want to make sure you get your calories in your carbohydrates because this is going to fuel your marathon it's not like you can do it the other way where you can catch back up you know you're using a, a lot of calories right now and you want to make sure you can sustain that energy level that you need for the the bike and the other thing is it's like every opportunity you can to keep your core temperature down between now and the transition will help you feel better when you get off the bike. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens as we go through the closing stages for the men on the bike. And we will be back and let you know exactly how it all unfolds. See you then. And coming back to full screen here at the Memorial Hermann Ironman Texas, what you never want to see is a mechanical and a sidelined athlete uh, very frustrated as he was getting away and he worked so hard to get that minute and 40 second gap. Uh, but to me, this is again where we talked about is the race over? No, we need to look at the, the mentality that you approach this with and you need to get your gear out of the compartment and find a way to change that tire as quickly as you can. Every athlete that rides a bike has had a flat tire on that bike, I would venture to say, and, and really getting that done. Unfortunate, someone will be immediately saying, where's the tech support? Where's the neutral support? Why doesn't he have a wheel? Well, it's not as easy as that. It is a roaming support. Uh, the rules of Ironman 
be it pro racing or be it um, age group racing, is you must come prepared uh, for any mechanical. And so as we watch him take out uh, the take off that front wheel. He's going to do what he can to get a new tube in there and get set. Uh, again, composure and frustration, that's a, a, a strange bedfellow, but he needs to do it. Be, remain composed, wait and see. I started to mention, MJ, there is a mechanical sport. They're roaming, and they do have kind of what we call first come, first serve uh, rules. So if they come across you, they, they, they do their best to be around the fronts of the race. Uh, but if they're, if they're already serving someone else, uh, there's nothing we can do about it. So absolutely unfortunate. And I'm pulling for uh, Dietlev to get that, that tire change, that tube change, as quickly as he can to get back on the steed and uh, stay where he, he belongs. Well, you know, that's exciting stuff for us because we're like, we're cheering for him to, to get it done and fixed. But he definitely seemed like he wasn't prepared for something like that. That's for sure. And, you know, you can't always rely on the tech support. You definitely have to make sure you're prepared for it. And it'll be interesting to see he didn't look like he had tubeless. He looks like he was going to take his tube out. Mm -hmm. So he may be thinking after this race that he needs to go to tubeless. I mean, that can't always save you, but it'll definitely seal something up. And, you know, that's going to be so frustrating as an athlete. You know, you put so much time and energy. You're in the position that you want and something like that happens. But, you know, that's character building, right? How do you handle that situation? What do you decide to do? You know, it's like, look at a few years ago. We've had people who have been in that situation and then still walk away with the victory. So it'll be interesting to see mentally how he yeah. handles that, whether he gets support or gets it organized and what happens. And these guys are going to come up in a few more minutes and see what's happened. And they may have a little bit of, oh, I'm so sorry. Then it's like, oh, thank goodness we're back in the lead. Well, for, you have a little bit of both. I, I, I mean, very famously, I think in uh, 2008, I believe it was uh, Chrissy Wellington flatted on the on the way the way up to Javi in in Kona, and and Bet Keat, Australian Ironman champion, chucked her a, a CO2 and said, "Hey, help her out." She got that. Chuck, change. I haven't heard Chuck for a yeah, while. There you go. And you know what? It, it's it's again that sort of thing. She got it changed. She won the race. It, you're right. There's. A, that was great sportsmanship, and and B, that was great composure. Because if you realize that a couple minutes isn't the end of your day, it, it's extremely frustrating. And and obviously, best case scenario, there's a tech support that's that's sitting right behind him. But that's just not the reality, especially of a, con, a course uh, like this where we have multiple athletes. We have to keep tech support uh, in a position where it's very safe. So. Um, anyway, coming back to this, you're totally right. We're going to, we're going to see here in a minute if, if we haven't uh, missed it, where this young man uh, laid low comes through and spots that, uh, that deep is on the side of the road, changing a flat tire. And, and I don't know, I can look at this. We kind of, we kind of did a flat changing clinic two, two years ago, uh, three years ago, we were doing some of these, these live shows here and I get, and guess what? You can change a flat tire if you're crack a lacking in three minutes or less. I don't know, not with the new uh, disc brakes, and you have to like get the Allen key out. You can't take if you it practice. Off. I know it's yeah, not easy, it's, but yeah, yeah. It's, and depending how tight that seal is, you've got to unseal it. You know, it can be a little challenging. You know, technology is great, but it doesn't. It's not always efficient when something happens. It could take between three and 27 minutes. <laughs> no, it's horrible. I mean, I think this is another thing that I, I remember when I was coaching athletes, I would, I, would actually, uh, I would actually try and get them in a high-pressure situation in training where I'm screaming at them, trying to get them to change a flat under pressure because it's a different thing to change a flat. Well, under pressure and heart rate the, and yeah. the so, heat. Exactly. The heat all of a sudden is going to catch up with you because you're standing in that one spot. And, and it's, it really is just, it's something we don't prepare for. So usually when you change a flat, if you are in a training ride and, and you're just kind of chill or you're in your garage, if it's, if it's something you got to pump. So I think it's, and you know, if it was only a mile from transition, that's a different story. You just ride it in, but you know, he's still got quite a few miles left, not 112, but yeah. probably like 10 miles right now Oof. or under. It's like, you have to change it. Yeah. So looking now at uh, Sam Laidlow from France, he's up front 
and he is uh, still with company by the name of Richard Varga from Slovakia. These two rolling in, and we're uh, we're getting to the end of the bike ride for some of these professional men. The women still a tiny bit more time out there. Jocelyn McCauley will be the first one to hit that Hoka Run course and uh, have the tour of the woodlands. But in the meantime, folks, we're going to take one quick breather where I enable myself to change a flat tire. That thing John Moran has, that's a hyperbolt. That thing he uses to warm up and stay loose before he throws it down. That thing Tony Finau uses on course between shots. Ooh, that's money. That thing Robin and I use before and after we're on the bike so we can ride harder tomorrow. That thing Erlen Holland uses before smashing it into the back of the net. That thing that's for everyone. The hyperbolt from Hyper Ice. Give your body the daily relief it's been asking for. And there you see the likes of Jocelyn McCauley, American Ironman champion, three times over. She's rolling through the closing miles of this incredible bike ride here in the woodlands in Texas in this great race. So I tell you what, uh, she's not had a lot of company since she caught and left Lauren Brandon. She's been not solitary because she's overtaking a lot of uh, age group traffic. But she's been definitely a one-woman show for a long, long time. I think she's okay with that. Uh, three years ago, it was pretty exciting when, when she was in a head-to-head -head with, uh, with Daniela Reef. But this time, it's a different feel. Tell me this, from your perspective, how hard uh, is it, how difficult would you find it to be just out front racing, setting the tone on the run? No feedback. Where are they? Who is it? Am I alone? Am I good? Is it good, bad? What's the story there? My favorite saying is you can only control what you can control. So if you're not getting the feedback, you just got to race within what you feel you need to do. Okay. I mean, it's tricky sometimes because it is nice to get feedback. Yeah. But then sometimes you're in that moment. You're like, it's not like I can go any faster. Who cares, right? It's this not is, like. This is where I'm at. So it's like, it's a give and take, you know, in a short race, it's like you got a chance to like maybe pick up a little bit in this long race. You sort of get settled in a speed. Yeah. And a pace. Sure. So it's very hard to get out of that. But, you know, it's also motivating on the course to go, oh, you know what? I am actually gaining. And, you know, yeah. if you go through a bad spot, well, how much time did I lose? And there are a couple of opportunities on the run course to see that. On the bike course, there were because you've got the out and backs, the out and backs, and the out and backs. So I think when you're, for me, if you're out in front, I love that. Yeah. Because Good. then it's up to everyone else to get, get to yeah. you. Yeah. But then it's also sometimes it's nice to, to play that little game that you've <laughs> got to be behind and you've got an opportunity to catch up. Like mentally, that's sometimes a little bit easier. But I think it really depends on the type of athlete you are and what you're used to dealing with and how strong you're feeling on the day. Good stuff. Good answer. And, and let's say Sam Laidlow is going to have that feeling here in a minute. He does have the company of Richard Varga. So these two athletes are going to be in transition um, together. They're going to be uh, getting their run shoes on together. They're going to have uh, the chance to start three laps around the woodlands together. Uh, neither of them has experience in that area, so they're both going to be in there tackling it uh, kind of rookies rookies in tandem but it's the closing miles folks are starting to get excited on the sidelines i'll tell you that right now the woodlands is triathlon crazy and they're iron man wild they get out here and they see that first place finisher what an exciting time and they get to scream for them and cheer for them and the same when the women come through at the moment um I'm going to say this. We have a lot of information that we're going to glean when transition comes. We're going to find out where's Ben Hoffman, where's Jesper Svensson, and another big mover. Look, his name, Ty Butterfield. He's been referenced by us and by Joe Skipper. The last time I looked at the time check, he was moving up into fifth or fourth, depending on where Hoffman is. But that is a dynamic race from some excellent runners that are proven. So they know we know they can run 240 or below. So keep an eye on that part of the race. And here's something also to think about um, 
when you have somebody coming from an ITU background and they're stepping up to an Ironman, it's like sometimes those first few miles, you're like, oh, yeah, I'm feeling great. And, you know, you're running way faster than, than you should. So it'll be interesting to see how Richard Vargas does when he steps off the bike. And if, you know, you've got to switch off that, I've got to go out as hard as I can to like getting your legs back and shortening yeah. your stride. And then you've got somebody else who's completely different that, you know, he's probably got a little more experience in some endurance, but then the Iron Man is so unknown. So it's like... It's going to be really fun and exciting to see how these two, is it going to be a side by side? Is someone going to get advantage as you come out of transition? Um, <laughs> you know, all those sort of things will play in how that first part of the run goes. All the games within the game and uh, the races within the race. Uh, these guys starting to figure it out. Richard Varga doing a few things to sort himself out. The guy's got a rich history at the short course. A lot of great exploits in his past. A lot of great results. And uh, this is going to be fun to watch him transition to 26.2 miles or 42.2 kilometers on the Hoka Run course out here in the streets of the Woodlands. And I'm starting to see what we call Texas blue skies. Uh, you're you're still partly cloudy, but you're, you're definitely getting a lot of sunshine. You can see uh, the shadows and you can see that it is starting to... Uh, make it real out there and uh I, I know anyone that's ever trained raced or lived in texas understands uh that the uh that the weather is the boss and so you got to play the game uh, but coming in here at the end go for it what i can tell you is our leader up until he had an issue with his tire you know was a minute and a half in front now he's dropped over to over seven minutes behind so that's how significant an impact like that can be if you get a puncher or a flat tire on the course. These guys look like they're about to prepare to transition as Richard Vargas is taking off his shoes in order to get ready to transition. And, you know, that's definitely ITU coming in right now, that ITU background, you know, get those shoes off as quick as you can so you can have a speedy transition. That's right. And both men sailing past that final penalty box, a good indicator here that nobody was uh, – Dinged for Brett for drafting. I'm also getting a chance to realize that those were not socks. They're calf sleeves that Varga has on. Uh, the difference being that he's got compression on the calves and has done since the outset. He'll put some proper running socks on uh, here in transition. Stopping the clock, these two men in transition together. And guess what? We're going to be able to have a quick peek at their times and see that they rode 417 and 416. Uh, laid low at 417. Varga at 416, great times. Course records, they are not, but they're super fast. A total running time of five hours and seven minutes for athlete number one. And athlete number two, uh, as they roll through here to the screams and the adoration of the Woodlands Ironman spectators. I don't know if you saw that, but Sam Laidlow did lose something out of his pocket as he was coming through that shoot. So I don't know if that was a nutrition, but... You know, most people are going to pick up extra nutrition now as they come into T2. But I thought that was like something that we should mention that he obviously dropped something and his, he was going through the shoot. We hadn't talked about him in a while, but Matt Russell, uh, uh, sorry, Cody Beals and Matt Russell. So Matt, so Cody Beals a little bit further back than we were hoping to see him uh, from a competitive standpoint. He's still within the mix, uh, but looking at him down the road a bit. Um, and then also Matt Russell, who's raced Pretty much every Ironman Texas, if not every one, uh, watch out for him because he's really ferocious on the run, has had some health and uh, wellness struggles. But when he's on form, he's he's just a bear on that marathon. And then and then Butterfield, we got to just bring him up again as we see him uh, really making some late game moves. And then we'll be excited to see Ben Hoffman, the American, attach a timing chip in transition in the tent. Uh, which will indicate to us that he is, uh, you know, well, indicate to us where he's where he stands, where his placement is. So fun stuff. A little orientation from above, uh, McKeeley. You can see, looking down, all those red bags uh, there on the left bottom part of your screen, folks that haven't raced an Ironman. Those are the run bags. It's got all the gear you need for the run. It's got your socks, your shoes, visor, uh, hat, glasses, whatever it is, including a bottle, perhaps, and some gel. 
uh, whatever you want to take with you on the go. Most likely you're going to see a lot of Gatorade bottles and some Morton gels stuffed in there. And when you pull that out, you have everything for the run. You go into the tent and you, and you change, you grab your stuff and you leave the bag. Uh, logistically speaking, it's, it's a way they collect your cycling gear for later and also keep track of you. So we know you came in. Nonetheless, that's quick work for transition number two. And we've got uh, a nice look from overhead of uh, Sam Laidlow. You got you to gotta know him by the black socks. That's, that's him there out onto the run. But, you know, that's just showing you how significant the transition ha- can be because we had two guys go in together. Obviously, Sam Laidlow had a much faster transition than Richard Vargas. And when you go into that transition, you know, there's a couple of things that you, you want to do. It's like you want to make sure that, you know, you're not going to get any friction issues. So possibly you're going to, like, lube up a little bit. You can definitely try to get sunscreen reapplied. Usually they have helpers inside the transition. You know, grab any nutrition. Also get your hydration started straight away. Usually they do supply hydration during that time as well. And we always like to take a look at this. The fastest transition times brought to you by Morton. We're going to get one more up there as soon as the third place guy catches up. But so far, Sam Laidlow winning the battle uh, for the Morton fastest transition. 227, that is quick. You can spend a bit of time in there. And uh, forgive me if you brought up the word lube and I didn't make a joke about (laughs) it. Uh, Now we're moving on. It's almost too late. Uh, Body glide. Body glide. I correct it. Body glide, (laughs) which is lube. Any t- any chance I get to talk about lube? Look at the canal there on the left, and look at this track. So we get a lot of, and I'm going to be a broken record here when I continue to praise the fans and the people out here. As this day goes on, if you're an age group athlete finishing in 17 hours, or if you're uh, the fastest pro cranking it out in half the time, um, you're going to get some great support. These this this. This includes just folks that travel in, that caravan van in, uh, tri clubs, our, our Ironman tri club program, supporting, of course, uh, some of these great triathlon clubs around the state of Texas. But it, it really is a special venue, and because it's three loops, you're never too far from a yell. You're never too far from some support, and you do have these advantageous outs and backs. That's proper, um, where you get to do turnarounds and you get to go uh, see your competition, see see your family, see your supporters, see your coach, uh, get all that interaction, which most people will tell you they like. Some people, they really want to go out into the into the um, desert and, and have no, no one talk to them on a, on a marathon, but most of us like a little support. No, and it was interesting as they both went around that – U-turn, you know, these little out and back sections give us a chance to see where everyone is, but it also gives the athletes. And you saw how significant that faster transition by Sam Laidlow was. You know, that's hard to make up because if you lose 20 seconds, you've got to be running at least 20 seconds faster per mile to catch up in a mile. Yeah. So, you know, over 26.2 miles, that may not be significant, but then you're sort of going to lose that rubber band effect. Yes. That they get too far away that you can't use that energy to your advantage. And that's why, you know, that smooth, quick transition is super, super important. Wait a and second. Yeah, is- that's not good. That's they, they, Technically, they should make him turn around and come back and run around those cones. Because he, I'm sort of speechless on that one. I yeah. thought he was running to a bathroom, uh, but he definitely had a... A bit of a cut across that section of uh, of the run course. I thought for sure there was a. Uh, I didn't see that properly. I was, uh, caught off guard. Don't know what to say, and that rarely happens. So, uh, coming back to it and to orient everyone, this part of the course down on the path, it's just out of transition. A quick out and back uh, on this Hoka run course, and then you shoot out and you go onto the road. Once you're onto that main road you do weave in and out of some bike paths. So you get into some dense wooded uh, sections that have bike path, but a proper multi-use bike path. And you'll kind of bounce back and forth into that, onto that, into the road, um, and you do that loop. But this little section down on uh, the canal path here, you'll kind of come in and out. Speaking of triathlon camouflage, that is not it. That's a great looking, another great looking kit, very bright. Uh, I could see myself wearing that in, in a bike ride. Unfortunately, it looks like we got an athlete dropping out. 
of the bike, which which does happen. Injuries and ailments do sometimes sideline us, but uh, live to fight another day is the motto, and and he'll be back. So um, so there you go. Yeah, it's always tough when the day doesn't go according to plan, but you know that's part of racing for everyone. Doesn't mean matter if you're a professional athlete or you're an age grouper. You know, sometimes it's just not your day. And, you know, sometimes you go into a race and, you know, you know not, you're not going to run because, you know, you have a in little injury, but you still want to use the race as fitness. And, you know, it is it is a great way to get s some fitness as we see a couple more athletes coming in to transition in the men's race. There's Dietlib and there's yeah. Hoffman. So, uh, we yeah, we're back on board here. There's Ben Hoffman, and you can see no chip on his ankle. And so Mar Magnus Dietlieb and, and Jesper Svensson in, that's Dietlieb right there with uh, Hoffman behind him. Remember, Hoffman will get a chip, so he's not registering, but you can factor he's right there. So 514, but six minutes down uh, because that closing time, just, just doing the math, um, six minutes is notable. Lost all that time, shame for Dietlieb. Here's the thing, you can see in his face the dejection and this is where I would say he needs an infusion of positivity. It is not over. He can still get in and fight his way. He's still planning for a great marathon. Well, um, yeah. And, you know, it's like seven and a half minutes, just under seven and a half minutes. And that's still a podium right now. Yeah. And if Correct. your two runners in front struggle on the marathon, that seven and a half minutes can quickly turn into an opportunity to win this race. Correct. It, and it, that's yeah. the thing about Ironman racing is like, you know, never give up. Always know that you know you you never know when somebody's going to go through those yeah. roller coaster sections. Yeah, and you, you're right. You just got to mentally decide: am I in this or am I completely out? So it'll be interesting to see if he actually still gets out there and runs, or he decides to call it quits because he's still got a chance to podium right now. Ch that's right, and and a lot of athletes. And how about Ben Hoffman? Uh, correct. You, you've got like, Ben Hoffman, who's great been, position. Who's been in great position. He's one of the best marathoners in the sport. Uh, he's just so strong. So you've you've got him in the mix, and and watch out uh, because he's got the pedigree and and the results that these other guys don't have yet. But I'll say this: a lot of athletes, McKeeley, I feel like they say to themselves, "Okay, if I'm in fourth place." there's good odds that one of the three in front of me will drop out. Like, that actually happens. I, I sort of run those numbers. If I'm in the top ten, two are going to drop out. One is going to blow up. Boom, that takes care of those three. And I think that in the pro ranks, these are real numbers. Uh, is it precise uh, statistics? No. But you can always count on blow-ups, boom, also dropouts, kabam. So uh, look at that. And well, perfect it, example is the bike. Look what happened to our correct. race leader, Magnus Ditliv. You know, he had a commanding lead, and now he's like seven and a half minutes back because he had a mechanical. Yes, that's right. So uh, collecting and, and re, uh, regrouping, let's look at some of these. Andreas Jung from, uh, from way back came off in fifth place. Milan Bronze has also come off Belgian. Tyler Butterfield lost a step, but he's still in the top eight uh, coming off the bike. And remember that we have so much excitement this spring, and we're only just at the tip of it. Uh, Ironman coverage all the time, and a big, big race that's coming up here uh, in three weeks' time. Some of these athletes racing, including Ben Hoffman. He's doing the double. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about the Ironman World Championship in the spirit of George. the land Check that it out. Iron Man rushes across the Pacific to meet the spirit of the West in the golden glow of a new sunrise. It is Kumakahi, a new beginning. What started in the west coast of Kona whispers across the sea, echoing through the windswept canyons of Greater Zion. This rugged terrain was wrought from ancient seas and molten lava. Persisting forces carved aspirational vistas where gods and goddesses were said to land. We welcome you to a legendary experience that is different, yet the same. Shine your light in the land of endurance. And here we are with our first place runner on the Hoka Run course doing three laps. He's on lap one of those three. 
His name's Sam Laidlow, 23 years old from France, and the guy is cranking it. And why not? What a great venue to put uh, the pedal to the metal and see what you're capable of. I, I, uh, I'm impressed so far, and I'm enjoying what I'm seeing. So what a promo. That was so fun to look at. I'm excited to watch this first ever Ironman World Championship outside of Kona. It's coming up here in three weeks' time. We'll be calling that race. But we have the great, great pleasure uh, to interview uh, Jeff Robbins, a wonderful partner from the Utah Sports Commission. Jeff, uh, at home in St. George, I presume. Thank you so much for joining us. How are you, my friend? You know, doing good. How are you guys? You know, we're doing great. We're sitting here watching a race. We're not sweating at all. We're not <laughs> tired. I have zero cramping. Uh, probably not unlike, you know, how you sit. <laughs> you know, that's unfair, guys. I think uh, you get to watch those guys sweat and, and really compete hard out there. And you guys probably have some kind of a soft drink or something else there just kind of watching, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. We are hydrating and carbohydrate loading. That's for sure. <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what, what you're carbohydrate loading with but maybe we shouldn't talk about that huh? <laughs> well i tell you what and as you're here we're just a couple weeks away from this uh 2021 intermountain healthcare ironman world championship that takes place in 2022 it throws people off but this is presented by the utah sports commission which is a fantastic partner of ironman and we're going to spend a few minutes just talking about what you guys do and and why we've joined up um with um you know, with these partners. So uh, let's talk about that, if you don't mind, and, and just how this was created as a catalyst for Utah and its Olympic legacy and all that stuff. We, we just want to we want to get in and talk to you about that and share some of your thoughts. Yeah, ab absolutely. Obviously, we're really excited having the World Championships come. Uh, it's a great location. You know, they'll call it the land of enchantment and endurance oftentimes. And it's a, it's, a, it's a beauty that kind of takes you in with red rock and all sorts of neat topography that is really unique to that southwestern Utah part of our state. And, um, but then the endurance comes in. I mean, the indigenous people, the dinosaurs roamed that area years and years and years ago. And, uh, well, the beauty kind of pulls you in and the uniqueness. Uh, the endurance comes in when you have to, have to compete on the course, right? Uh, and, it, and it will be a great challenge for the athletes coming and all those participating. And then those that are visiting uh, will see some of the most unique uh, landscape and beauty they've probably ever, ever seen. So I think, uh, I think they're in for a treat and we're in for a treat as well. No, it's actually one of the most stunning landscapes that I think we have in the world. And I think the athletes who have never been to St. George are really, really going to appreciate it. Um, I do actually have a question for you. Um, so we wanted to also ask you what it means for the Ironman athletes to be racing May 7 as a local community, what that means to you to have all these world championship athletes come in and race St. George. Well, we're, we're, we're really thrilled to have them. We, we welcomed the world in 2002 when we hosted the Olympic winter games back then, uh, we're America's choice right now to host another games. We're hoping 2030 or 2034. Uh, I'm on that, uh, that committee working on that. So we, we feel like we have tremendous hospitality and we also love tough competition. I played professional sports as well. And no, if you go to a location that is, is somewhere you like to compete in that has some beauty, that has some things that surround you that might be unique and make the journey of competition a little easier, um, sometimes that's helpful. So I think the, the athletes that are coming, the visitors that are coming will enjoy the area. The athletes will have a very, very tough course to race. There's no question. And uh, as we talked about the land of endurance, I think they will certainly experience that along with the beauty. Well said, well said. And, and, and here, here, you know, here's a great question for you. And, and coming as the CEO and uh, president of uh, the Utah Sports Commission, you get to see everything. I mean, you referenced the Olympics. Uh, you, you know, you've got the World Championship of Ironman coming there. Talk to us a little bit about uh, what you guys are doing with the Sports Commission and how it's a great partnership with, with our sport. Well, we have, um, we've hosted about 1,000 events since the Olympics, so a little over 20 years. Uh, Tony Hawk was with us last week. We've been hosting events with Tony Hawk. We just announced the... Uh, World Cup USA Women's Soccer game coming, NBA All-Star Games next year. 
the day that we have um, Ironman World Championships is also the day that the Supercross World Championships will be here. Uh, and then we have USA Climbing World Cups coming a couple weeks after that. So in a given year, we're involved with maybe, you know, 50, 50 events plus. Um, and the interesting thing, while people know us for our, our snow and our skiing, obviously the winter games, um, about 70% of what we've done since the Olympics is, is not winter. Um, and we have a tagline that says Utah, the state of sport. And that's because we have so much diversity in our sports. Uh, that we bring in and, and we've generated about three billion dollars to the economy with maybe a billion and a half dollars in media value from the events we've hosted over the last 20 years that's fantastic i i mean i couldn't agree more that every time i go to utah i'm, I'm wowed because there's just also so many different amazing corners of the state uh so share with us with if you would just again how how special the community of saint george is and and what some athletes around the world have to look forward to and then we'll let you go sure i i think they're looking forward to uh hosting obviously the top athletes in the world the community is terrific uh they have the world senior games there largest senior games in the world. I think they had about 48 countries last time. Uh, they love hosting people. Again, I think you'll see an organic, kind of an authentic community that uh, that will welcome them with their arms open. And again, I think you're going to find a terrific course to compete on. Um, so we're, we're excited. I can speak on behalf of the city and the, the governor and I were together last week. Um, and uh, we're just excited about welcoming you guys and all of the athletes to our, to our state. Oh, that's awesome. Well, thank you so much. It, fantastic getting to chat with you. And I can't wait uh, here uh, for a couple weeks down the road when we get to see you guys again and your beautiful state is on showcase. So Jeff Robbins, uh, President and CEO of the Utah Sports Commission, thank you for your time. And we appreciate everything you're doing for, for all of us. Thanks, you guys. All right, let's get back to the men's action and lots of stuff happening out on the men's marathon right now. Uh, Sam Laidlow is in the lead, but not far behind. Richard Vargas has actually made up a few seconds. He had a slower transition coming out of T2. Um, and just like the bike, he has his eyes set right on the back of him. So it'll be interesting to see if Richard actually moves up any closer and these two athletes start running side by side, but they are running very, very similar paces right now. There's only like one or two seconds per mile in it right now. But, you know, Sam is a front runner. We saw that on the bike. He was never afraid to get up front and set his pace, and that's exactly what he's doing right now. You got it. And what a shot there with the background. Wood, uh, Lake Woodland's in the background, and you've got these bike paths, these support crew and of course one of the most important things in ironman racing the porta potties anyway into an aid station grabbing some gatorade water over top of the head grab a martin gel and tell us you'll be back because we will in about five seconds actually in about 35 seconds have a quick break we'll see you in a minute And here we are looking at the leader. He's been out front a lot. You can see uh, this is uh, Sam Laidlow right behind him, though. That is uh, Richard Varga, second place. First and second on the road. First and second uh, on the bike they were as well. Uh, a lot of company. I'm not sure they're best friends, but they're getting to know each other pretty well. And let's have a little look back to see who is actually chasing them down. 
you actually have Ben Hoffman who got off the bike in a third place, but it was a very close competition with Magnus Ditliv who had that puncher at the end of the bike, but came into transition with Ben Hoffman. And then we also have Jesper Stemson who uh, was right there. So we have two athletes in the lead. And then we have Hoffman, Ditliv and Stempson trailing for third, fourth and fifth. So right now it looks like it could be a battle between Sam and Richard, but don't count out Ben, Magnus or Jesper to uh, start encroaching on the podium and possibly a victory. Possibly a victory. It's all possibility now, and that's the beautiful thing about this sport. Anything is possible, but also so many possibilities. This is that part I told you about where it is shaded, uh, but I tell you what, shaded and a little bit stagnant, a little bit humid, uh, a little bit tricky in there uh, where you just where you wonder if you're getting any breeze at all sometimes. And I, if it sounds like I'm speaking from past actual experience, <laughs> Perhaps I've been in those woods before, uh, but no, it's it's a tough race. And and this is I said also there's spectators everywhere. Look, you're in the dense thicket, and there were some people there set up. You're you're sort of isolated for 25 seconds, and then boom, there's a sign that says something motivational. Uh, there's just a lot of great support. I, I really, as much as we uh, kind of have great venues the world over, I continue to see at this Woodlands venue, really just a draw. Maybe it's because there's so many triathletes and Ironman athletes in Texas, but people just flock in to watch it. They spend their Saturday there, they get motivated, uh, they hang out, and then they and then they go back and you know do their long run tomorrow. So it's a pretty cool and pretty special venue. Uh, really happy to be here again, and ha especially after the layoff. Uh, but exciting. So, gosh, what, who, I, I dare you to bet who the winner will be right now. It's too early. <laughs> Are you putting are, are you putting oh, it out there for me, making sure. me like pick a favorite right now? I mean, if I was gonna pick just based on how fast someone has run, if I was just gonna solely base it on that, it's like it's hard because Sam and Richard haven't run a marathon. Yeah. But they are very, very talented athletes. So if I go back to Hoffman Ditliv. Mm -hmm. And Jesper, the same thing happens with Magnus. He hasn't run a marathon. Yeah. And then Jesper and Ben have run fast marathons. Mm -hmm. So if Sam and Richard mess it up yeah. some way, I mean, Magnus and Magnus could be the rookie. <laughs> you don't and, know. And You've given me nothing. I'm giving you nothing. But I also <laughs> am saying that if any of our rookies fail – I'm going to pick Ben. Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to I was going to give it to you. I'm going to say it's Var, it's it's Varga or Hoffman, but I'm going with Hoffman because seven minutes. The, the only question that I would doubt that is that Hoffman is also going to get to that point where he knows what it costs to run a 240. He knows what the – and what I mean by that is he does have the world championship here in, in, um, in three sh short weeks. So – is he gonna want, or is it two, <laughs> two weeks? He, is he gonna? Is he? Gonna, sorry about that. Is he going to want to crush and drain the tank uh, for a he, victory? For a victory? Yeah, he will. But yeah. for you know, so so let's look at that. I, but I'm going Hoffman Varga, and then uh, and everyone around the world's yelling at me now because you're fans of someone else. But that's why I'm here uh, to get yelled at. So it, let's talk about what we just saw. How's this? I'm just gonna go for a rookie. You're going for who? Any rookie? Rookie. There's any, three. Any, there's three yeah. rookies. So I got a good chance. Yeah, it's in that. good. Good job. I'm taking Hoffman. Here's the story. <laughs> We've got uh, hydration station. They just ran through, and you saw them pouring the water on. You saw them taking the Gatorade, and and if you're clever, uh, you got quick eyes. You saw them pick up a, a Martin gel. The cool thing about this is that you have your choice. Every mile or less, you'll get that. Uh, we're wrapping here along. I recognize this bridge. You're going to be on this bridge for a split second. Pop out onto the road do a lengthy section of road before popping back on that bike course. Uh, all this comes to say there are points uh, along this course where where you're exposed in the sunshine, and this is one of them. And I'm thinking that exposure and that heat index is uh, creeping up there just mm -hmm. by the way that these two athletes look. And I sort of like the strategy of Richard Vargas. At no point in this race has he tried to dominate, in, except for the swim, of course, but on the bike, he, he was very relaxed, very comfortable, just did what he had to do. 
And then on the run, he had a much slower transition. But look at what's happening right now. He just had the Morton pass and he overtook Sam Laidlow. Is it going to be a significant pass? I mean, these guys have been running one or two seconds within each other. So it'll be interesting to see if Richard is going to make a significant move and maybe increase his pace a little bit. But these two guys have been racing pretty much side by side all day. All day. All day, exactly. And I'll say this, when they did that, uh, check out our cameraman. That's good fitness right there. Uh, running along, capturing some footage. Uh, it, it almost looked like that was... Uh, anyway, so as we come back to this, there was an exchange that you don't often see. Uh, Varga rolled up on the shoulder of Laidlow, said, hey, good job, let's do this, good job on the bike, put his hand out for a quick shake, and they had a couple chuckles, and now they're on back to business. Here's what I do know about this uh, sport is that no pass is forever. So when you may feel as high as a kite three miles in, you may be as low as a, a dirty ditch water here in a couple of miles. And let's just say time will could change these two guys' expression, position, and all of the above. We're going to take a quick breather, but we'll be here in just a second to continue with this amazing Hoka Run course. That's a hyperbowl. That thing he uses to warm up and stay loose before he throws it down. That thing Tony Finau uses on course between shots. Ooh, that's money. That thing Robin and I use before and after we're on the bike so we can ride harder tomorrow. That thing Erlen Holland uses before smashing it into the back of the net. That thing that's for everyone. The hyperbowl from Hyper Ice. Give your body the daily relief it's been asking for. Back on course on the three-lap Hoka run course. Richard Varga from Slovakia out front. He's got a small gap over the Frenchman, Sam Laidlow. Two lead bikers behind. You might ask, why are the lead bikers behind? Well, that's protocol. Uh, we have decided in the rulemaking of Ironman that, to be fair to other athletes, they can't have that, that bike up front or next to them. Uh, they do go up front if they need to clear the way. But the idea is that they indicate they're coming. They kind of keep a, uh, keep track of them. They will pop up in front occasionally, MJ. But, man, what a fantastic course. What a beautiful little spot of residences along here. Uh, you're out into the thick of it. Uh, some, uh, <laughs> some tough racing is afoot. And we're still very early, to be honest, extremely early on the marathon. You know what I'm most excited about? Tell me. A rookie is still leading. <laughs> <laughs> Took that bet. <laughs> no, and, I mean, he's. Richard looks very, very comfortable. He looks great. He, he looks, you know, and he's come prepared for the heat. He has the ice band across his head. He has the ice towel around his neck. So he's know, got he's, it all. Yeah, he's come prepared. And you can see him as he hits that Morton shell. The cool thing about these, it's a lot. It's a larger packet. Give this a shot if you haven't yet, but it, it's easy to carry along. Follow it perfectly with some water. Uh, right after that, as execution, not of a rookie. That was execution of someone that knows a plan and is sticking to it. Uh, people kind of say, all right, well, how important is it? It's extremely important. You overfuel, you're in trouble. You underfuel, you're in trouble. You fuel just appropriately, boom, you, you don't even think it's a deal. Hey, no problem, you know, but let me tell you, the, the margin for – uh, for error is not wide. It does it, it does get pretty tight. Am I right? And, you know, not only that, but Sam Laidlow, like, was smart, right? He didn't use any extra energy to catch back up, although he's starting to fade again a little bit. But that's tactics. He came, he came in to the aid station, got what he needed. Richard slowed down a little bit. He got back up. And now Richard is sort of getting that little bit quicker stride and is just putting a tiny little bit of hurt on Sam Laidlow right now. He is. Just a little gap opening up. 
Um, and, and again, these gaps, it, it is sort of like the bike where there's an elastic band that you don't want to snap. So it never feels good to have someone run away from you. And it is empowering to run away from someone. So that does, it can expand out that gap. But I'm not seeing that just yet. I feel like I feel like they were 17 seconds apart out of transition and Laidlow got away and then Varga came back and then Varga got in front and he hasn't gone away. I think these guys have a good handful of miles at the minimum together uh, before sort of differences start to be exposed. Uh, I'm super anxious to see as well how how fast and, and how what kind of paces we're seeing from the other athletes once we hit those early splits. Uh, but in the meantime, yeah, just watching these two athletes roll. And uh, I do, I will say that Varga looks extremely efficient and light on his feet, which, which works really well for me in a, in a hot and humid environment. No, definitely the posture of Richard Varga right now. You know, he looks very relaxed. He looks comfortable. You know, Sam Laidlow has admitted that, you know, he was injured over the winter. Um, so we will see if that's going to have an impact on the marathon right now. I mean, it obviously didn't for the swim and the bike, but, you know, it's it's a marathon. And if you are missing a little bit of fitness, it will definitely start to hurt. But what I do like about Sam right now is, you know, that little fatigue that you felt coming off the bike, sometimes that's a telltale system of how your run's going to be. Yeah. And both these guys have settled into a rhythm. They're feeding off each other. We've had a lead change that Richard Varga has taken over. I mean, we did see Sam Laidlow doing a lot of work on the bike, but he seems to be a little bit comfortable just staying those few steps behind. But, you know, if you were going to be a little more critical, definitely right now Richard Vargas looks the better of the two. But they're slightly different in how they're stepping out as well. Like definitely Richard Vargas is that little bit tauner and leaner through the femur and sort of like sits out a little bit more in front of the foot where you got Sam Lowe that sort of like if you look from his um, hip angle to his knee and the way he his foot lands, it's a little bit more underneath yourself where Richard Varga, his knee is a little bit more forward. So if I was going to say which one is better for Ironman, it's basically either one. It's what works best for your body type. I'm looking at splits here, and uh, Ben Hoffman is a big mover. He's running uh, 611 uh, pace per mile versus 619 and 626 for these two fellas. He's making time. He's closing the gap. He's still 642 down, and this is at the 3.7 mile mark. Dietlev has lost a bit of time uh, to Hoffman, is in fourth, has lost some time. And then Jesper Svensson uh, also losing time. All five of those top five men running, running quick, all under 634 pace as an average. Well, you know, you're looking at Ben Hoffman, who's run like a 236. He, he, you know, yeah, yeah, it's absolutely. like that's got to give him some confidence that, you know, he is the fastest runner in the field. And, you know, that's what we're seeing right now is, you know, the early stages of the marathon. Ben Hoffman is definitely the one to watch. But it's not like significant. It's only like 10 to 15 seconds per mile quicker. But you add that up yeah. over 26 miles. Totally. And you can get like a minute back 100%. every six miles. So to get e easy. six and a yeah. half minutes back, yeah. you know, we could easily do the math. 15 and, yeah, seconds per it's, mile. It's nothing. Yeah, it's, it's nothing. possible. Yeah. It's really possible. Six, you know? Yeah, six and a half minutes. in. And in if it goes out to 20, then yeah. like every three minutes you're catching up a minute. Yeah. It's yeah, absolutely the, these these gaps are are are, are nominal um, at this point still. Now look at that through the aid station and through that section we had a little lead change again. And it, what I like about this is laid low. He's not laying low. He's saying, you know what? I am still a fighter here. And if you thought you took me, I'm still I'm going to go back in front. And and it is a little bit of cat and mouse. It's it, from my viewpoint, these are subtle mind games in the big picture because it's still so early. Uh, to really matter. None of this will matter um, until later on in the, like have material effect anyway, until later on in the in, in this Hoka run course. Uh, but coming back again to some of these splits and talking about Ben Hoffman, we haven't seen 
Butterfield's first time. Here, just this is something that's staggering. Ben Hoffman ran that 236 last fall at Ironman Florida, and he got second place. It was a crazy good run, and he ran it off a great bike, and it was it was unreal. He he, um, and I, I mentioned that that it only got second because he is, as you mentioned, prepared to dig it and throw it down on the line and come away either with the win. Like he he rolls big dice, and that's what he did, and we'll see him do that again. Well, you know, with that thought, Ben Hoffman actually got into triathlon through a team. A team, club team, team at a stampede. university. <laughs> so let's a little talk a little bit about the Tri Club. You know, since its debut in 1970s, the sport of triathlon has been supported by a passionate community, and it's co- it's a core network of tri clubs around the globe. I bri- I actually belong to several tri clubs. Um, the Ironman Tri Club program was created to support this strong community with a mission of ensuring athletes never race alone. This year's North America Tri Club Championships will feature six races throughout the year, kicking off with the Southeast Championships in a few weeks at the Visit Panama City Beach Ironman 70.3 Gulf Coast. This series promises a unique experience for our Tri Club athletes and it's a perfect excuse to plan a club event. Learn more at ironman.com slash tri clubs. There you go. You said it. Yeah, Team team Stampede up in Missoula, Montana at the University of Montana. That was Ben Hoffman, Lindsey Corbin, Matt Seeley. I think about all these guys that came out of that group, a, a whole host of others. And as we talk about that tri-club and that Team Stampede, Ben Hoffman is on a major stampede down towards the fr- front of this race. Uh, is that a Texas stampede? Different. Dip, oh. Montana, Montana. Oh. Yeah, you're close. Still a cowboy. Still definitely cowboys. But uh, they did. They finished all their races, that team, with cowboy hats. So back in the day, they would grab a cowboy hat at, at towards the finish line and finish the race. Some of them race. Of course, the, the riffraff that was at the back of the race, the true club members, they raced with the hat the whole time. But the, the cream of the crop, those Lindsey Corbins and uh, and uh, Matt Seeley's and Ben Hoffman's, they put that hat on towards the end. Speaking of taking hats off and putting them on. And speedy. Jeez, Jocelyn McCauley, stop the clock. She's on to the run, and this was quite a show. I was just looking at her gap. I mean, first of all, she rode a 4.43.04. What an amazing time uh, to come in here uh, and, and just crush it. She uh, She's not on Kim Morrison's time of 4.36, the, winning, the record time, 4.36, Kimberly Morrison, but she's darn close, and she is flying through transition. She obviously knows there's big, uh, big props if you get the fastest transition. <laughs> uh, but nonetheless, that's it. She's got a six minute plus gap as well. No, like there was no Sunday strolling when she came into in transition. You know, she's definitely on a mission, and you know she continues to push hard as she is about to head into the changing tent. But you know that's what she's about. Like yeah. she's just full on just pushing and pushing and pushing the limits, whether it's the swim, the bike, or the transition. So it will be interesting to see what sort of lead that she has because definitely she was riding faster than everyone else. And, you know, at last check, she had over five minutes on her nearest competitor and then charging through uh, the transition the way she is, you know, she wants to get out on that marathon course and, and, and start ticking over those kilometers last check we had she was over seven minutes back so that's even because i saw your split and then we just got a spotter update uh from the super spotter mel downey she's amazing but much beyond that she her her resume her list of uh, accomplishments is ridiculous i can't even get into it as i move forward sam laidlow he's this guy has continued to impress me as you look at the legs. The world-famous calves of Ben Hoffman. These calves, MJ, have their own Instagram. And they're, it's not just because they're buff, but it's because they're fast. Or is it because his wife runs his Instagram account? Hey, I'm not here to judge. <laughs> I, I just am here to say <laughs> that Ben Hoffman looks great. He's on a tear. And I do believe that he is going to put everything forward to try and win this race. Of course. And uh, his his accolades and his pedigree certainly state no one else uh, here has run a 236 in this in this race. So uh, I'm sorry, Tyler Butterfield. Let's let's uh, let's see what his what my memory. He did this and um, uh, he did this in Cozumel. And I mentioned it already as as the the most impressive race I'd seen in a long time. He. 
he torched that thing for that win and he was running it was kind of cool because because he was 238 and i'll just reference his butterfield he was trying to beat his mom's pr his mom had run a 238 open marathon and he tried to beat her time which he did by a handful of seconds uh, some fun trivia but hey any way that you can motivate yourself i'm all for that's it that's right that's right that's yeah. all it's always good there's those Little like competitions yeah. you have inside a competition, yeah. you know, you they are, it. they are fun. I always used to have lots of fun with my training partners. You know, it, it may not have been about the end time, but there was definitely competitions w within that swim, bike and run. Yeah. And look what's happening now in the men's race. Richard Vargas has settled yeah. into second place and yeah. Sam Laidlow has decided, you know what? I've had enough of us hanging together today. And he's definitely making a decisive move right now. Yes. Yes, he, he is. And we'll see when uh, Ben Hoffman goes under that 5.9 or 9.4 kilometer uh, arch when he gets that timing mat. We'll get to see what what his uh, his pace and his deficit is looking like. Uh, but I want to say this as I just quickly pulled up my tracker. I didn't see Ty Butterfield on that uh, on that run registry. So we'll have to check in on him, get some get some intel from the streets to find out how and where he is. In the meantime, an overhead shot looking down here on Jocelyn McCauley leading the female race, crushing it, I should say. Stay with us, more action to come. There's this beautiful moment in time when neither foot is touching the ground. We are free of gravity and weight, moving above the doubts, past limits. When we are light, transformed and hopeful, and if we were to collect all these moments, join them together, well, this is when anything becomes possible. This is when we fly. Throughout my career, people have doubted my ability and I've had it even more so when I've come into triathlon. I think this year will be very different. There will be bigger expectations on me. I love the way that I race. With my swim background, I'm almost in the driving seat from the gun. I'm the person that everyone is chasing. I want to be the best, and I'm willing to work as hard as possible to get there. Every time I watch that ad from Roca and, and uh, Lucy Charles Barkley, I think, dang it, wish she was going to be racing next uh, in two weeks. But uh, since she's not, she's resting and will be ready, even ready, more ready to go in October. And sometimes we look at that if you find the silver lining, right? Maybe she was uh, she needed to, to kind of cancel out here for a second and rest up. And Lucy Charles Barkley, no doubt, will come back stronger uh, for it. But Gosh, you were dead on, McKeely. He he did just put a little move on, didn't he? He got away. Put the hurt move on. Mm -hmm. Put the hurt locker. Turned up, turned up the heat a little bit. Yeah. Literally and physically. Yeah. And you know he 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 likes to run in the front. Like that's what we saw on the bike. Yeah. You know he, he even when Magnus Ditlev came up, he's like, you know what, you might have come up, but I'm gonna still put myself on the front. And you know that's what he's doing. <clears throat> the same thing right now. You know, there was a little bit of a switch going on between him and Richard Varga early. But, you know, he's being smart. He's using the nutrition stations, making sure he's refueling, keeping his core temperature cool. Uh, this is There's a lot of concrete running um, in this race. So that can have a little bit of an impact as well on the level sure. of fatigue. But he looks comfortable and relaxed. And I mean, and that's the most important thing. It's like controlling that level of fatigue and making sure you stay comfortable. Uh, you're spot on there as uh, I just want to follow up on, on something. And that's Alexander uh, Bergerin that we saw early on, um, if I read that correctly. And here's Lauren Brandon off the bike, second place. And uh, she looks fantastic uh, really transitioned to running legs right away, didn't she? I mean, you know, the, who 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 refers to it? Uh, I wish the, I looked that good. Yeah, G Didi calls this the judgment zone, and that's where we put judgment on how they're looking, how they're going to do. But uh, Lauren Brandon passing with flying colors, bib number three, uh, position number two. She's cranking it, and we're going to see her get into grab her red bag, run into transition uh, into the change tent rather, and dispatch of the the run. Uh, module and and move on to the uh to the run protocol the bike uh, module so 
Here's the story as I uh, fumble and jumble. Lauren Brandon, you you said it. She gained a lot of confidence, showed that she's really feeling good about her run. Nothing would make me happier here today than to see her just whip out a PR, sub 310, sub 305. I think she's capable of it. I'm factoring in the heat. Uh, you know, if she goes in there and just cranks it. So a quick hit to the loo, and we're back here with Sam Laidlow. Yeah, like let's talk a little bit more, just a few more seconds with about Lauren Brandon. It's like Dee Dee we know is like right behind her. Mm -hmm. Shouldn't be too far before we see her. So she can definitely set herself up for a second place finish if she can run as what she's capable of doing. And, you know, Dee Dee's not quite as efficient on the run. So definitely that's to Lauren's advantage. And here if we just go back, because I like to look at 108 miles in, uh, Danielle Lewis to me is really someone that we've got to start talking about a little bit more. Uh, she's 15 minutes, so we do some quick math. She's eight minutes behind Lauren Brandon at 108. Uh, so if I'm going to call something out right now, if I had to call a, a podium, I'm going to say Macaulay, uh, Lewis, Brandon. And I'm not saying it in that order necessarily, uh, but I do think there's a – I'm with you. Like I think that Lauren Brandon, she puts, she puts down a PR, she's getting second. Um, and I'm also not ruling out Didi, but I just think that like Lewis has – uh, really the potential to, to be one of those runners that crushes, you know, she, she wouldn't be surprised. She, I wouldn't be surprised if she ran a 259 in her first marathon off the bike. So that's just, you got to look at that in the heat. So uh, the, it's an exciting race and, and I'm a, I'm a huge fan of those four women. I love what they're doing. I'm going to really enjoy sitting here on the edge of my seat. Might even stand up to watch that um, as we come back to this great side angle. Actually, shot. My, my predicted time for her marathon was around three hours. Who's Danielle? Danielle yeah. Lewis. That's what I've written right here, just in case you're wondering. So when we go back and see how fast she actually run, yeah, I predicted three hours. So yeah. we'll see if that pans out. That was based, of course, her 70.3 I predicted 259.60. 259.60. All right. <laughs> Take you on, take you on. <laughs> I've just seen if anyone's paying attention. So we're back on it. Jocelyn McCauley, leader of the pro women's race on the right side and on the left side from France. You've got him checking himself out. I always love that move. How's my form look? Look at that reflection over there. I'm pretty sure he was checking out to see if he could see anyone behind him. <laughs> no way. Come on, he's a triathlete. He's looking at himself. Uh, you're probably right. So as we, as we come back, and you mentioned something that needs to be addressed again, they do run on a lot of concrete. And concrete is something that is harder than asphalt. And so it is a firmer surface. Uh, it, it really it hurts you more. Especially as you get older like me. <laughs> <laughs> Any, especially, correct, especially. I mean, uh, so, but as I think about that, where does it impact? Obviously, choosing a great pair of hokas, getting, getting the right shoe on, that's, that's key because you get that energy return. You get that spring, which helps. Uh, but it's also something that if you... You know, we talk about preparation. We talk about training what you race. We talk about all this stuff. Did you do training on asphalt or was, or, or, or sorry, concrete or, or cement? Or were you only on asphalt or dirt? Like everybody, you know, says, hey, I'd love to do a long dirt road. Okay, perfect. But factor in those other surfaces, surfaces in your training. It's, it's stuff that often gets overlooked. And the same as Arizona. Uh, the same Ironman Arizona, the same as uh, I'm thinking of a couple of these races, actually the only one that comes to mind that has a significant amount of, of concrete. So my coach, Paula Nimi Fraser, who may know a little bit, she wasn't more about the surface than she was about the terrain. Let's toughen your legs up by running more hills up and down because that's what really toughens your leg up in a way that's going to help you. If you run too much on concrete all the time, that's – an extra fatigue and potential for injury. But if you run up and down hills, you're actually getting a muscular effect. You're getting a cardiovascular effect Correct. in a much safer way, unless you trip and fall. Yeah, <laughs> don't trip and fall. <laughs> And uh, now we've got our superstar on camera here, Dee Dee Greasepower, uh, unfolding from a long bike ride, a fast bike now, ride. Now, what would she say about her transition I'm not right gonna, now? I'm not going to speak for <laughs> Dee Dee, but she is in the judgment zone. She, You know what? I think she That's how I would be. I'd be like... <laughs> I would jogging like her. I wouldn't have been sprinting. Not me. I'd still. I'd be sitting I, I on a curb. It. I'd be sitting on a curb somewhere. So. And I think uh, sometimes the taller you are, the harder that transition is. 
I like I like that. I like that. That's I like that's that. my two I cents like being so a little bit more being on the a baby taller, giraffe as you call it. Being yourself. a baby giraffe definitely uh, it makes it harder when you get off the bike. There's a lot more that you've got to stretch out. Yeah, it's true. I know. You're not comp- you're not a tiny compact boom. So here's the story. Dee Dee Grease Bauer, she's finding her form. And I would say this, and she's the one who called it judgment zone, not me. This is this tells you something, but it often tells you very little. Because one thing that we've found is uh, I mean, reference anyone who looks fantastic and sprints the first five miles of a marathon. Very often, those are the people that don't finish. Uh, this is a sport that rewards patience and rewards a slow warm up. So, if you feel great in transition, uh, you may not look, you know, great at mile twenty. So, if you, if you look a little rough and you're unfolding and feel kind of stiff, that might mean that by the time you get to mile twenty. You're cranking. What do you think about that limp? Is that normal or is that something we're just w- worried about? I know. I was thinking exactly the same thing, and I'm glad you brought it up. She definitely has a little hitch issue yeah. going on. And, I mean, she normally runs a lot smoother That's than what that. I'm so potentially there's something happening just based on how we've seen her run in the past. It definitely doesn't look like the athlete we, we're used to seeing on the run, there was definitely something going on in, in, in the hip. Yeah, I agree. So we'll we'll revisit that. I think uh, if it worsens, that's the – I hope – oh, he jumped the curb. <laughs> I thought that maybe he had fallen. The cameraman doing some fancy footwork down that ledge. Let, let me just say, could, could we really compliment enough uh, this young man, 23 years old uh, from France, and his name's Sam Laidlow. He is – really smooth he looks great Dee Dee's not doing so well here and this is nothing you ever want to see but she's uh looks to be getting some support from the yeah, volunteers and, and i mean some that shows water. you the toll that that bike took out on her that you know we're sitting here in studio we're not outside and i think that's gonna be a telltale sign of what the run's gonna be like if you know you have somebody who's so experienced and you know something like that can creep up so quickly and she's not even on what normally the run would be the biggest issue for her. Mm-hmm. So hopefully the medics get to her as quickly as possible and that they can get her sorted out. And uh, we wish her a speedy recovery if she is actually pulling out. And it did look like she was going to have to retire from the race right now. She, it, it did It did look that way. And now back here to to where, okay, it's a it's an up and a down. Um, I'm, I'm looking at this and I'm saying when you're in this section, you get a lot of cheers, but if you're someone that appreciates a good beer or a hamburger, it's <laughs> torturesome, McKeely, because right to the side, that's what they're doing. They're enjoying beer and hamburgers and barbecue and tacos. And they're just cheering for you. Are you just, one might say, Hey, there's the reward. Get the job done. One other might say, gosh, this is tough. I'd really rather be there. Or one um, other might say sharing is caring. Sharing is Where's caring. my burger? I might have yeah. to like take a, a, a little side turn and, and get myself a burger. But, I mean, a lot of the times it's like, yeah, when you're out training, you're going to notice that stuff. But when you're racing and you're in the zone and you're leading the race, you are so focused on every single step that you're taking, you're really probably not even seeing what's happening around you. I know, like, from myself when I was racing, that's what would happen to me. It was like you get that tunnel vision and you really only see this little tunnel of vision of what's happening in front of you and you don't really know what's going around you because you're so focused on yourself. I mean, you're so focused, you can almost hear your own heartbeat. Correct. Correct. Yes. And I mean, it's it's funny when when you're talking about a race, don't you sometimes have a flashback to something and you <laughs> sort of insert an emotion? Uh, but yeah, let's look at this. What I'm seeing here is, uh, is a rock steady, rock solid, uh, young man here that's just absolutely performing. So um, we'll, I'll reference this again. When we talk about someone's uh, form or we talk about their their posture or their disposition or their facial expression, anything, what we really note is change. So I know we I'll bring up Lionel Sanders. When he's got the, the running form that he has in the limp, it's always there. But if the limp worsens, if the hitch worsens, if the lilt or if the bend or if the the anything worsens, we know that they're suffering. She's definitely got that right now. Joss McCauley has absolutely a limp. She's she's not even and she she's the type of athlete that's tough as nails. She'll go through this and get to the finish line fine. 
But and if it started here and this has to do with the neck or anything like that and it worsens, that's when the red flag goes up. We start to worry, hey, this has gotten bad. Yeah, and I definitely think it's having an impact because her pace has slowed down from the first kilometer, uh, com, uh, kilometers. You know, her pace has definitely dropped and it's not like she's on a hillier part of the course right now. So I think that little hip issue that we can see on camera right now may be having a huge effect on her. I mean, you kind of wonder if it was, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll get to that. Uh, she's not, she's not, um, she's not doing, um, she's not doing what I want to see, but she is tough as heck. So let's see what we can do. In the meantime, I've got an exciting treat. I'm going to throw to the man, the voice of Iron Man himself, Mike Riley. How's it out there, Mike? How's the day going? We can't wait to hear from you. Michael, it is going unbelievably well. And hello, McKeeley. Michael, I hate to tell you, McKeeley's more of my favorite than you are. I, I just had to throw that in there. But I love you both. It is a strong day out here. You guys have been seeing the race. Sam Laidlaw has been laying it down. Uh, Richard Varga, and they both had a tremendous ride. Uh, Magnus Detlieve, as you know, had some trouble on the bike, but he's out there. I, it's even hard to predict on the way they ran out of here how well they're going to do. Hour. Matt Russell looked fantastic on the run. So I, I, I don't know about that men's race. It's going to be anybody's race. But Jocelyn McCauley, oh, my gosh. She, she looked so fresh coming off the bike with a half smile on her face. She knew she had a great swim and ride, and we know what she can do on the run. Lauren Brandon stayed strong on that bike after being out of that water in front of everybody. Dee Dee. Oh, Dee Dee Griesbauer, I talked to her before the race, and I said, you're my idol. My gosh, 52 years old, and but she just looked so tied up running out of here. Hopefully, she'll loosen up and get those running legs underneath her. But you guys, a little bit of wind out here, but I got I to gotta treat this like a very good weather day, except for the wind. But now that they're on the run, I think we're going to be fine. You got anything for me, huh? Yeah. <laughs> I tell you what, I'm just reviewing some footage All here. All right, guys, I, I can't wait. What? Go ahead, Michael. No, no, no. Hey, Mike, I just have to say this. I didn't know I was uh, able to talk back to you, but um, MJ is my favorite, too, uh, not just <laughs> over you, but over me. So I, I, I second what you said. Thanks so much. Uh, I always love seeing and hearing you, so we appreciate it. And we're going to cut back. And anyone here, I know uh, that I was just discussing some of that uh, footage that I saw. But in the meantime, uh, let's take a look at the fastest transition times brought to you by Martin. Uh, Jocelyn McCauley. Uh, is the one who has quickly made it through T2 and exited for the run on the run course in good shape. The chasers here, Lauren Brandon and Danielle Lewis, are doing their best to keep up. Uh, but that's our top three uh, fastest times through transition. And uh, yeah, thanks to Martin for bringing us that data as we look at Joss McCauley on screen right now. No, I definitely agree with some of uh, Mike Riley's picks, but he did forget Ben Hoffman, who's running faster than anyone right now. Um, Jocelyn McCauley, I mean, he can't see what we're seeing right now. Definitely that little hitch that we can see, I think it's progressing in not in a good way. She definitely seems to. But, you know, it, you never know. We don't know what she's actually feeling. She may not feel any of that. That may be something that, you know, doesn't worry her at all. But to us visually, we can see something happening out there. But, you know, she still looks so strong. And I think as we start seeing what her paces look like, that's going to really determine if that hip issue that we can see from watching the broadcast, if that's going to have a significant impact on the pace she's running. I mean, she's just gone through almost, I think she's like about three kilometer mark right now. So it's very, very early. So it'd be interesting to see, but you know, she definitely started out at a reasonable pace and then she's dropped to about eight minutes per mile, which puts her not in a position of running under three hours okay. right now. <laughs> Correct. So we're both wrong on that one, on that same. Um, so as we come back here, I want to just kind of summarize some of the stuff we've been seeing. Uh, we did we did get um, 
we, we have gotten, I should say, a lot of nice updates. Mike Riley, always great to hear. And also, I'm just looking now at our top uh, set of women. Unfortunately, we're going to get an update here on Didi Griesberg. Unfortunately, we did see that uh, moment where she was uh, in the volunteers' arms. We're going to follow up on her. I'm reaching out as well and have been getting some input from her uh, main support crew, her husband, who's down on the ground, Dave. So we'll get back to you. I know a lot of Didi Griesbauer found fans out there. Um, of course, we also are addressing all this stuff. That, can you see this? It, it def I mean, is it, that blood on her knee? It, it looks like it, but maybe uh, she tripped. Maybe that's what happened with uh, that we can see. But definitely, it looks like she's done something to her knee. Yeah, well, and even when she threw her hand up, I mean, she's in obvious pain. Now you can see the left arm drop in. This is definitely something that uh, I want to reach out to some folks that are out there and see if we can get word because ultimately when she does chat back with the camera, perhaps the uh, that word can get back to us. But but as you guys are all seeing, laboring through it, she's still flying and she is still, as I would value it, one of the, the people that could push through uh, any sort of discomfort or problem. Uh, so carry on that's what we're seeing here today and she's cooling off on your uh on your hydration diamond yeah yeah <laughs> my hydration diamond no but i mean she's still focused and sometimes when you're in that moment you really don't feel what we're seeing you know and that's the nice thing with adrenaline you know it, it can overcome a lot of oh. obstacles and any pain that we may think that somebody's feeling you know that adrenaline kicks in and especially when you're in the lead you know, if she wasn't in the lead, you know, that adrenaline may have a different mental effect on her. But, you know, right now she's still getting the job done. You know, she's using the hydration station. She put ice down the front of her top. Uh, she's getting her calories in. Uh, she's trying to keep it as smooth as possible. But, you know, we did see that, you know, there was something that happened. There was some blood on her knee. So it would be nice yeah. if we can get a little bit yeah. uh, more information on that. But, you know, we can only tell you what we're seeing right now. Uh, so yeah, people are asking again. I'm trying to get confirmation, but again, from uh, uh, from my my sources, Dee Dee is in the medical tent, is what we've heard, and uh, that that came to us again. We got a great support uh, network out there that's sending um, sending us info. Uh, so looking to uh, Danielle Lewis, who looks fantastic on the bottom of your screen. Uh, you can see that's her in her debut marathon. She's just a smooth runner, very quick runner, um, and doing a great job uh, as she plugs through. So we'll get confirmation. But, again, as I look out, I've been reaching out to, to Dave Griesbauer to get some updates. And he had said he was going to look in on her. He's there on site uh, in, uh, in transition, I should say. And then also uh, looking to the Dibbins crew who are confirming they think she is in, in the medical tent. We'll get you confirmation later, but we no doubt they'll be taking great care of her. As they said, at the outside of the show, Memorial Herman uh, has the f most fantastic um, medical support in, in all of uh, Ironman races. It's incredible. So she's in great hands. Coming in here, and it's been a long time, we have people asking, hey, share with us some information on Danielle Lewis. And now here you go. She's uh, in uncharted territory, but I have no doubt – uh, the, the caliber of runner and racer that she is, uh, she's going to excel. We talked about some possible times, but all we have to do now is watch her hydrate, pace, and plug her way through um, this event. So a fantastic uh, debut here so far for Danielle Lewis. No, definitely. I actually also had a chance to catch up with her earlier in the week, and she just felt the timing of Ironman Texas was ideal considering she's got some more 70.3s planned towards the end of the year. And she also felt, because it was a couple of weeks before the 70 World Championships, theoretically, you know, she had more of a chance of getting one of those two co um, Kona slots that we have up for grabs. But we'll talk more about those Kona slots when we get back after this short break. We will see you then.
Back into the woods of the woodlands, we've got Jocelyn McCauley clearly with a limp, but we're not calling it out. We don't know what has created that issue, uh, but we I can definitely think she looks say. Little, I actually think she looks a little smoother right now than she did uh, a few minutes ago. Yeah, I mean, definitely there's something, but I think sh she's getting through whatever that pain barrier was, and she definitely looks a little bit smoother right now. She is running about the same time as Lauren Brandon, who's in second place right now. And so that's great for Lauren to, to be running about the same pace. But I also feel that Jocelyn McCauley, you know, isn't running at the standard that we're normally seeing. And, like, we're wondering if the hip issue was from the fall that she seemed to have because she definitely had some blood on her knee. Um and absolutely, I, yeah. We'll we'll come back to that. We'll figure out what we can what we can learn. Um, in the meantime, let's talk about this. We we do know we have an exciting race, both men's and women's. We have a lot of unknowns, and it always comes with an extra flavor when we have rookies because they're just promise. It's just potential on paper. We don't really know, uh, and that's the case with Danielle Lewis. That's the case uh, certainly with Sam Laidlow, with uh, Magnus Didleve, and even with Richard Varga. So we look throughout all of this. But folks, stay tuned because a lot of excitement still uh, afoot, and I will share with you everything that we learn, not just regarding Dee, Dee uh, but everyone else. Um, so coming here, and this is another uh, another speedy part right here. Uh, uh, sorry, a sunny part right here. Speedy, sunny depends on which one you like. But it's a sunny part where she's out in the in the woods, um, w where she's out there getting a lot of sunshine, a lot of radiant heat, a lot of humidity still. Um, so, so the point being, stick to your fluids, there, MJ. Stick to your fluids. That's where I'm getting with this. And certainly there is a little bit of uh, looks like an abrasion of blood on that knee. But uh, regardless, uh, she's she's the kind of athlete that I fully expect uh, to be as tenacious as ever, as tenacious as anyone. She's going to push through, run through, and nail it. Um, uh, so anyway, speaking of tenacious athletes, speaking of, of athletes that – excel and crush and are amazing all across the board we're lucky enough to have one of them on the phone a 2017 winner of this race uh someone who happened to go 856 32 taking out the title uh her name jody robertson she called in kind enough to take time out of her day and and there we have her on screen and jody it's great to see you thank you so much for taking time to join us thanks for having me oh fantastic oh we love having guests on the program thank <laughs> you um, let's get right into it because we, we want to get some answers from you. So you won this race in 2017. Uh, and then yeah. of course you had a couple of runner up finishes in 2016 and 2018. So we want to know why you love racing here and why this course suited you so much. Yeah, I think it definitely favors like some strong runners for sure. And there's so much crowd support out there. The run is definitely the place to be on this course for sure. Um, so it's exciting and a lot happens on this run. It gets so hot and humid. And uh, I think you, it's very unpredictable. You just have to like stick to your plan for this run to make it happen. Oh yeah, great comments. Great, great insight for sure. Um, and, and yeah, I remember watching uh, at least two of those three races, watching you win uh, was impressive. Can, can you tell us, because you know, What's the key to a strong result here in the Woodlands? What really is a key or the key if there's a couple? Um, I think making sure you fuel well, fuel well on the bike so that you're ready to go for the run. Because um, if you miss half there, then you're not going to have anything in the tank when you get running. Um, and then I think just pacing yourself real well. I feel like one of the advantages I have is I always came off the bike kind of like on my own. So I was able to just settle into my place on the run. But you see a lot, of, especially in the women's race here, I feel like the same thing for them. So I think if you stick to your plan, you can be super successful out there. Just fuel along the way at all those aid stations for sure. We actually talked a little bit about that, how like staying in your own moment was actually an advantage for some athletes where being in a pack or a group because you can really rely on your own feeling, your own pacing. But yeah. I know that you mentioned already about how cool the spectator support is, especially on the run. But which yeah. part on the course do you feel you absolutely adored the spectators? Oh, I think like um, the part where you're looping back along like the canal there, 
like back and forth. Like there's two parts where you're on the canal on either side of it. And uh, I mean, that part is just uh, pretty special there. Yeah, that's a good call. Um, <laughs> that's good. We were talking about we'd stop on the side of the road and have a burger because <laughs> you could smell the burgers probably. <laughs> yeah. As, and so here, here's a quick, uh, as we're going to ask you about podiums, I'm watching a uh, rookie. Well, we were watching a rookie there, um, uh, Richard Varga, standing in place, first Ironman, great short course star, uh, fueling up, pouring liquids, taking it all in, Coke. So you know how it can go south. Tell me this. <laughs> do you have a pick for it? I know, not you personally. You know the race. You know how this works. Who's your pick in the men's and women's race? Lay it on us. We need your help. Oh, well, I mean... I have to go on the men's side. I think I have to go with Ben Hoffman, fellow American over there. He seems to be uh, nice. pretty consistent in what he's uh, laying down. So I'll definitely uh, put my money on that one, on that side. On the women's side, I don't know. It looks a little, I like Danielle Lewis looks like it's pretty early, I feel like, for them. She looks like she's running strong, but they have a long way to go. Jocelyn, you can't count her out. <laughs> yes. Isn't it tough to predict on camera, hey, good for you, we'll take it? Yeah, no, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it, it is. It's hard because you never know how they're really feeling. We're only seeing what we're seeing. Um, our last question before we let you go, what are you focused on for the 2022 season? Uh, I'm going to be heading out to Ironman Des Moines. It'll be my first race for this year. So, yeah, that's where you'll see me. Well, that's good. Yeah. Wow, that's great. That's yeah. coming up. I'll get to I'll get to call that race. Look forward to watching you uh, crank it out there in that inaugural event. So good luck. Training's been going well, I assume. Yeah, for sure. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, cool stuff. Well, Jody, it's a pleasure to have you on. A former Memorial Hermann Ironman Texas champion and twice second place. You have a great rest of the day, and we'll call you up and congratulate you if uh, you pick the right winners. <laughs> Thanks so much. Have a good one. Okay, right, you bye. too. So we talked about this, MJ, like he was standing still. Not not the end of his day, but certainly not probably what he felt when he was given high fives to uh, to laid low a couple miles ago. Uh, what, what's the story there? Up and down, roller coaster, what are we seeing? Definitely you're seeing a little bit of a roller coaster because if you're, I mean, not to say that you shouldn't walk through an aid station, but he was physically stopped. Correct. So that's like a little like red flag in my mind that, you know, he's not feeling great. And the fact that, you know, he had a big two-liter bottle of Coke. <laughs> <laughs> I thought he was going to scold the whole thing. But, you know, it's telling us also that it's hot. I mean, we've already seen it with Dee Dee, who needed medical attention um, at T2. Um, we've definitely saw that Richard Vargas, like, had the ice headband, the towel around his neck. And, you know... If you're not feeling great, it is better to stop and get as much fuel as you can in or do what you, decide what you need to do so that you can continue on a race and hopefully turn it around some way, somehow. Okay, and as we watch uh, Macaulay continue to cool off, we can recognize that it is definitely hot out there. Uh, no matter how you slice it, are we in the mid-90s with uh, high humidity? No but we're feeling pretty darn warm. So if you kind of click on the feels like uh, we're still, we're at 53, 54% humidity, it feels like 86, which is spot on 30 degrees, um, it feels like. And now, well, there we go, 82, 28 Celsius, but feeling feeling hotter. So uh, humidity is that, levels. Does that feel like uh, when you're sitting around doing nothing or feels like when you're actually racing an it, Ironman? That is what it feels like <laughs> when you're sitting in a patio having a cold beer. When you're out there doing what Jocelyn McCauley is doing, you actually have to multiply that, this is a true stat, by 1.38. So whatever that feels like, multiply it by 1.38. That's the exercise factor. Um, no, it, it's a great point because spectating, how many times have we been in a race on, on the on the ground looking at someone and you're going, it feels good out here. And they're like, I'm dying. It feels like the face of the sun. I so, don't know. I think spectating is way harder than racing, <laughs> <laughs> well, if you ask me. Well, you know, it's all in your preparation. So I, I'm an expert level uh, spectator, so I go in prepared. Here's the story. First and second place, Jocelyn McCauley representing USA, going for her fourth Ironman victory on the right side of your screen. Left side going for his first official Ironman finish and first win on the left side of your screen, representing France, Sam Laidlow. Both look to be doing great. However, I'm going to call your attention to two runners that I caught uh, on the tracker 
One is Ben Hoffman. We've been mentioning mentioning him before, and his rate uh, that he's moving along is incredible. He's he's just doing what Ben Hoffman does well. He's chiseled that um, that deficit down to four minutes. Um, and they're only at 10 miles for that split. So Ben Hoffman still making the case for he could win it. And then I also want to call out, by way of my friend Matt Miller, who pointed him out, he wasn't in there. Uh, but there's a guy called Trevor Foley. And if you just want to punch in race bib number 55, folks, Trevor Foley currently in ninth place as a professional man. His splits across the board and the damage he's doing on that run is pretty impressive, and we're going to keep an eye on him as he makes his way uh, towards uh, uh, towards the front of this race and, and definitely a top split on that run. He's okay, young, If you're going to throw old. it out there, oh, I threw it. I'm also going to throw right back at you the fact that I'm super impressed right now with Magnus Ditliv. He's running pretty similar to Ben Hoffman right now, and the fact that you know he lost all that time because yeah. he had the mechanical on the bike – so if he can hang in there and they can keep moving forward, he actually might make it on the podium after losing like over seven minutes. Thank he you probably for, lost thank you. over eight and a half minutes. He probably lost, let's say he lost eight minutes, eight and a half. So you're right. And he's going to, so that's going to be where I'll say that'll be the kind of that moment of the race thing for me it, at the end of the day, because he, that's huge. And, and it's, it's something that everyone should remember as we come back to Richard Varga, who, who's still light as a feather, but looks to be maybe slowed. Um, there's so much up and down and really there's so much mental uh, that goes into this. So much uh, sort of control of thought. So did live, you could see he was angry. You could see he was dejected. You could see he was bit down, but he's not out. And so to come back and rally with some good run splits he, you know what? If he gets across the line where he is now, he's going to probably get a Kona slot because Ben Hoffman already has one. So if he's behind Ben Hoffman, Ben's got his Kona slot. Dietlev could be going to Kona for his second Ironman. That's pretty good. Th this man right here, uh, you know, Richard Varga, he looks to be struggling a little bit. It, you know, we saw him walking, standing. He doesn't have that uh, facial expression that inspires confidence. He, he's fine. He could totally crush it but the point is he's in a little bit of hurt right now well you know he may be a little bit of hurt but the others are feeling good and they haven't hit that little hurt zone yeah. yet so you've got to factor that in as well um but you know he's having i mean he's still holding his own he's still up there yes he's probably running about 20 seconds slower per mile so you know three minutes um three miles that could be a minute that he loses very very quickly but you know for somebody who is an experienced the the concern is like when starts things going wrong they don't have the experience to know how to deal with it like how do you work out if you've never experienced it and that's where you know you see a lot of experienced athletes doing so well at Ironman races because you know when they are through those difficult situations they can go back well I got through that at blah 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 race by doing this great stuff another walking moment for uh, for this man here, Sam, uh, uh, Richard Varga, struggling, some cramping, um, trying to work it out. This is bad, too, because when you do stop, obviously there's a need to stop. He's going to stretch that quad, and then when you stretch that quad, the hamstring gets mad because you've, uh, <laughs> you've shortened it up so much. Whammy. And Ben Hoffman makes the Martin move right here in transition. How incredible, not only at an ex extremely fast rate of speed, but Ben Hoffman grabbed the aid and rolled right on through. We have a new second place winner, uh, Ben, uh, second place runner, Ben Hoffman doing what we knew he could do. 236 in Florida in his last race. Now here he is trying to match an equally uh, impressive show. Running for the lead. McKeeley, it's going to be on the second half of this marathon. The last 10 or 12K of this marathon is going to be a nail biter. I'm holding with my bet for Ben. You're holding with your bet for the rookie. Uh, either way, you're going to owe me a beer just because. <laughs> um, but no, let's let's talk about this. That was pretty good right there when we were talking about some but cramps. You, that's experience. That's experience. That's experience right there. And, and, and you saw it like right on our feed, the fact that, slowing down isn't always the answer but you know he, he it's his experience and you know you saw when ben hoffman went through that aid station he was like in and out as yeah. quick as he could get yeah. and the idea is 
keep your momentum going. Keep, yeah. Keep that pacing because Correct. when you get stuck in a slow pace, you get stuck in a slow pace. Yeah. So you're trying to consistently stay in that rhythm. And that's what Ironman's all about, that con constant steady pace all day long. Well said, Makili, and I tell you what, as we look at Ben Hoffman and we're getting more camera time with this uh, American athlete, father of two and a, and a seven-time Ironman winner, uh, we're going to say this, a lot of racing to be done. We'll be here to the bitter end, and we hope you will as well. Uh, but as we step away for just a split second, I'm going to say this, still my favorite kit that Ben has had, and he's had a lot of cool kits. Be with you in a couple short seconds. See that thing John Morant has? That's a hyperbole. That thing he uses to warm up and stay loose before he throws it down. That thing Tony Finau uses on course between shots. Ooh, that's money. That thing Robin and I use before and after we're on the bike so we can ride harder tomorrow. That thing Erlen Holland uses before smashing it into the back of the net. That thing that's for everyone. The hyperbole from Hyper Ice. Give your body the daily relief it's been asking for. Well, here we go, McKeely, and, and I know we've got a couple of corrections to make again, but let's say this. That was the second set of cra uh, quad cramping, uh, you know, shakeouts, a walkthrough. I'm with you where walking an aid station isn't a, a, a doomsday moment. It just means he's collecting himself. Um, but that was certainly a, the first real chink in the army armor we've seen uh, for Laidlow. Uh, ben Hoff, on the other hand, I mean, he's cutting tangents. He's leaning. Like, I feel like he's sprinting into this thing, uh, really going for it. So uh, it's going to be fun to watch this next 10, 10 or 12 miles. No, for sure. Like, there's definitely a big difference in, in, in the running styles and the tactics on the path that they've chosen. One's, like, really trying to get the momentum off the corners. And then Sam Laidlow, you know, he's just focusing on getting the legs turned out and not thinking as tactically as Ben Hoffman. And I have to totally say that I screwed up a couple of times and Sam Laidlow has done a couple of Ironmans. Of course, he had his fastest Ironman Barcelona time of 8.05. You know, he also got second at 2021 at Ironman UK and he was top 10 at Ironman Barcelona. So, you know, he's a very capable guy. He has the experience. So, you know, walking those yeah. aid stations, as we said, you know, isn't always a bad thing. And he could be, you know, going through one of those difficult patches. But, you know, Ben Hoffman just looks so steady. He has a nice turnover. He looks more like he's running a 10K or a half marathon than he does running a, a, a marathon right now. But, you yeah. know, that's what it's all about. It's, you know, sometimes people look slower and some people look faster. But the reality is Ben Hoffman not only looks fast, he is going faster. Yeah, that's right. And, he, and, he, and you know, the depth here. So to, to kind of back it up, I think we both kind of kept talking about Varga as a rookie. And you kind of, by default, were saying, hey, that uh, Laidlow, he's just young. He's new. I mean, Ben Hoffman has won more Ironmans than Laidlow has started. So when you really look at it, and that's just, it is what it is. We talked about rookie or, or light experience being a blessing. Hoffman knows exactly what it takes and how it hurts. Uh, he's comfortable in that zone. Uh, but right now he's, you know, he's a guy that's finished 25 professional Ironmans. He raced Ironman before he turned pro. Um, and so that he's won seven of those Ironmans. Uh, it's impressive. And his, and his record goes across, uh, across the globe. He's won South Africa uh, three times. He's won Coeur d'Alene. He's won Wisconsin, St. George, and, um, and uh, Lake Placid. So he's won on some great courses. Coming back here to Jocelyn McCauley, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stand – right now with she has a bad limp but it's not slowing her down she's not comfortable it's not it's something's bugging her uh something's probably been bugging her i don't think there was a traumatic incident today i just think she's i think she's got an issue that she's dealing with but i think she's so darn tough that it's not really material it doesn't matter so to speak she's hurting 
and she's going to hurt or she's limping. Maybe she's not feeling as much as we think, but she's just going to plug through it because she is that kind of athlete and that kind of racer that we're going to see at the finish line saying, hey, man, that was tough. I'm happy I won. And, you know, she does have a little bit of cushion, that's for sure. You know, she had yeah. such a strong bike today that, you know, sh she doesn't have to run a PR right now if she can maintain the pace that she has on the marathon right now. You know, possibly not what she wanted today, but, you know, it's a good start to the season. And, you know, if she did have an issue leading into this race and still be leading on the run, uh, that's going to be really exciting for her if, if she can – Fix whatever that issue Fix. is right now. <laughs> I tell you what, you might be wondering how on earth are we getting this shot, but this time we put cameras out everywhere you could think of, and right now there's a camera on a boat streaming alongside of her. We got motos, obviously. We've got uh, electric bikes, so that was what you saw, that camera jump that curb. Drones, of course, and uh, some cameras on foot, but we've got them all over the place today on every mode of transportation. And guess what? It's because we're trying to keep up with these guys and give you all the angles we can. But, yeah, big thanks to our tech crew that's given us incredible pictures today uh, to talk about and great, great coverage. So here we are with the Frenchman. What do you think? Where are we at? Yeah, well, you know, he's definitely not running as fast as someone like Ben Hoffman, that's for sure. But he's still maintaining uh, definitely Richard Vargas, who is in, who, who got passed by Ben Hoffman fairly like a few kilometers ago. And then we have Ditliv, who's doing great on the run. He's actually the mover and the shaker, if we're going to call every anyone that's running the fastest the mover and shaker. Hmm. Uh, you know, he's definitely running anywhere between 10 seconds faster than anyone else. So it'll be interesting to see what happens. You you can right there. So the you can absolutely see a change of pace. You can obviously see him going from racing to a little bit of maintenance. Now you can come back from maintenance again to, uh, um, you can definitely get back into race mode, but right now he's in, he's in uh, damage control. So you can see, Oh no, like, let me get some fluid. He's probably going to take a couple steps. This right here, there it is. You, you can see that the that the charge has slowed. So right now, uh, anyone that's been through an Ironman can recognize the difference between when you're in the flow and you're pushing, and then you hit that lull or that black spot, and you got to go, okay, how do, I, how do I minimize this? How do I shorten this? How do I get out of this? What do I need? Probably some water, probably some uh, Martin gel, probably something to get me going, shake out the quads. But this right here, is gonna is gonna. Well, we've seen this before. We we saw this just a minute ago, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so when when Ben, I'm gonna say this now. When Ben Hoffman comes through, we're probably gonna see a similar rate of uh, of speed differential. No, for sure. And you know, we saw the same thing with Richard Vargas. This ex almost the exact same pa pattern. Same thing. Stretching. Ooh, hamstrings just. Uh, ooh, hamstring cramp. That's yes. not good. But we just saw the same thing happen, and it was like the mistake was pulling back and then activating the hamstring. Yeah, it, it, you know, it's brutal, isn't it? I mean, it's that it's that uh, opposing contractions, right? You try you think you're doing some relief to one side, boom. Um, I cramp up just doing that, not even running. <laughs> I'm cramping if up I like do that, that right just, now. Yeah, if we, we, we tried to do that right now, I'd probably hamstring cramp as well. Yeah. Yeah. So here we have on the left side of your picture, uh, the leader of the race from France, that is uh, Sam Laidlow. He's walking it out, trying to keep things going, trying to keep the picture together. Meanwhile, here comes the cavalry, Ben Hoffman, we the first of those members. Uh, and again, I'm, I'm not seeing the future, but I, I'm not I'm, I'm going to be more surprised if Ben doesn't roll through and pass him within the next minute behind him. Just keep a, keep an eye on some of these uh, characters that are coming, uh, not the least of which uh, <laughs> are Magnus Dietlieb. I mean, now look at this. Ben. Ha I mean, Ben's on a mission. And I think a lot of this also um, th also tells you. He's trying to make a statement. There's a world championship in two weeks, trying to make a statement, trying to get some fitness, trying to win a race. But you come in here, everyone sees this stuff. Like, I mean, you know how intently Joe Skipper's at home watching. He's watching this. Everybody's watching this. Even if they don't see it live, they look at the results, and there's not a person out there that's going to say, dang, that's going to avoid saying, dang, Ben Hoffman just won that race in a XXX pace on the run. That's got to be part of the game as well, I think. Let me tell you also. Talk to me. It's like Ben has a really good attitude that the fact that, you know, you only have so much time as a professional athlete. So he's on the start line because he felt he was ready. And he feels yeah. like, you know, those 
opportunities get less and less. Yeah. So if he's going to have an opportunity, he's going to do everything he can to win the race. And that's yeah. what he's doing right yeah. now. And, you know, he's he was less than two minutes behind the last that I checked. Yeah. And if somebody's walking in front, that two-minute deficit is quickly going to change. Yeah. Very, he, very quickly. Correct. And then, you know, you've also – Ben's got to be careful because Magnus Ditlev is – only maybe 20 or 30 seconds behind. So if Ben doesn't keep pushing and pushing, pushing, then it's going to open the door for someone else. Here we go. We're watching Ben Hoffman and we're talking about Ben Hoffman, but what better way to give us more information than to catch to the show of interview we had with him earlier this week. Here's the man, the seven man, seven time Ironman champion. Here's what he had to say. Yeah, it's beautiful here. I remember coming here in 2015 and I was like not that into it, but this time I'm like, maybe it's just my mindset, but I'm like actually more fired up to be here. I'm gonna wait and see if like the training goes the way I think it can go, then I'll go. And if it doesn't, then I'll just like go to St. George like I was already planning. Um, and then it just started to come together. So it was like, yeah, I'm doubling up, yeah. I mean, in 2019, I did Kona, Florida and I think I felt better in Florida. So it was three weeks apart, so this is tighter, but I feel like it's possible worth trying it with this one as opposed to the fall. And if it goes well, then I'll consider trying to do something like it in the fall if I can. But yeah, I think in terms of like the bigger picture of, you know, I guess what I'm most invested in, it's still Hawaii. I mean, after 13 years of going there and stuff and dedicating myself to it, it's like that's where my head is, you know? Yeah, I mean, I don't feel like there's a ton of pressure on it, really. I feel like it's kind of an opportunity to, you know, maybe race in some warmer conditions and like try a couple things out for Kona but yeah mainly just to kind of see if I can get you know really solid effort in two weeks out from, from St. George I mean that's what I would normally do anyway at home is a big weekend two weeks out so this kind of works out and yeah I mean I want to I want to race for the win so you know I think yeah I'm going to attack the race and see what see what the body has on the day but um, mentally and physically I feel good you never know what what will happen on race day how other athletes have trained but um I think if I put it together, I can have a really good day and be at the front, so that's the plan. And here's the thing that's obvious. Ben Hoffman, he's a humble guy. Throughout that interview, very, very um, uh, dismissive of the fact that he was a clear favorite here. So Ben Hoffman made the Morton move. You saw in the upper left-hand corner, and we're going to get a replay as soon as we can, folks. But uh, Ben Hoffman, the new leader of the race, uh, you thought you were seeing double interview on the right, real live action on the left. Uh, but the American uh, who calls Tucson, Arizona home is now in first place. He made that, that Martin move late in the game. But we talked about this. Laidlow still fighting. But it's now time to look down the ranks and say, all right, Ditlev, Svensson, what about uh, Foley, uh, who you see Trevor Foley rolling through? What about Cody Beals, who is also rolling through? So our podium still stands to see a big shakeup. But anyone who's putting money against this man on camera is not smart. This guy, if you just took a snippet of that, you would think he's running a 70.3. The guy is cranking it. No, he looks really, really good. And Definitely, it's opening the door for everyone else as uh, Laidlow, we saw, was starting to struggle through the aid stations. And that's how Ben quickly got to the front of the race. He's running really, really well. And then we've got Ditlev, who is sort of got bouncing between running faster than Ben, running a little bit slower than Ben. So definitely, that move's going to happen shortly. So Sam Laidlow is going to move down to third spot at any moment now. And then, yeah, you've got Stefferson, who's just been steady. He's been steady on the run. He's been moving up. Yeah, and then you sort of look down when you've got someone like Cody Beals, who we expected to be actually a little bit higher right now. So it looks like he's having a little bit of a rebound uh, during the marathon right now. I would agree. And I think when you start to talk about the paces and the trouble that we're seeing uh, with Vargo and Laidlow, uh, these guys were up front kind of dangling for so long. And I think we're going to start to see uh, some late late game changes. And uh, Ro 
roll, roll, rolling in, rolling into this, I'm going to say a few things. Ben Hoffman really strategizing, talking about what is coming up, and uh, and talking about Kona, which gets me excited. But let's get a little more action here in a second. It's warm, it's exciting, and we're ready to keep racing. Now some nice overhead shots of the Woodlands and the Memorial Hermann Ironman Texas venue. Uh, you heard a nice interview from Ben Hoffman where he prepped this, kind of saying, I'm not sure how I'm going to feel. If I'm not ready to race, I'll do St. George only. I've raced well on the back-to-back -back before. Uh, you know what? Always analyzing to have, to have been to Kona 13 times is a notable feat, but he's also saying, I want to go in there. He wants to go in there and try and be competitive, not just for the podium, but for the win. And he, he, he believes he's got that run weapon uh, behind an incredible bike. So, uh, look, it's cool to see. It's cool to see how people plan their, their seasons these days. You know, it used to be real traditional, right, back in the days. Hey, race one, race two, you're done. Uh, but really a lot of strategy, a lot of thought goes into it. And, and it's all about preparing the body and the mind for, for what you're trying to accomplish. And it's also about recovery. You know, if you are lining up some Ironmans that are back-to-back, you know, less than two weeks, maybe not ideal for some athletes. For some athletes, they're like, well, you know, three weeks work, maybe two weeks. And, you know, everyone responds differently to an Ironman. So the recoveries for some could be a month. You know, some people can turn around and recover very quickly and get back on their schedule. And, you know, it also depends on what sort of load they have as well and how you plan that out. So do you go in this one with a heavier load or do you go in it with a little bit lighter load and then go back into a heavy mode? So, you know, all those factors play a part. And, you know, it really depends on how you finish up on the day as well. That's right. And uh, having a little look back here, uh, this is uh, another move where we've got Magnus Dietlieb coming through, entering transition, and he's coming up on, had already come up and gone right past Sam Laidlow. So Sam in a world of hurt. But Magnus Dietlieb, here's the thing. I'm telling you, moment of the race so far, overcoming what could have been a devastating mechanical. But that's true professionalism. Like, you've got to have that outcome still at mind. He's still going to aim for that Kona slot. He's still trying to chase down Ben Hoffman. Ben Hoffman, he's thinking, he could cramp. I could get him back. And guess what else? We can all still play the coulda, shoulda, woulda game. So even when he goes home, he's gonna if he wants to, he can be like, if I hadn't gotten that flat, I woulda, coulda, shoulda. And you know what? It gives you peace of mind for next time, even if it's, you know, kind of hoping and dreaming. You know, that's definitely something to put in your back pocket that, you know, if, if you still have that time. So here's looking back as we uh, left T2 and got going into the run uh, here. And we immediately got some action going where uh, – where Laidlow got after it. He had a nice little battle with Richard Varga. I want to say this. I'm not sure if it shows up, but we had a moment where we all thought Richard Varga had cut a corner, but we got to see a replay, lucky for us. On that replay, we saw that Richard Varga was well inside that line of cones and made the appropriate left turn around the cone. So I misspoke myself, and I know a lot of us jumped to some improper conclusions. But watching Richard Varga battle it out with Laidlow was only half the battle because on the women's side, we got to see through T2 uh, some cool action where Jocelyn McCauley crushed it and gone. Lauren Brandon crushed it and gone. And then we also unfortunately got to see Didi Griesbauer, our, our favorite uh, co-host racer, uh, pull out into the med tent there in T2. But plug along, Jocelyn McCauley really taking the bull by the horns and getting to it. 
But the moves so far, all the moves belong to Ben Hoffman. Faster through transition than most people are all day. He took the lead and he kept on hydrating while he did it. Uh, we saw a few moments of cramping here for Sam Laidlow. We saw a few moments of cramping for Richard Varga. They each uh, had to relinquish their time at the front. The American and seven-time Ironman champ Ben Hoffman looks like he's off uh, for a quick sprint around the neighborhood. But no, he's trying to win his eighth title. So there it is in recap form. And we come back to the uh, to the Dane, the man who is uh, a little bit further back than he wanted to be. But let me tell you, Magnus Dietlieb is impressing uh, still. No, he, he definitely is. And uh, he definitely hasn't given up. You know, there's still a uh, podium on the line. There's still a Kona slot on the line. So, you know, he's got himself back on track to get this race finished and done. And it's going to be also nice to uh, walk away with some prize money. Yeah, because we have a share of $100,000 that goes to these guys. We sometimes forget they do race for money. First place taking home $15,000 U.S. dollars, $9,000 for second, seven for third. And we pay all the way through the top 10. So, um, you know, Dietlieb's also looking for that. And remembering that these, these athletes also get bonus uh, money, typically from their sponsors when they hit the podium or the win. So a lot of incentives and just, you know what, we're all competitive. Like this is why you do the sport, right? You're competing against yourself and others. Uh, so this man's still driven to try and win this race. He set and out only, to win. Only 32 seconds back right now. Is that right? Yeah. So it's still fairly close, you know, first and second, only separated by 32 seconds right now. Well, that comes back again to your point of who looks what, how, and when, because he looks like he's running a great deal slower because he's so tall and his stride rate's different, where Ben Hoffman's uh, turnover is so darn quick, it looks like he's he's running a four-minute mile. So uh, great stuff. But look at the left side of your, uh, your leaderboard there. All of those people in the top five have up arrows. They've all advanced. So some notables, of course, um, Foley, Trevor Foley from USA, rolling forward. Cody Beals from Canada, rolling forward. Jesper Svensson from Sweden, rolling forward uh, with only Laidlow going back. Um, man, it, an exciting race. I, I don't see uh, the likes of... Uh, Richard Varga in that in that leaderboard, which could perhaps mean he's either walking or, or pulled uh, pulled the pin on this one, pulled the plug. Yeah, he definitely was struggling at some of those aid stations. So, you know, at some point you you either try to overcome overcome it, and sometimes you know it's just you, you're in such a deficit that you can't overcome it. So, hopefully he is back on course, but we don't think he is. So hopefully he can recover quickly and. Uh, back to finishing an Ironman so he can say he is an Ironman finisher. Yeah, that's right. And I think uh, that the finish part is uh, obviously a check we all got to uh, tick off the the list, but certainly how fast he finishes. Uh, let's look at this. If we just kind of scroll back and see that gap, we haven't seen Lauren Brandon on camera for a little while. She's about seven minutes and 20 seconds out of first. So about 720 behind Lauren. I mean, I'm sorry, Jocelyn McCauley. And then and then Danielle Lewis, still impressing. I mean, running some great paces. I will say she's slower than the other two, uh, but she's really running great throughout that part, McKeeley, just uh, as we expected. And, I mean, how great for Lauren Brandon to have led the race for a long time until Jocelyn McC McCauley took it over. But she's hanging really tough. She seems to be running quite well. So... I think if she can hold on to that second place finish, I think she'll be very, very satisfied. Yeah, she. I mean, you know what? You come here to win. You come to excel. But I'm, I'm with you. It's exciting to see athletes when they break through. I, I remember I saw her live winning Boulder Ironman, and and I saw her come darn close to winning her first 7.3. And I saw, you know, like I, I guess seeing that evolution. Here's why I mentioned I saw it live. Her smile when she's – she even win or lose, she got an incredible smile. But, like, she's someone you just cheer for because you really feel that um, – you feel that victory. You know what I mean? You feel that PR. You really feel that excitement. And uh, I think that's why she's She's not smiling on the inside, just on the outside. <laughs> you see a lot of athletes. They're actually really smiling on the inside. You just can't see it. I love that. I don't think I've ever heard it that way. I are love you, are that. Are you sure it's not a grimace? <laughs> a smile grimace? It's a grinace. I call that a grinace. Grimace. With an N. <laughs> Grinning or grinning. Here we go. Back to Dietlev. Aren't we clever? Look at him go. He's, he's yeah, gosh, 32 seconds at that last split. 
Um, he's just really still in the fight. And I, I guarantee you uh, now with that information in my brain that I'm changing part of why Ben Hoffman went through that aid station at, at rapid fire pace was to drop uh, laid low. But the other part of it was because this guy's coming on hot. And so uh, it's a double sided uh, uh, sword there. Well, you know, that's the thing about the marathon that that makes it so ex- ex- exciting but also tough for the athletes because you would never know what's happening behind you. You don't know what's happening in front of you. You really can control – you can only control what's happening to you. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you're just hoping that during that marathon that the low points are very short and the high points are long, long, long. Yeah. And – You know, it also comes down to, okay, who's willing to push that little bit harder and who's capable of even changing that pace? And it's like we all know when we get to 18 miles on the marathon, that's when anything that's going to go wrong, it's going to be even more amplified at that point. So right now, like from our view, we can't see Ben up front and that's the thing about this course. It's quite windy and twisty until you get to the canals yeah. where that's when you'll get a more of an opportunity. Cause there were a, a couple of times when I thought I could see the lead camera guy. I could definitely not see Ben. So that's as an athlete, that's what you're going to try to look for. You know, Ben's probably going to be a little bit harder to spot, even though he's in that bright colored <laughs> uniform. He blends with those tulips right there. <laughs> so, you know, you are going to be trying to motivate yourself in any way you can in that moment. Yeah, he's actually now the camouflage one. Uh, but no, I tell you what, the the, uh, the fact of the matter is here, we've got a race uh, in front of us, and we've got a race for the next several miles. Uh, ben Hoffman is in that position where you said he's going to take every victory, every bit of the fight uh, when it comes to him. Um, I have to say, as, as, uh, as we mentioned, he ran that 236 for second place last year at Ironman Florida. That's an exciting moment. But you come up short, and you're going, man, I can't believe I just ran what I did and didn't win it. Today, he's saying, not again. I want to have this victory. I want to keep this career pushing. Uh, the guy, you know, the guy is approaching is approaching 40. He's still, gosh, to be honest, he's, still, he's only, he's only going to be 39 this year, Ben Hoffman. I mean, there's still, there's still a lot of, there's still a lot of life left in that, in that young pup. There is right now, that's for sure. <laughs> He's certainly showing you that 39 is uh, a winning 39. Yeah. He's definitely putting himself into a winning position right now. But also, this guy right here, I'm impressed. I am too. Like, the fact that he probably lost over eight and a half minutes because of the the issue with his bike. It looked like he had a flat tire. Yeah. Like, absolutely amazing that he can, like, get mentally back on it and, and be in second right now. Uh, for sure. Uh, for sure. And here's, uh, here's, here's what we also can factor in, because even if, like, we don't get the he'll, – he'll share this, and it'll be on his Garmin file or his uh, Wahoo file, but it'll, it'll show up later where, <laughs> where, you get, uh, where you get that data of stoppage time. But my point is, here's the point. Even if he was moving for some of that time, he, we still know that he materially lost seven minutes, right? He was ahead. So some, even if it's getting back and slowly getting your rhythm, all of that stuff, he lost some momentum. He lost some time. So no, uh, yeah, kudos right. to the guy. Yeah, that's actually a good point because, you know, if you're moving a little bit, that's <laughs> beneficial. If you're completely stopped, yeah. you're losing a lot more time. So yeah. minutes aren't really minutes when you're like thinking about if somebody's actually moving slowly or they're not moving at all. But somebody who's not moving very slow right now is Jocelyn. You know, she looks comfortable. There was a comment that perhaps she tripped in transition and that could be why she had blood on her knee. Um I think as the run is progressing, I feel she's looking more comfortable Mm -hmm. and she's definitely got her stride. She's finding her rhythm right now. And I really feel like she's actually stepped it up. Mm -hmm. You know, even though she has a significant lead, I really feel right now she's stepped it up. Uh, Still like a little tiny awkwardness in the stride, that's for sure. Um, But... She's definitely pushing hard. It's not letting her slow down at all. And, you know, she's running quite well. 
Well, let's just look at this, too. Ditlev just took one second back. Doesn't sound like a lot, but he took a second back from Ben Hoffman in uh, uh, just under two miles. So, yeah, they're evenly matched. Literally, these guys are <laughs> are uh, are toe, you know, toe, toe to toe with uh, approximately 200 meters between them. So great stuff to see there as we come back to a long shot of Jocelyn McCauley, try and see who's behind, see if we can catch a glimpse of, uh, of uh, Lauren Brandon. But, you know, seven minutes, you're not going to see her unless it's an out and back. Uh, but word on the streets here is that that Lauren Brandon looks incredible, looks great, and is uh, rolling along in fine fashion. So uh, coming around a hard left there in some of these twisty, turny uh, sections of road on the Hoka Run course, we are following along behind Lauren uh, Jocelyn McCauley, who's going for her fourth Ironman victory. Uh, will it happen today? We'll know that here in a, about an hour's time. But stay with us as we will return to this great race and this great coverage. There's this beautiful moment in time when neither foot is touching the ground. We are free of gravity and weight, moving above the doubts, past limits. When we are light, transformed and hopeful. And if we were to collect all these moments, join them together, well, this is when anything becomes possible. This is when we fly. Throughout my career, people have doubted my ability and I've had it even more so when I've come into triathlon. I think this year will be very different. There will be bigger expectations on me. I love the way that I race. With my swim background, I'm almost in the driving seat from the gun. I'm the person that everyone is chasing. I want to be the best and I'm willing to work as hard as possible to get there. And speaking of big expectations, here we have Jocelyn McCauley, who's leading our women's race. And, you know, in 2019, when she last uh, raced this race, she was second. So to be in a, a, a lead right now um, and coming up towards the later stages of the marathon, she's going to be pretty damn pleased with herself. And, you know, she's a hardworking athlete. She has... Uh, two young kids um, and everyone's sort of involved and we talked about earlier how her eldest child is going to be at one of the aid stations towards the end of the course and then her younger child will be with her her grandparents or her mum and dad so it's going to be exciting for her to cross the finish line I think one of the biggest thrills she has is seeing her family at the end. And I think this one's going to be even more emotional for her because we're in Texas. She's trained here. Her parents only live about 90 minutes away. So if she can keep progressing forward and finish and actually cross that blue carpet in first place, I'm pretty sure it's going to be a, a, a cry. I'm going to be crying. She's going to be crying. <laughs> I'll probably it's, be crying. Yeah, it's going to be uh, a great to see that. For sure. And, and I tell you what, I remember her from Ironman VR racing and she had her whole family on there. Her husband's hilarious. They had some hilarious notes that we, they were putting up there on camera. And she was just a lot of fun last year throughout that whole series. And as we come back to uh, that last year, two years ago, uh, time is like a sludgy memory. But as we come over this drone shot down as, as Joss McCauley crosses here, Lake Woodlands, the water in which she swam earlier, we get a great shot, a great overhead here. And uh, you're going to start to see more and more athletes stream onto course here. But let's take a peek, if we can, back a few uh, clicks on the tracker. And you're going to see that we, are, that we are seeing some good progress from Joanna Ryder from Switzerland, who's moving through. You can see her progressing. Jen and it doing well. They're far enough back that it's not going to factor against Macaulay, but it is certainly something to look at. I still feel like our, our main player, uh, three players are kind of where they where they ought to be. Uh, time will tell if I'm wrong, but it's certainly fun to watch these, these runs, and I, I can't wait to see, you know, some sort of breakthrough run here from Lauren Brandon wherever she lands up on the podium. Yeah, and one of the reasons why Joanna Ryder wanted to come to the U.S. is because, you know, typically the European season doesn't open for another couple of months. So it's like getting a little jump on, on ahead of your European competitors. And, you know, it's a, a great way 
to see where your training is and what you need to continue to improve done but you know she felt that this course would really suit her as it's like flat um she also does a, of course a lot of trainers uh on the on the uh the wahoo kicker you know being in europe it's not as nice as california weather in the winter but yeah no she came in with a lot of confidence and she sort of felt like it was a game changer to come and race a little bit earlier. Yeah, that's great. I, I mean, you typically see her. We did see her at fourth place at Cozumel last year in Mexico, but closed the season late. But, like, you see her with a whole handful of top fives. She's never gone on the, the top two, uh, one or two steps, but a lot of three, four, fifth places. And um, yeah, yeah, she's another athlete that's going across to Ironman St. George in a couple of weeks. Oh, wow. That's great. And, and certainly, yeah, getting a little bit of a boost from this race. Uh, it, it still it still kind of strikes me as somewhat absurd to think of an Ironman as prep for an Ironman, uh, but I understand that that's that's just my old brain trying to adjust to what newer athletes and younger athletes can can accomplish. But uh, speaking of these newer, younger, faster athletes, uh, we're excited uh, to announce that we have the last winner of the professional race on the men's side on camera um, and on the phone with us today. And he comes to us from very far away. Patrick Neal. Actually, tell us what time of day is it? Patrick Nielsen, first of all, our defending champion or champion. And how the heck are you? And thanks for joining us. Hi guys, and uh, thanks for having me. Um, it's uh, eight thirty, and 830. Um, get to at the hotel, uh, flying out to St George tomorrow. Oh, we caught you just in time. Well, it's great to see you, and I hope we're not keeping you up too late uh, here for this call. But you know, we got a couple questions. But I did want to say the last time you know we had a pro race here, you won it in fine fashion, seven hours fifty with fifty five seconds on a smoking hot day. I'm sure you remember that. Does that sound accurate? Is that what happened? I mean, it's, uh, I think I do remember the first probably seven, six, seven hours, but uh, not too sure about <laughs> the last few minutes. Oh, my but, gosh. Wow. I mean, watching Minecraft right now, I definitely remember the waterway, and it's. I still think it's one of the most amazing Ironmans I've done. Uh, just running along the waterway, it's, uh, it's amazing. It's spectacular. Cool. Oh, yeah, it definitely is spectacular. We're actually watching, uh, the, running along the canal right now. Uh, one thing that I did want to ask you uh, about this race, wh why do you think it suited you so much, particularly because of the conditions? And are you envious right now that you're not here racing to defend your title? I mean, thinking of the heat and the conditions, I'm not too envious, but... Um... <laughs> I mean, I definitely like the heat. I think I like the heat. I like fast, pretty flat courses. Also, race like Armand Cozumel. It's uh, it's amazing. I still haven't finished. I've been there three times. I've been leading the race three times, but uh, still haven't finished. But I mean, a race like it, Armand takes us. It's I, I'm not sure about the bike if it's nice or not but it's definitely fast and then out on the run it's it's hot it's humid it's tough it's rough and uh, i think especially the run and the swim without weight suits, suits me well yeah great stuff well I'm, i love talking about your past results you've got a whole heck of a lot of fast racing uh under your belt last year you won the ironman european championship title in germany uh, that was fun to watch you know coming into this season is the form kind of similar are you feeling like you're fit i know you had covid this year tell us about you know kind of how you feel about the form i mean i think as every parent around it's it's not always easy to stay healthy and stay focused and stay in not injury free and um, illness free um so actually i mean over the last two three years there's been a lot of illness and especially during and after covid during the lockdowns it's been Maybe not hard to find a focus, but definitely tougher to find this kind of killer mentality that I especially need during a race where you want to perform 110%. Um, so I, but I think this build up, it's probably one, the first year in a long time where I feel really prepared. I feel super fit. I feel strong. I've been doing the sessions I want. And. Uh, I just talked with a mental coach a few days back and like did this, I don't have anything to, it might sound negative, but it, I don't have anything to complain about. Like everything's been going so good. Uh, so leading up to 
St. George, I definitely feel more fit than I was in Frankfurt. And uh, then, of course, Klagenfurt, Kusumel, and uh, Armin Tulsa in 2021. Yeah, a lot of good racing. No, I mean, I just got to give you confidence that, that you really don't have any question marks in your training so far. But we, we still want to ask you a little bit about your prep for St. George and, you know, any specifics that you want to share with us. And what do you think will be an important... What do you, aspects do you think of that race will be important for a strong performance? I mean, I th- thought of it when driving to the hotel now, and it's definitely going to be a different. It's going to be a different race. Um, most years you have Jan Frodeno being in the front in the swim, being in the front of the bike, being in the front of the run, and he's the guy you want to beat. He's the kind of golden standard you want to achieve. This year, I think definitely think it's more open. I think. An athlete, both with Jan out, Patrick Lang out, uh, Javier Gomez out, there's a lot of good athletes not racing. So I think someone like Elisa Brownlee, perhaps, together with Daniel Beckegaard, Max Newman, wanting to push the pace on the swim, really to break away and get a gap to the two Norwegians, who's, I think, back in everyone's head, when kind of when you wake up during the night screaming, I think you everyone has... <laughs> Watching Kristen and Gustav catching you on the run, it's they are the big question mark. Where even if assume that they are not going to be in the mix, assume they are not being on the podium, but they are definitely mentally going to mix up the race before the start, before the race even starts. Um, yeah. Hey, since so we're there, because because the the uh, nightmares. No, exactly. Sorry. I mean. <laughs> They no one really knows where they are. Uh, yeah. I mean, when you watch Ben Hoffman run now, you know okay, he's this solid, always good athlete, um, and you 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 kind of know where he's at. Uh, someone like Gustav and Christian, no one really knows what's what are they going to do. Um, so it's going to be a tough race. It's going to be furious. It's going to be different. But uh, I definitely look forward to it. Yeah, good stuff. And and here, you know, I kind of want to ask you about a couple other nightmares. I don't know if you view Sam Long or Lionel Sanders as nightmares that are coming from behind. Um, but uh, you can comment on that if you like, just to mix them in there for maybe it helps me do a better job next uh, during that show. <laughs> um, I mean, they, they are still, you just, I think most athletes still know where it's both Sam and Lionel are at. Uh, they are the, I mean, you know, they, they are good, good, strong bikers. They're good, strong runners. But you still know, okay, what can they do on a race course? Um, so I obviously have huge respect for both of them. They, they are fast. I mean, Lionel has been second in Kona. He's good. But both still, I, Kristen and Gustav, they, it's just a question mark. Like yes. you don't know what are they going to do sub two thirty on the marathon? Are they going to blow up the field on the run, like on the bike? What what's what is going to happen? Um, that's why I think they will be the big question mark throughout the whole race. And like you might start to run with a ten minute lead over them, and they are still going to catch you. You you just don't know because they haven't done any races. Yeah. No, that's great. I mean, awesome answer, and I appreciate that. They are the question marks, which makes it fun and a challenge for you out there. Speaking of a challenge, can I just ask you real quick, if you're looking at this picture, the guy in white, that's Magnus Dietlev. The guy in colors, that's Ben Hoffman. Uh, can you give us a prediction? Who are you handing that title to at the end of the day today? Who's going to be the new uh, champion in, in the Woodlands? I mean, I must say, it's still like an athlete like Ben. He's he's just rock solid, um, and I think watching Magnus has done his races before. It's I, I don't think he's going to blow up on the run, but I think he will struggle more than Ben during the last five or ten. Awesome. So I think Great. Ben, that- Yes. Well, Patrick, great answer. It's uh, so good to see you, and we can't wait to watch you race in two weeks. All the best for uh, safe travels, great recovery, and a great race. Uh, We appreciate you, and and thanks for the time. Thank you very much, guys. Okay. Have a good night. All right. Bye.
Wow. Did you see what's happening right now in the race? That's so close. <laughs> I mean, you could see them so close. All that I know is, is it so close? Um, I, I don't disagree, though, where if you look at track record in this race, Ben Hoffman is has got more chops on the finish stretch. We've got somebody who has more track record and someone who has zero track work yeah. record yeah. in this distance. Yeah, that's true. And so how, how much, you know, I think we've talked about this a lot, and, and everybody knows how in, important, everybody that watches or plays this game knows how important that final five, uh, five to eight K is. Um, but but we're getting in, we're 7.15 into this race. So essentially 35, 40 minutes left. Let me, I mean, I'm throwing it out there, course record 7.50. We'll run the numbers in a minute, but it's down to the wire now. 30 sec less than 30 seconds. Like it was 20 seconds. 20. So, you know, that's significant, you know, just, but that also tells you like how long it's taking to get 10 seconds. A you know, they were sitting at 30 seconds for, for quite a while and now they're sitting at 20 and it's like those little out and back sections are either going to motivate you or like deflate you. So that's going to be really key for both those athletes. Like when is the gap going to get extended out or when is it going to be bridged? And in a way, it's going to be interesting to see, you know, Patrick Nelson thinks that the experience is going to play out. You know, he's, mm -hmm. he's he knows what it feels like and what you have to do to get in that hurt box for the last six miles. Yeah. Where you've got someone like Martinus Ditlib who hasn't been in that hurt box. But it's also, he doesn't know. He doesn't know what he's in no. for. So sometimes that's to your benefit as well. That's right. Well, stay with us because we're going to watch this sum up here after a couple quick breaks, including this one. Whether it's on the road or in the pool, your activity has high demands. Rooted in sweat and grounded in science, we understand your unique fueling needs. That is why we created formulas just for you, endurance athletes, helping you replace what you're losing and keeping you fueled. And there's nowhere we'd rather be than with you along this journey, because together we are formulated for farther. From the creators of Gatorade, Gatorade Endurance, formulated for you, formulated for farther. Magnus Ditlev from Denmark chasing down Ben Hoffman from the USA. Both men extremely strong. Both men getting into that final, we'll say, 11, 10 or 11 kilometers of this race. Uh, they're going to give us about 30, 35 minutes, we'll say-ish, uh, perhaps 40 minutes of racing still. That's what they're going to give us. We're going to enjoy every minute of it. And uh, predictions now lay where you could be right or I could be right. I called Ben, you called a rookie. So uh, we'll find out who has to buy that athletic brewing beer for the other uh, for, a, for a nice, I don't know, midday celebration. But great stuff. I any insight for us at this point? Well, you know, we talked a lot about experience, mm -hmm. how, you know, one has a lot of experience, one has zero experience. The experience is like he's got to answer in the now where someone like Ben can go, well, you know what? I've been here before. I know exactly what I need to do to get myself to the finish. I know how to win an Ironman. Um, but then you've got someone who's young, who's someone who's very capable, has done a very scientific approach with his coach to the training, You'll see that Magnus Ditlev is really checking the pacing on his clock. And then when you look at Ben Hoffman, he's going by feel. He's yeah. going by perceived effort. Yeah. You know, that's the big difference. It's like someone like Magnus Ditlev, yeah, he knows what the training numbers have told him what he can go, but he hasn't done it. He hasn't had that perceived effort of what it feels like to do that. Yeah, and he doesn't, no matter what, you never actually know what that last five Five miles, we'll say, feel like the last eight k uh, at the end of a uh, at the end of They're 140 gonna, Your quads are going to probably be yelling at you. We, it's you like, and I know what it feels yeah. like, uh, and and uh, it's 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 naive to think he's not prepared for it, but it's certainly appropriate to it's say be that. Be a big ape on your back. Could be a anything. gorilla on your uh, quads. 
Yeah, it's the fun part of the race here for for commentators, spectators, your friends mind and family. is willing, your body's not able, all that fun stuff. All that stuff uh, that we've seen throughout the last uh, couple decades, three, four, five, four and a half decades of racing. Uh, I tell you what, though, you know who has the advantage? Mm -hmm. It's like everyone knows who Ben is. That's true. You know, he's definitely he's American. He, everyone knows in triathlon who Ben. Hoffman is, and then you got somebody who's an up and comer. So the advantage, like in the future, yeah. you know, everyone's going to be yelling his name. But right now, I'm telling you, a lot of those people on course are going to know who Ben is, mm -hmm. and you can use that to your advantage. But then, if you're someone like Matt and Lib, you can go, you know what? I'm going to prove these people wrong. That's right. I'm going to turn it around. You know what? I've already faced adversity today. Let me show them. Let me show them. You know, I may be young. This may be my first ever Ironman, but I can be as tough as anyone else out in the course. Yeah, that's right. All that is correct. And we're seven hours and 19 minutes, almost seven hours, 20 into this race here that they call the Memorial Hermann Ironman, Texas. Uh, this race been going on since 2011. And uh, we're so happy to be back with professional men, professional women vying for Kona slots, two on each side. Ben Hoffman, the man on camera, is the only one who possesses uh, that uh, that Kona slot. But this is no longer 20 seconds. This is the kind of thing where Ben is about to realize that Ditlev is with him. Uh, ben off into the shade, tucked in, where Ditlev is, is gaining. So right now, this is a massive fuel giver. If you're Ditlev and you're sitting there and you're seeing every step a touch closer, you're gaining energy. Uh, what could be fun here is if they link up and that what was 12 seconds <laughs> at 19 miles is going to be for this final 10K shoulder to shoulder and perhaps a little bit of uh, uh, back and forth. Let's see. Now definitely right now, if you and I were in this situation, I'm thinking I would be right where Magnus is because he's got the energy from Ben. He's yeah. sucking that energy. Ben doesn't realize because he's oblivious to it unless he looks over his shoulder. But it's like these two are, are running very similar paces. He, so, he's feeling and, and I And I sort of like that Magnus is being patient. Yeah, you got to be and patient. And that's what Iron Man's about is being patient. So f for me, that's like, ooh, a thumbs up. Like being smart out there, sticking to the plan, you know, not trying to like creep up too soon. But that could also fall against you because if all of a sudden Ben starts to get on a little bit more of a roll – and definitely the crowd is going to help Ben to know how close somebody is back yeah. because that's what you're going to listen to because you really don't want to look back and see. And, yeah, you have some U-turns uh, on the course that you'll be able to see. But, you know, that verbal communication that you're going to get from the crowd is really, really going to help the front runner in this situation. Absolutely. And, he, and here, when Ben hears, good job, guys, and he knows that he's right there, uh, the plural. But, but look, aid station, here's what, here's what I'm going to say. The two, there's two strategies that I'm going to throw out there. One is for Ben and one is for uh, Magnus. If I'm Magnus in this situation, I sit, I lurk, I linger, I collect myself, and then with everything I have, I, I, run, <laughs> I run through and I try to detach. That's, but that's, what you, that's what he did on the bike. Exactly. You do that's the same exactly thing. exactly what Magnus did on the bike. You know, he caught the leaders. He sort of stayed Ooh, comfortable. Lauren Brandon. So we're getting lapping Laura Brandon. Great to see her on camera. So it's nice to see how wonderful she looks running. She looks fantastic in second place here uh, for, yeah, for the women. she looks really good. And then let's talk about this as they come together. Again, if I'm capable of it, even if I'm not, a bluff tactic. If I'm Ben Hoffman and I've just been caught, the only move I have is as soon as he's on your shoulder, take off. And everything you have, because the thing that get the only thing that can get in the head of a chaser is when you catch and then you can't pass. Because that's the only thing that stops you, because you've got all the momentum. And you know See, we, I, I totally disagree. I have what? to I have to disagree. Because if I was running behind and I caught up to someone and then they decided to burn some matches, I'd be like, sucker, you burnt some matches. And, you know, obviously they've been pretty close all day yeah. long on the run. Here he goes. There's no doubt about it. So, Here goes Ditley. And yeah. look, I'll reference uh, Chris McCormack when he got caught by Raylert in the Ironman World Championship, and he, he gamed him. 
He didn't take off right away, but he let him know how strong he was, and then he ran away. Here's what we've got. We've got two men together at last. They hadn't seen each other really all day. The only time they were nearby was when Ben passed uh, Dietlev on the side of the road getting a flat tire changed. Ben, a fighter. Dietlev, a fighter. The rookie versus the veteran. Now it's playing out just as we talked about as we cut away briefly here with some technical change-ups to see Jocelyn McCauley. And we'll get right back with you, I promise. Uh, but just to create a little unintentional drama, uh, we've we've uh, we've stepped away. But but look, I, and that's the thing. Like I present my strategy. It's the only thing. It's what I lob up there. And this again is the is the beauty of it. I don't think there's a right or wrong. It's it's like we're all so different, and um, you're always trying to do your best. I also think that in three miles, both of these guys are going to feel something different than they do right now. No, physically. And, and you're sort of going to be like sort of gambling as well, like. Okay, I'm feeling good. He's feeling good. It's like, at what point is that going to go away? And and when you actually get to that winning position, you're going to get that little extra motivation, and you're going to see who who wants to to dig. And you know, it's a little bit like Josh Jocelyn McCauley right now. It's like obviously we feel that her form is slightly off compared to what we normally see her, but you know, she's in the lead. Yeah. It's much easier to keep that momentum going if you're winning the race than if you're behind the race. That's right. And now, as we see on a narrow path, Ben was in front through some of those turns. They're shoulder to shoulder, but one trying to take the lead over the other just to get through these narrow uh, segments. Uh, but remember this, there is still quite a bit of racing to be done. So even though these guys are together, we got to kind of navigate our way through. 24 years old on the right, almost 39 years old on the left, 15 years spread between these guys. And this is what I love about triathlon. Look at the physiques. They're so opposite in so many ways. And this is what I love about triathlon. You know, it's not really one physique that's going to, like, tell you who's going to win. Um, or age. Physique or age. Or age. Or age. Like, I, was, the, yeah. I was getting to age yeah. for sure. Yeah. I mean, Or yeah. experience level. I mean, yeah. it really is. It's a unique thing where everybody's equal out there in a lot of ways or everybody's capable of the same uh, sort of results. So uh, this is exciting. If you're a fan of the sport and you're not tuned in here to watch this battle, uh, you're missing out. Dietlev kind of at this point taking that subservient role, which could have more power, right? The secondary role behind. It could be a powerful position. Again, coming back to the but brain. Ben's and the, doing a power play right now. And that, and this is where I, I also agree with this because, like, here's here's one thing that, um, Locke, as, D, as Dietlev tries to come around, here's one thing that happens for a lot of athletes. When you're in front, you get a massive boost. Like, some athletes cannot stand to even give an inch. They gain so much energy uh, from being in front, so you'll do everything to stay there. But then tactically, I look at it, if I was racing in this situation and I move up to one someone's shoulder and they want to be in the front, I'm like, okay, be in the front. I will, like, gather, you know, my energy level, be patient, and then decide when I'm going to make a move. But, you know, some people, they just never want to give it away. Yeah. I mean, you see it so many times in, in, in events, like – you'll see somebody come up to the shoulder and the other person's got to like up you a little bit. Yeah. And then they come up to the shoulder again and they've got to keep upping and upping and upping. And one thing we know about these two athletes is they are front runners. Yeah. I mean, the whole plan, it looked like for Magnus Ditlib today was to get on the front, get a lead off the bike and see how he was in the marathon. Unfortunately, it almost worked to plan. Yeah. But, you know, he lost a lot of time and, you know, he's having the race race right now. When you look at it, yeah, Ben, we know, is a fantastic athlete. But right now, I'm impressed by Magnus. The fact For that sure. he lost all that time, he hasn't given up. I mean, it's amazing that he can still be in a winning position in this quality of a field. Uh, you're totally right, and I still hold that. Like, when first or second place, he's still my, my moment of the day because he rallied, and we talked about, is he going to rally? And he, here's the thing, as I lay down my argument, um, one of the two people at the booth here is the winningest or at least one of the winningest triathlon <laughs> triathletes in the history of the sport. So clearly, if anyone's voting for a tactic, the one McKeely is lobbing up there is a lot better than mine because uh, that's who she is. She's had not just a silver medal Olympics, but multiple wins. I do believe the last time I checked, you had more wins than pretty much anyone. 
Uh, there were maybe maybe you got a couple people in there with you, but on the women's side, anyway, kudos there. Your strategy is better than mine. Now we're on the bridge. Cro- am I right? We're crossing over Ben Hoffman, a slight advantage over Magnus Ditlieb. This is the kind of racing that we love to see. This is what gets us back to the edge of the seat at the end of uh, eight, almost eight hours of racing. The battle for first. That's what we're calling this one appropriately. Yeah, it's definitely a battle right now, and it's not just going to be a battle of their physical ability. It's going to be a a battle of their mental ability, that's for sure. For sure. Then Jesper Svensson uh, is actually now in third place in front of Cody Beal. So these two characters, although they're eight and ten minutes back, we got to sing their praises as well. Cody Beal's coming in here also off of a COVID setback this spring. Um, He is excelling. He's only ridden his bike five times outside. Uh, That probably affected his bike ride, but it's certainly not affecting his run. Um, Exciting stuff. And then we do still have Trevor Foley, the young upstart, uh, from USA that's that's running is still quite well and has himself firmly planted in fifth place. Uh, still a rookie, only his sixth triathlon, apparently. Wow, that's two, fantastic. Two on that for a second. Yeah. <laughs> and he's a pro, and he's in yeah. fifth place. Uh, but uh, but none the, or nonetheless, we're, uh, we're getting ready to, to tell you something. Jocelyn McCauley leading the race. Two men out front, Ben Hoffman and Magnus did leave some exciting action and Lauren uh, Brandon, all eight minutes back, while Danielle Lewis is a, is a further ten minutes back from her, eleven minutes back, and then uh, and then uh, we're gonna give you this a little bit more action in a couple minutes. Stay with us. We will be right back. As we drop right back in on this exciting marathon, the three-lap Hoka run course here, uh, we are still with two men tight, and the discussion on camera, off camera, on the mic, off the mic, is only who's going to win, who have you got. Uh, the, the end result uh, is that <laughs> we have no idea, nor do you, but we will say this, Magnus Delave impressing us by coming back from a flat tire and getting himself into position to win. Ben Hoffman kind of coming in here saying, I'm not sure, you know, how it's going to go in here, excelling at first uh, position on the day. So exciting racing uh, for sure. And uh, yeah, okay, that's good to hear. So I'm getting some updates. But look, the the reality is, uh, Dietliff is trying to make a break on this point, and we'll see if this sticks. He's trying to put a little pressure. I wouldn't do that to Ben Hoffman myself because, again, the, pr- the <laughs> here's the danger of that. You've got five miles to go. You make a break on the guy that knows how to how to freaking run a 236 and, and win some Ironmans. Who, who do you think has the upper hand? Now you've just handed the power back, don't you think? I don't know if you've handed the power back. Uh, I think definitely you might be testing the waters. <laughs> let's see. Let's see what he's got. You know, and it's. As I said, you know, when you're in a winning position and you've got two athletes in a winning position and you've got one experience, one who's not experienced at Ironman races, but very scientific. He knows how fast and how hard he can go. He's been constantly looking at his watch where you've got Ben, who's one of the hardest trainers and yeah. big mileage guys at all, in the entire professional men's field. And he has the experience. He knows what it feels like to push and run, like you said, uh, a really, really fast marathon. And, you know, you said you wouldn't, like, test him out. I go, at some point, you got to, like, show your yeah. cards a little bit and go, okay, Ben, let me see how you're feeling. You know, obviously, I've caught up to you. There was a reason why I caught up to you. It's like I don't feel like you were slowing down. But, you know, it's going to be interesting to see because 
the last five miles is still the last five miles. I still hold with this. I'm still betting on Ben, and here's why. I also remember that in two weeks, there's an Ironman World Championship that Ben wants to win. There's a slight part of me that thinks he's just, well, adios. He's just holding back and saying, you know what? I'm in charge. I'm a, I still want to make a statement, but maybe I don't want to bury myself. I, I don't know. This is too good. To have these surges, Ben is not – I think Ben has this one, and it's going to be by 10 seconds or two minutes. That's my prediction. <laughs> <laughs> Good. I like it. You know, you you're putting, put yourself, your, you're putting yourself way out yeah, there. That's it. But, you know, it's interesting. Like right now, it's like I feel they're not being patient. Neither yeah. one of them are being patient right now. You know, I think the testosterone is getting to them. They're like not thinking with their brain right now. Well, that of course but, not. They're but men. what I they're love boys. about it is they're putting it on the line. <laughs> yes. Me I mean, too. that's what's exciting. The fact that they're not going to settle in and go, hey, let's see who's going to win this. And we're just going to run side by side. No, let's make this a race. Yeah. And, you know, that's that's not an easy decision when you're racing an Ironman. And, you know, one definitely has to have more confidence than the other. Yeah. Because we know Ben can <laughs> can run. And uh, we, we know he's gutsy. But then you've got somebody who's young, inexperienced, but very well trained. Yeah. It's like, it's like a toss of the coin. Like you're saying, Ben, I'm saying... You know what? Magnus doesn't know what it's like to no. be in this situation. And the fact that he's already overcome the issue on the bike sure. and he's made it to the front. It's like, to me, that's good character. That's sure. telling you something that you need. That's telling you that you're a winner yeah. right there. The attitude, the fact that he, you know, he was frustrated when we saw it happen. Who would be? The, but the fact that he got back his head in the game. Yeah. And, you know, these both these guys have their head in the game. He, and that's why I'm excited to see totally, what happens. Totally. So here's my here's my new here's my new <laughs> here's my new assessment. Ben Hoffman in a sprint, and I am now Magnus Ditlave's biggest new fan because I totally agree with everything you said. Like what a what an incredible like basically uh, Magnus Ditlev is 24 years old, and he's coming in here as an iron rookie and 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 pushing it to like this. He, he he is going to be someone that I will root for and be behind. And and I'm not saying he's not going to win. I just think Ben Hoffman has this. Like this guy right here, he's going to come in. He's going to control. He said, "All right, I'm going to test you." You responded. You tested me. I responded. And then when it comes down to it, it's going to be one of those really painful sprint finishes to watch. And Ben's going to kick it in. I don't know. He, yeah, so that's what I think. You know, and I like the fact that after this, Marcus is going to have a beer and uh, a milkshake. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Oh, for sure. I hope so. What's going on here in the woodlands? This is what I'm talking about. This is where we party as uh, uh, Ironman fans. That was Hippie Hall is what we're calling that, and that is some serious action. Facebook fan Sean uh, McElveen is is commenting with us that the last 5K is going to be interesting, and I agree with you, uh, 100. percent And uh, th this it does look like if you had to look at the face, either Z either Ben has an incredible poker face, or well, he's, he's got glasses fine. on too. I think he's look at his lips, look at his mouth. He's just like this, whatever. And Diddley <laughs> is grimacing and groaning. <laughs> McKeely, it's you and there's me, no arm wrestle there's, time. There's no bias in commentary. Remember <laughs> no. that? There's no oh, bias. I'd be happy for either one. I'm, I have to make a stand. No, uh, I, I like it. I like the fact that, you know, you are, like, searching deep into your soul to say that Ben already has it in in, in the bag. But yeah. I'm saying, I don't know. Yeah, you're From right. what I can see, it's like neither one wants to give up right now. Yeah, that's, that's And true. that's the point that we're waiting for, right? That point where... One person goes, you know what? This is as much as I've got today. And, you know, it's not always like, oh, it was the person that dug the deepest. It's also the person that, you know what, just had the better effort on the day. Mm -hmm. so, no, it's great. And and as I and said. And it's exciting. How exciting is, exciting is this? It is. And, and to me, you know, we've seen, we saw Magnus get eight at, at St. George, Ironman 70.3 World Champs last fall. That. That was just a taste. He didn't have a great, he didn't have, I think, his best race. This, I am a fan, and, like, I'm a fan of the sport, but I think this guy, to come in here, I, I said this when I thought he was, I mean, I didn't know what he was going to do. The move of the day, it's, it's like you talk about your favorite moment. His comeback is my favorite moment because 
it is so hard. It shows incredible mental strength to just say, you know what? That was not according to plan. That was a bad luck, absolutely horrible mechanical. That was terrible. Now I've got to come back and fight and figure out how to race how I would have. Because you know what some people do? They max out and try and make the time back immediately. He didn't do that. He raced appropriately. So still still a huge fan, and I'm enjoying this show uh, down to the end. That woman who's talking on the phone, she didn't even know the two, two superstars just ran by her. <laughs> and then here we are, the women's race. You know, you were talking about experience she's got lots of experience on this course you know she's gutsy you know it's like she never gives an inch and she's patient and i mean i think that's right now the difference in the front of the race like who's being the most patient who's really being smart about how much energy and how many matches i need to burn because every time these guys challenge every each other that's taking a piece of you so who's going to have more matches at the end of this battle? Totally. I mean, Joshin McCauley has been awesome all day long, just super steady. And, you know, she can continues to lead the race and progress at a rate faster than every other competitor out there. And, I mean, she, and that's the nice thing that I love about Iron Man. It's no taking it easy. No. You dial in your pace, you settle in it, and off you go. Yeah, that's it. That is it. Um, and now side by side on a nice wide path, the fellas giving each other a little space. Ben Hoffman has a half a step advantage over Magnus Dietlieb. These two doing battle, they promised us <laughs> that they will give us a show and that's what we've got. We'll see the rest of the show here in a couple seconds. That looks like a cool event to go to Rwanda. But right now we are here in in uh, the woodlands of Texas at the Memorial Hermann Ironman, Texas. We're watching the battle for first as we are rolling into the uh, closing stretch here. A whole lot of bike path between them and that red carpet and Mike Riley's uh, silky smooth tones as he calls them across the finish line. Uh, but here's the story, uh, McKeeley. We've got Magnus in front in this position. In this moment, he's in the front position. Ben Hoffman tucked in behind him. Little gap, probably, uh, you know, uh, a half a foot. Just as I said that, Ben is getting right into the heels of Magnus. I feel like I'm watching a track race in some ways because this is tactics that you do. You tuck in, you get real annoying on their feet, and you just kind of sit there. Uh, but, but either way you cut it, these guys are going to make a hard right turn. Legs are firing, but I don't think they feel any of that. They're just kind of th th going on that adrenaline, that competitive uh, drive. Here comes that hippie hollow we talked about. And uh, please avert your eyes if you see any nudity. No, just great racing. Just great racing. Great <laughs> racing. But, you know, it's, it's interesting how they keep switching, switching the lead. And the pace... Oh. Okay, that, that's probably a telltale sign right there, the fact that Ben's like, ben I'm, hit I'm, the bongo. I'm in a party mood. I feel good. And you can see the pace is slowed down. Yes. It's definitely slowed down. It's like they're not rolling along like they were when they were chasing each other. Yes. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens when we really, really get down to those final miles. And we're getting really, really close at some point. Someone's going to say, this is mine. I'm going to go for it. Win, lose, or draw. Uh, can I just say this as well, as I, I totally agree with your, your commentary here. Uh, from one Ironman Africa champion to another, uh, Kyle Buckingham is shouting out via Facebook, 
uh, Ben for the win, go my man. And that's kind of cool to see. It's a camaraderie of this sport. Uh, each of those men have won in Port Elizabeth and the, a beautiful race there, Nelson Mandela Bay. So great stuff, Kyle. Good race. Uh, man, great race. So fun a couple weeks ago. And uh, kudos to you uh, for that victory. And um, as we come back, here we are uh, watching um, Ben Hoffman uh, just – you know, I think showing us a little bit of levity, a little bit of lightheartedness when he hit that bongo, but also a little bit of confidence. Um, and I think to to echo some commentary, Julie Dibbins, an uh, extraordinary athlete and coach out on course, when she saw him run by, she said, man, it looks like he's just playing with him. Like he looks, Ben looks like he's jogging. And, and that bongo drum uh, moment, it could, it, it kind of echoed that. But uh, still some good battles to be had here between these two. Let's see it. No, definitely, it's it's going to be a scene to stay tuned for. That's for sure. And you know, it's it's interesting because you know we really don't know how each of them f is feeling, and is Ben as focused as Magnus? Well, some people would say, well, you know, he got caught up in the moment, moment, the energy, but he's feeling good. Yep. So maybe it's sort of like that cockiness that he's like, you know what? You think you're running hard. <laughs> I'm just going to go and play the bongos. Oh, my word. Oh, my word. Um, yes, I'm, play <laughs> I'm playing the drums here. Uh, anyway, looking at this race, I'm excited. I love it when we get a good late game shoulder to shoulder. We've seen it a few times here. We've seen some epic runs. Matt Hansen uh, lighting the world on fire in a couple of his great runs and his victories here. And uh, obviously last year's champ, Nielsen. Just across the board, people bring uh, the goods here. So, I love seeing that. Right now, I have to agree that Ben's just kind of bottling it up, getting ready to uncork one. Um, but but remember this. Sprint finishes, at the end of an Ironman, ugly anyway. But but sprint sprinting isn't something that just everyone can do. You know what I mean? No, you're, you're exactly right. <laughs> no, no, it's true. It's true. It's, it's true. like not everyone no. has a sprint no. finish. And, you know, that's the thing about an Ironman. We saw a ridiculous sprint finish at 70.3 California. <laughs> For yeah. second and third. Like for second and third. This yeah. is for first and second right now. Yeah. And it's like, it was amazing. You had two athletes that weren't willing to give an inch. So it's going to be really, really interesting to see who's going to give an inch right now. You know, when is that tactically going to happen? And, you know, some athletes like a little bit longer sprint, if you can call an Ironman a sprint at the end. Um, and some athletes like a little bit shorter and, you know, in that moment, you know, when you're sprinting in an Ironman, you know, the risk of getting a cramp if you accelerate really, really fast is significant. But yeah. it's But it's but it's also like your brain may be willing, but your yes. body's not able. Yes. And that's really what it's going to come down to because you may want it just as much as the next person. Yeah, but, but your calves might but not. But that doesn't mean <laughs> like after all this yeah. time, we can't control what how our body's yeah. going to respond. and. That's what makes Ironman so challenging, right? Because there's no guarantee you're going to get to the finish line. I mean, we've seen it so many times that, you know, people yes. are right there and something yes. major happens. Yes, So Correct. it's one of those things where people say, oh, it's going to be the, the guy that wants it the most. And it's like, in an Ironman, I don't believe in that. No, they both want it it's, the most. It's a, little, both, bit, yeah. it's, it's it's, a little bit it's, of fate yeah. and yeah. how the body's going to respond. Yeah, that no, those are good. Those are good points. Those are excellent points. And because I'm telling you, at the end of a long run, are you sprinting? Is it who do you know that is going to sprint? I mean, when we used to do a tempo run, yeah. the last mile. Yeah. So yeah, that's definitely going to help you in this situation yeah. if you do that. But a lot of athletes don't do that for their long runs because your risk of a muscle fiber tear is significant at the end of a long run because you're muscular fatigued and you're getting dehydrated. For sure. And that's how these are, athletes are right now. They've been racing for over seven hours. Seven hours, 49, 47 minutes. Yeah. yeah. So they've got to be fatigued. doesn't matter how much training you've, you've done. And yeah. the fact that, you know, the muscle fibers I actually aren't think at this working point, like uh, they normally yeah. do. I think a good move at this point, too, after an aid station, I think a, a safe move as well is we'll call it the Blumenfeld sprint. I mean, in the Olympics, right, he put a sprint that was was not inside the sprint zone and he and he he put a power sprint like it was a closing strength. And uh, of course, the speed was amazing. But the point being, it, he didn't leave it to the 
anaerobic power of the final you know 100 meters he he said i'm going to break a lot earlier than you'd expect and i think if one of these men had the the understanding of the course and also the the gps and and could say this is when i make that move it's it's kind of like that could win it and it could be tactically because we just saw what happened you know we're coming up on some age group athletes they're unaware of what's happening in, behind them mm-hmm. and you saw ben actually had to like slow down and go behind magnus and you know if we get close to the finish line and there's a lot of other athletes around that could also influence mm-hmm. how this, of the outcome great of the race. Point. Yeah, great point. Just, yeah, like even here, you know, he's got to go behind because there's two abreast on the age group side. Either way, there's still a little wiggle room here and uh, still a little bit of uh, a racing runway to get uh, to get to that red carpet. And then uh, as we talk about some of these turns, I still feel, <laughs> I still feel like that every time I see uh, Ben, it just he just looks comf, you know what I mean? And two... 18 they're talking about four minutes they should be crossing the uh the 25.4 mile mark so uh so four minutes and then and then uh, i mean they've got a mile to go so inside of uh inside of about six minutes six and a half minutes we're going to have a a decision made and a and a victor crowned and i hope mike riley is ready uh I know he's ready. He's been waiting for this for a while. Looking back in the field, how about that? We now see Svensson in third, Beals in fourth, and uh, out of uh, po- out of Poland, Shala has now moved into uh, into fifth with Foley slipping back a bit. Iron Man has a way of doing that to you, but uh, the young uh, upstart is still in a great position for his uh, first Iron Man. Yeah, and the women's race. Uh, Jocelyn McCauley is still obviously in in the lead. You know, they're approaching 18 miles. Lauren Brandon is hanging in really, really well. Daniel Danielle Lewis is actually losing some time. Uh, Ryder is being steady all day, and there's going to be a battle with Danielle. So it's going to be a Ryder and Lewis battle, I, I think, for sure, for that final podium position. That's right. There you go. And uh, so seeing the Polish athlete roll into the top five, kind of interesting stuff, kind of looking at his uh, credentials. He's another one that has come in here with no professional Ironman finishes, a whole host of 70.3s, but definitely having a breakthrough day today. Um, As we come back, noting that we're probably about five minutes away uh, at this point from a men's finish, we will crown a champion today. Uh, Will it be an eight-time champion in Ben Hoffman or a first-time champion in Magnus Ditlev? The answer coming soon to you all. And remember, at the closing stretch of this Hoka run course, it does get a little bit tasty. You have to wrap around, uh, do a hard bending right, and then a sharp right before sharp left, and then the finish shoot. It's a lot of turns if you hear that. What I said was... Uh, right, right, left, right. That's four turns in that final probably 500 meters. Tasty stuff is in front of us here, MJ. And and here's some food for thought. Okay, if this is going to be a flat-out sprint for an Ironman in semicolons, it's like I think the younger athlete is going to have a little bit more fast twitch (laughs) fires than the older athlete. I'm just saying. I think, you know, just hey, putting who, it out there. who knows? Who knows? It's uh, some of that fast twitch sticks around. It might pay. It might, <laughs> it might have to pay for using it. But let's give a little credit here to Jocelyn McCauley, who appears to almost be erasing some of that limp as well. So I hope we get a little question to her at the finish line and say, you OK? Uh, I know she's running great. But did you see that? A very awkward move down that those steps, which is an awkward thing to have to do anyway. In an uh, Ironman. In an Ironman. Sure. Um, you know, Any time that you got to lift your feet really high off the ground Mm. which a step is in an iron man it's like you know everything's getting tight your hamstrings are tight your glutes are tight the lower back is getting Mm -hmm. tight so you know when you're doing a long run you know it's bad enough and then you put like a swim and a bike and then the marathon and then try to step up on onto those sort of steps it's tough yep yep it's really tough super tough i mean i i feel like you know turkey making those right turns or stuff right you know like well it you know it changes your rhythm yes and you know as yeah. we talked about you know rhythm and being constant yeah. all day is what your body likes i mean let's face it in everyday life your heart likes to beat at a steady rate yeah and the fitter you are the more it hates to get that heart rate up because obviously you have a lower heart rate so then as you're pumping blood, it's obviously a little thicker. 
So that's why it takes so long to warm up the fitter you get. I don't know. I think these guys are warmed up. I think they're primed and ready. Last little hit of aid station as they come in for that final uh, kick to the finish line, be it a sprint or a kick or or even just a strong oomph. Uh, these guys are almost there. Crossing over here, they're going to do this wraparound right. And then it is, again, one more challenging thing to navigate was that. And then after they've, uh, they've done that, um, that curve around, they're going to have to go um, straight shot and then they're going to turn right and they're going to be up into the finish zone. They're going to hear the sounds. They're going to hear the music. Um, they're going to hear everything coming uh, coming at them from, from that finish line. And it's going to be exciting. Anyway, you talk about it. I think we're going to be uh, falling out of our chairs here when we get there, McKeely. And and it is still, by my estimation, uh, they both look to have maybe backed off a tiny bit and staying shoulder to shoulder. But I really feel like from what we saw Ben's run form earlier, he does just look to be jogging. Like he just like look, he looks like he's just caged animal there, ready to let loose some punches. And I don't think it's mind games. I think it's just like a physical, a uh, little bit of a physical store, and then boom, un unleash, kind of let the cannon fire. So we'll see. As uh, as I've no doubt the athletes running the other way are wondering the same thing. What on earth is going on? <laughs> Well, you know, it's in strategy. You've got to think about, okay, I'm already fatigued. We've already ran so many miles. It's like strategy is definitely playing in it. We've definitely seen the pace drop off. There's no yeah. doubt about it. I mean, they're just, they're, their turnover isn't as quick as it was. And, you know, Ben's definitely got a different technique than Magnus when it comes to the run, being a, a little bit shorter in stature. So it's really deceptive sometimes when you go, well, that person looked like it had a much higher cadence and they look like they're running faster, even though they're running the same speed. So is it strategy that let's conserve a little bit and then whoever's willing to go is willing to go? And that's what it seems to be right now. You know, it's a waiting game. They sort of tested each other out to see what they had. You saw... Ben challenged Magnus. You saw Magnus challenge Ben quite a few times. So at this point in the race, what are you thinking? Well, you're thinking, okay, in training, what can I visualize that I actually went hard, that I actually can physically and mentally focus on and go, you know what, in training, I just went from this point to this point. Is That's how what I would be thinking. I'd be like thinking in my head, okay, I had this run route and I'll just visualize going from hard to that point to the finish. That's how I would be handling it mentally right now. Rather than thinking about anything else, it'd be like, okay, at what point am I going to decide? Am I going to wait for them and respond? Or am I going to be the one that's going to make them respond? Because right now, each of them are making each other respond. Magnus takes the front step here as we come into the final couple turns. A right turn is what you're about to see. As these athletes make that, it'll be a final straight stretch, a left turn, and then into essentially the finish shoot. This, the 2022 Memorial Hermann Ironman Texas, is almost to its conclusion point. Mike Riley must have been indicated, been told that these guys are coming in hot. Magnus making his break already. You can see it, the early sprint, looking over his shoulder. And this, my friends, is all about tactics. He's gone for it, and he's saying, did I make it stick? Guess what? You did not. Hoffman on the shoulder, and you can see a response. But check it, folks. There are a lot of turns to make still, and neither one of these men is going to give up at all, not an inch at this point. Folks from Denmark getting crazy. Folks from the USA equally so, but it's the last stretch before we have a hard right turn. MJ, we're down to what we call a sprint finish at the end of an Ironman. Who goes high? Who goes low? Ben Hoffman for the win at this point. He's off, and Magnus is hurting. This is what you talked about. The mind is willing. The body says no, and it's Hoffman broken the elastic today. Ben Hoffman making the final right, accelerating. Ouch, this is what we waited for. Magnus broken, but so close. And now we get to turn it to the finish shoot. Ben Hoffman well played. And I tell you what, folks, that does not feel good to the body, but it sure feels good to the heart.
Ben Hoffman, your champion today. Memorial Hermann, Ironman, Texas. What a day. And and here we are, absolutely shelled. What a show. Magnus Dietlieb, I love this guy because he was down on the side of the road with a flat tire. And this Dane has come back in his first Ironman and nearly won the race. What a show. I guarantee you that left a mark. Definitely left a mark on, on both of them right now, but congratulations to Ben Hoffman, the 2022 Memorial Hermann Ironman Texas race. Definitely, you know, he he showed that uh, young blood is good, but a little bit more experience, a little bit older is, uh, is the winning move. And he certainly had a winning move today. You know, it, it was Magnus that sort of like threw down the gauntlet the last little bit. But, you know, the, the turns really su su suited Ben today. I felt like he knew the course a little bit better than Magnus today. And it's like you saw, you know, that cramping, that ex fast acceleration that we talked about. You know, who was going to be the one that could overcome that? R really, the second victory today was who got up off the ground <laughs> first because, ouch, that was brutal. And I tell you what. I'm so happy for those two guys because they got something that you don't often get in this sport, a true head-to-head. -head. And 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 I think you're right, McKeeley, just knowing those turns, I didn't know there was a 180 at the very end. I thought that was a straight shot. And so that was obviously kind of the, the second nail in the coffin, if you will. Uh, the first one was just you could see the way you painted the picture 40 minutes ago. His mind said, go. And as soon as he said go on that, on that, say, third effort, his legs just, they stopped. And so it was not a question of heart. It was not a question of want. It just happened that the muscles were done. What a show, folks. Uh, you don't get to see that very often. And we are soon going to get to get the interview uh, from our very own Mike Riley. You guys will get that as soon as we're ready. But I tell you what, uh, we're not going anywhere. Some folks asked earlier. We're going to stick around through the conclusion of the top three women. And of course, ah! finish line magic. You took the collective breath out of everybody here. And watching you sprint around Magnus with just yards to go around the corner, I, I honestly, it looked like you were an 800 runner. What'd you have? How'd it come out of you that fast? Well, first of all, I want to just say a huge congrats to Magnus. I wasn't, I wasn't making you all hold your breath. It was both of us. And, uh, yeah, I mean, that took a lot more than I, than I expected. I mean, Magnus, debut Ironman, hats off to him, incredible race. Uh, yeah, I was just, you know, I was lucky to have a little experience here. I knew the finishing shoot. I've been here in 2015. It was pretty ugly. I finished eighth and blew up in the heat, but I wanted to get some redemption, and today was that, so I'm happy to take the win, and uh, now it's time to recover and get ready for St. George. Well... How do you think this race, with what you did and how you had to pull deep down, is going to help you in St. George? Well, we'll find out in two weeks. It could be good or it could be bad. I feel like right now I'm, uh, you know, I'm fit and I'm in a good place mentally, and that's half the battle. So I'm going to ride the wave and go out there and, and just enjoy doing this. You know, I'm 38 years old. I've been doing it professionally for 15 or 16 years. And I just, I just have a tremendous sense of gratitude to be out here and to be healthy and to be able to push like this. So I'm looking forward to doing it again in two weeks, and I'll give everything I have in St. George. Well, Ben Hoffman, you thrilled us all. Congratulations. You're champion, everybody, Mr. Ben Hoffman. Tucson, Arizona. Vegas, debut Ironman. Not many people pull off what you did today on your very first Ironman. Did you think you were going to have to dig that deep to do what you did today? No, <laughs> this is the most... Uh, I've never been so tired in my whole life, I think. It was... Uh, <laughs> yeah, I had a puncture on the bike, so I had to wait for a new tire, and I thought my race was over there, but I <laughs> managed to run through it, and suddenly I could see Ben up the road, and we ran side by side, and that was just epic to be a part of. Well, it was epic, and to have that puncture, that flat tire out there, and have to come back, did you ever think about giving up? Yeah, so I had a moment, because the tire was all uh, exploded, so I couldn't put my spare tube in it, so I had to wait, 
for a brand new tire, so I didn't know when the mechanical support would come. I was just standing at the side of the road thinking what the fuck to do, but uh, yeah, then I waited and the mechanical support gave me a new tire and I finished the bike and started running and it felt very good, so yeah, I'm just really happy about how it went. Are you going to race any more Ironmans this year? <laughs> Uh, only, uh, I think I've qualified for Kona, so I might do that, but <laughs> right now I'm, yeah, <laughs> I can't imagine doing another one right now. Well, I'll tell you, Magnus, it's going to be something to even see you in Kona with the type of performance you have here. Let's hear it from Magnus Dudley. Congratulations. What a great, great day. Big thanks to Mike Riley coming to us straight from the Hyper Ice Recovery Zone. What a day. And I tell you what, they are absolutely going to want to recover well. Hyper Race is proud to be the official recovery partner of Ironman. Athletes can immediately start the recovery journey by visiting the Hyper Ice Recovery Zone located beyond the finish line. This area will be a critical stop on Ironman athlete journey today. Yeah, it's a critical stop for your recovery. That's for sure. And it's so nice that the athletes are going to have access to the hyper vaults. It's a percussion massage gun that relieves tension and stiffness. I love it. I use it every night. They'll also be able to demo the Normatec compression leg system. And then also a single session increases the blood flow. You're riding muscles of ridding your muscles of lactic acid and clearing the way for an accelerated recovery. And I like to do that and watch TV every night. I tell you what, that sounds pretty good. And uh, I'm thinking that the best thing those two guys can do, because they just did something epic. Of course, any Ironman's epic. But with that finish, is sit in those boots for uh, as long as they'll let them. You know what I mean? As <laughs> soon as they say, you guys got to go, we got more athletes. But well, especially someone like Ben, who's going to be yes. racing St. George. I in mean, two weeks, yeah. recovery is going to be key for him. So I'm sure he's. that's the first thing that he's going to be thinking about after he, he gets a little bit more settled. Yeah get straight into recovery. Uh, recovery. Yeah, he's probably only going to ride 100 miles next weekend just to <laughs> kind of dial it back. No, kidding aside, the champion, I love what he said, true gratitude for being healthy, out there and able to push it. And uh, I think that's fantastic. And it really speaks volumes to his character. Um, and, and just as I come in, I find this interesting. And we're going to go to the women for first. He, did you notice that Ben immediately talking about the race in two weeks? Whereas Magnus is like, I don't even know if I can race in Kona in October. Like, you know, that it just, and that's that point, I, I promise you in an hour or in 10 minutes or tomorrow, those answers are different. It's just the nature of Ironman. I but know how that feels when you you've know? done your first Ironman, you qualify for Kona. I go, don't talk to me about it. Don't even Don't talk to me up. about it. Just, yep. just enter me. Yep. That was it. I remember that. Ironman Florida 2005. That was your experience. Am I right? Yeah, yeah. you're exactly right. I'm a nerd. Here we go. Lauren Brandon in second place here looking completely fantastic she has a great stride some of the best running i've seen her do out there managing the heat running very well uh it's it's nice to see checking the watch getting the hydration making sure she keeps herself um in the game here as we saw joss mccauley who does have that nice lead still of uh 11 minutes um it, it's sort of still falls into the category you have to you hate to say it but anything is anything can happen so on one side anything is possible uh, on the other side anything can happen and and what i mean by that is uh, mckeely you brought it up we've seen people collapse with 400 meters to go so i wouldn't wish it on anyone but but you know um, we, we saw a lot of it in the men's race you know early correct. on it was very different to what happened later on and definitely those movers and shakers uh were definitely ones to watch and then all of a sudden some of those movers and shakers started falling off the pace um but these two athletes have been in control like i feel all day yes. like lauren brandon had a fantastic swim which we knew she would she's such a great swimmer she was solid on the bike she did a lot of riding by herself and then when jocelyn mccauley caught up to her she used a little bit of jocelyn's energy to stay with her but then jocelyn was just too solid on, on, on the rest of the bike course. And then we saw Jocelyn McCauley come into transition. Um, we felt like she was a little bit off in her stride, uh, like a hip or knee issue. Apparently she did fall down in transition. That's what we got told, but she's been steady. She again, hasn't let any of those things that we're seeing at interfere with what the job is. And the job is to whatever, 
race plan it was and whatever pacing, that's what she's been on. And, you know, she has been a little bit over the place with the pacing, but she's still been steady all day. Jesper Svensson representing Sweden, a two-time Ironman winner coming in to close out that podium. This man is an absolute champion. I mean, he's raced so well, typically makes his mark on the bike, a great runner as well, but he's holding off the likes of Cody Beals, who has made a late game, well, all marathon uh, surge, but here this, this potentially grabs that last Kona spot uh, should both of those two men go. Two for two, two for the women, two for the men, and, and uh, Jesper Svensson a great guy, great uh, personality, and certainly uh, kicking it in with a smile. And again, kicking it is relative, isn't it? He's <laughs> he's given the final oomph. Um, I'm one to talk. I've I've cramped across the finish line more more than I care to care to share with you. But McKeeley, what a great show for the Swede. I mean, superstar. No, he did great today. You know, he was a little bit further than behind than he probably thought he should have been know because he is such a strong bike but he sort of sat there having his own race mm -hmm. particularly on the marathon you know he was just steady he was patient he kept catching up and that's how he got on the podium and that's what it takes be consistent and have a solid run that's right he ran 251 p.s the fellas first and second 240 20 and 240 56 in the heat of the day. We're gonna rush on down to Mike Raleigh in the Hyper Ice Recovery Zone with the men's third place. He's there now and we're gonna pick him up here in a split second. I think we're actually gonna wait till fourth comes across. So uh, my mistake, Cody Beals, uh, fan favorite across the world. This guy uh, really rolled through and performed. And, and see, that just says it right there. First guy to get in and have that luxury of giving some high fives, he's not gonna miss it. A, a true social media fan favorite and a real life fan favorite, a game chase where he went and tried to get that podium slot. This guy ran 245.51. And again, down there in the Hyper Ice Recovery Zone, Mike Riley is going to pick up uh, third and fourth place for those interviews. So uh, great stuff. We'll get there soon enough. And I know you guys are excited to uh, to hear that. Um, but what what a, what a little s sort of superstar cast of characters, first through four so far. Well, look at the run times. Um, amazing. I mean, it's fantastic to see so many men running that quick. And here we're going to rush on down there now with Mike Riley in the Hyper Ice Recovery Zone. Third place right here, Memorial Herman, Ironman, Texas, Jesper Svensson. Jesper, you had a tough day at Ironman South Africa not long ago. But boy, what a redemption today because you had a strong ride and you kept it together on the run. You got to feel good about this. Yeah, it was, uh, yeah, it was a tough uh, swim. Uh, Varga and uh, Sam was uh, pushing the pace really hard, so I could not keep up with them. And then I was like in no man's land. And then when I was riding out on the course, I was like, oh shit, did I take a warm turn? So I turned back and then I was with uh, Ditlev, uh, with like, uh, yeah, out to the turnaround. And then I ride by myself to, till uh, Ben Hoffman was catching me. And then on the run, I learned from South Africa and I really need to pace. So I paced myself today really good, so. Well, it's a good pace because, you know, fourth place at a race like this, I mean, third place at a race like this is unbelievable. What a great field. So what's next for you? You, 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 you know, your first Ironman here this year uh, after South Africa. What's next for you? Uh, I don't know yet. I will uh, talk with my coach and uh, we will plan the rest of the summer. So, but uh, maybe Kalmar, Sweden. I've never done it, so home race. Good for you. I know. I was going to say, you got to do your home race. So what do you think about this, this Ironman Texas crowd out here? Uh, it was amazing. Uh, the guys with uh, had, uh, tr trumps and everything. It was really, really cool. And also like uh, the whole uh, volunteers, uh, everybody giving you eyes and stuff. So uh, big uh, applause to that also. Well, Jesper, you're welcome back to Texas anytime you want. What a great day. Let's hear from again, Jesper Svensson from Sweden. What a great finish for him to uh, take out that final spot on the podium. And we actually did get a couple of questions about the headbands that you see some of the athletes wearing. 
So they're actually another way to cool yourself. They're like an ice headband to regulate your core temperature to keep it down. And a lot of athletes also use them in, in at the Tokyo Olympics as well. So yeah, technology is uh, a wonderful thing and it's definitely helped uh, to get the athletes across the line, but it's also enabling them to go as fast as they can out there. And I tell you what, you thought what I did, probably folks out there in Facebook and, and YouTube, that it was just a fashion statement because uh, they look good too. But no, function follows that form. Here's what I'd like to say as we watch these two women crank it uh, across here. I'm going to let you kind of take a peek at these two uh, fantastic individuals. First place in the bottom right, Joss McCauley representing USA. Lauren Brandon in the upper left representing USA. Uh, these two battling it out, approximately 11 minutes between the two. However, both cranking along extremely well. Uh, this is this is you know really good racing for two women that both will qualify for Kona should they stay where they are, which appears likely. And look at Joanna Ryder. She actually is um, starting to catch up to Lauren. So Lauren right, well. needs to you know really keep moving forward. You know she's oh, had right. a so great a great race so far, but Definitely, uh, she is getting uh, close to losing that second spot on the podium. All right, let's uh, let's see. Yeah, we'll touch in with that because that's a good point. As I was kind of sealing that up, but uh, definitely close, and those those minutes dropping. So I tell you what, those of you that are sitting here like me, getting inspired by all this uh, great racing in the, in the amazing state of Texas, I want to give you one more chance if you're looking for a fast and fun Ironman course. Look no further than Ironman Waco. The course starts with a point-to-point -point downriver swim in the Brazos River before traversing the Texas countryside of rural Waco, ending in the historic Waco Suspension Bridge. Ironman Waco has a course profile that is guaranteed to shave minutes off your existing PR, and all the while you'll be treated to the warmth and charm of the Lone Star State. Do you have what it takes to conquer the Brazos? Of course you do. So head out there. It comes this fall, Ironman Waco. You can register today at ironman.com and i tell you what don't miss that chance because it's great and it comes up with pr pretty good weather there in the fall as well look at those happy customers coming across the line great stuff i think that's the best part about iron man the finish line yeah you yeah. know it's just that doesn't matter who you are there's always something about an iron man finish line and it doesn't matter who you are or if it's your first Ironman or your hundredth Ironman, it's just a very special feeling to cross that finish line. I agree. I agree. I think that's accurate. And I don't think it has everything to do with Mike Riley, but something to do with it. He's always there <laughs> saying your name. No, but it's special. I mean, you kind of join this, this, this very small family, a worldwide, percentage-wise, a very small group of people around the world that have completed an Ironman. As you start to chisel that down, um, it's, it's just special. You, you know, we all tackle it for different reasons, but I think in the end, everyone that does an Ironman, you may know you can do it, but you don't actually have proof until you do it, right? <laughs> you, you're like, I, I, I think I can do it. I know I can do it. I believe I can do it, but you really don't get that until you get through 140.6 miles. It's, it's a challenge like really no other, uh, that, uh, that you complete in a single day, um, that, that I think you learn about yourself physically, emotionally. It's just a great journey. So I think you're right. Finish line, pretty special. Yeah, and, you know, especially if you're a first-time Ironman finisher, you know, that's something very, very special. And, yeah. you know, then you sort of go, I get why people do this. Yeah, I get it. And, you know, there's never any guarantee. <laughs> and, you know, there's cutoff times. So everyone's yeah. got to make it across the finish line in a certain time. But, yeah, it's so many people have it on their bucket list. And, you know, it's bragging rights. There's no doubt about it. You know, you, you get to brag about it. You do, and I and I, I continue to brag about it whenever someone <laughs> asks me to. Uh, but we do get the opportunity to watch the podium celebration is coming up here real quick for these men. Uh, this will be the the top three of the 2020 Memorial Hermann Ironman uh, Texas. 2022. What did I say, 2020? I know we missed a year, but it's, it's... It's too many syllables. 2022 Memorial Hermann Ironman Texas men's podium coming at you from uh, the finish line down with Mike Riley. It's going to be good. And thank you for correcting me. I did uh, had somehow I'm two years behind. Is that I think what threw me off was just these dates like the 2021 World Championship is next month. The Olympics for 2020 were in 21. It's just a weird thing. But here's Mike Riley. You are an Ironman 
Trevor. I think we're actually still sitting here waiting on those official results to be sort of formalized. And so as we do that, you got to look at that uh, empty podium, but we'll get you the superstars to top it soon. Uh, more action with Joss and McCauley. Yeah, you can see those abrasions. Someone said maybe she was handing off her bike and had a little snafu in T2. Uh, but it's not, it's not really hindering her. It, it looks like it is, but she is so tenacious, I think, and so tough that we're watching Joss and McCauley do just what she came to do. And here's that story you're talking about. This is Lauren Brandon. She is fighting, and you're starting to see a little bit less lift in her stride, a little bit more uh, struggle, if you will, which is appropriate. But what we have to hold on for is, does she get caught? Does she hold off uh, Joanna Ryder from Switzerland, or, or is there going to be a catch? Yeah, definitely this is probably the story right now of the women's race. Like, who is going to be where on that podium? I mean, obviously, Jocelyn McCauley is, like, prime to be on top but then you've got lauren brandon who is is fighting you know she's fighting every step and she definitely deserves to be second today but deserving it and doing it are, yeah. are two different things and you know someone like joanna Ryder, she is strong on the run very strong on the run now we're doing our men's podium now take it away mike riley our top three male professionals in third place he hails from Sweden. A tremendous day at 8 hours, 8 minutes, 54 seconds. Welcome Jesper Svensson. Third place. Receiving his medal, his hat. Athletic Brewing beer. And that looks good. In second place, hails from Denmark. Broke eight hours with a 758-12 on his debut Ironman. Second place, Magnus Detlieb. Now let's bring up your Memorial Herman, Ironman Texas, men's champion. He swam 52-33. He rode 4-19-45, capped it off with a 2-40-20 run for a 7-50-7-58 from Tucson, Arizona. Welcome your champion, 38-year-old Ben Hoffman. And now a nice look at these top three finishers. Are. Put those flowers, put it up in the air. Cheers to one another. There you go. For today's race, these top three taking a toast there with that athletic brewing beer. Again, there you see it. USA, Denmark, and Sweden, an international field. We're excited to bring you the women's finish here in a matter of 30 minutes or so. Folks, stay with us. Uh, more celebration and more racing to be done. So stay with us, we'll be right back. There's this beautiful moment in time when neither foot is touching the ground. We are free of gravity and weight, moving above the doubts, past limits, when we are light, transformed and hopeful. And if we were to collect all these moments, join them together, well, this is when anything becomes possible. This is when we fly. Throughout my career, people have doubted my ability and I've had it even more so when I've come into triathlon. I think this year will be very different. There will be bigger expectations on me. I love the way that I race. With my swim background, I'm almost in the driving seat from the gun. I'm the person that everyone is chasing. I want to be the best and I'm willing to work as hard as possible to get there. And here we are back with our second place competitor here on this Hoka run course. 
That's Lauren Brandon from the United States. She's sandwiched between American Jocelyn McCauley in first and third place Joanna Ryder from Switzerland. Uh, still a good bit of racing to be done. Here in about a minute, we're going to see Jocelyn McCauley roll through 21 miles. So Jocelyn McCauley first place. She's got approximately uh, uh, 40 minutes to go. Uh, and that puts it back. You can add on to that for these uh, these gals here, second and third. Uh, but some exciting stuff. Take a look at those splits so far. 50-31, first out of the water, second off the bike in 455, and currently uh, rolling along uh, after the 17.7 mile mark. She's uh, fueling up here on the streets of the Woodlands. No, she's doing the right thing right now, making sure she's staying hydrated. Even though, you know, the sun's not out, it's still very hot and humid. We saw a lot of uh, what the conditions were doing in the men's race with cramping and a lot of the athletes were walking through the aid station. So, you know, right now it's just important to keep rolling, keep doing what you've been doing to this point, you know, still concentrating on your nutrition, concentrate on getting your core temperature down, staying relaxed and, you know, Lauren Brandon, you know, she may not be in the driving seat in terms of winning this race, but she's definitely, it's her chance to get on the podium, get second, and she really needs to keep pushing. Otherwise, she's going to slide down to that third place. And, you know, after being at the front of the race so long, I think she'd be disappointed with, with the third place right now. C correct. And I think she's also come here. You mentioned the, the growing confidence in her run. And uh, you look at her executing out here. You also want to finish. Uh, you don't want to sort of fall off and have the last a few miles be your lasting memory. She wants to hang tough, stay with that. And I, I really believe she can she can do that. Um, oh, cool. We're just getting word in that Joanna Ryder actually already does have her Kona slot. So that puts a little bit of safety in the slots here for these top two women. If Lauren bounces back, uh, she'll still go be able to get a slot. However, that doesn't detract from what we said. She wants to get that spot. She's been here this long. She wants to get second place. Uh, she's won an Ironman before, but you know what? She wants to uh, come in here to her former home or her home state of Texas and, and do exceptionally well. So and, let's see. And, you know, another reason why Lauren, you know, a Kona slot would be so important with her because it gives her a chance to work a little bit with Lucy Charles in the swim. That's you know, right. it's always, it, you know, it's nice if you're by yourself, but you have two very, very competitors swimmers at the beginning of the race at a world championship. That can have a huge impact on how the rest of the race goes for the other athletes who aren't as good as swimmers as these two. There you go. And now we're watching some uh, some great footage here of this athlete, Lauren Brandon, chugging along in, uh, in bib number three. Uh, I think uh, a couple notables with her. She she and her husband, her husband raced pro for, for a number of years. Uh, great little team setup they have there. Good support. Moved to Utah. Trained in Colorado a lot under the tutelage and the teamwork of Julie Dibbins. Um, speaking of which, we've We've seen her out and about on the course uh, virtually. She's communicated with us, and she did let us know that Dee Dee is Dee Dee Griesbauer is uh, being tended to. Actually, uh, still in medical, still t tending to her, taking care of her. But uh, reports are that she's in favorable condition, so she's with her husband Dave. So uh, we appreciate all the input and the updates from that side, from that camp out there. And don't forget, Lauren's almost a local here. You know, she's she's actually uh, lived here. Um, and she's raced like Ironman Texas, obviously, a few times. And she actually lived here for 10 years. Yeah, so, she, yeah. you know, definitely, again, to be able to be on the podium. And, you know, if she does get that second place, she's going to be super happy with her race. For the, for the first time I ever saw her race was in Galveston. It was not the 70.3. It was a race where they swam from a boat into, into shore. And she leapt off that boat and swam away from uh, a, a, a Jasmine Onik, who is a, a silver medalist at the uh, Junior World Championships behind uh, behind uh, Lisa Norton, uh, just to pull up some history. The point is, she hit the water and dropped the best of the sport, <laughs> essentially, in the water. And we were like, hey, keep an eye on her. I remember those days uh, like they were yesterday. So I agree with you. She's got a good, strong Texas connection and um, also lived in the Fort Worth area for a while, if I'm not mistaken, before moving up uh, to uh, Utah. But 
she she's just also someone that connects really well with uh, the fans. People enjoy interacting with her. Very inspirational. Great. Everyone enjoys her as a training partner. You know, she's just a, a great gal. So you can't really say enough uh, about her. And um, she probably wants me to shut up now because she's also pretty modest. You know what I mean? <laughs> no, she certainly was <laughs> right when she said her, her prep was really good. And, and she sort of felt that, you know, when she goes into those training camps with her coach and the rest of her athletes that Julie Divins coach, it really gives her a lot of confidence. And when you talk to athletes about confidence and how they get it, you know, sometimes it's a race that they've done before. Sometimes it's a Pacific workout. But for Lauren, it's that group environment being in a, in a training camp. So yep. she's going to be I, she's going to be super excited, you know, getting on the podium at Ironman Texas. I mean, she still looks so smooth. We probably have less than an hour of racing to go, which a lot of things can still happen. But, you know, she hasn't really faltered. She's just been yeah. steady. Her Correct. turnover, yeah, she's definitely looking a little bit more fatigued, uh, not quite as upright as I would like to see, but that's the little level of fatigue that starts to seep in. And, you know, a little bit of core strength uh, is super important right now, you know, that little glute strength. But, you know, she, she's being smart. She's carrying her hydration for as long as she can. She's got um, calories in a bottle that she's carrying. So she's making sure she's doing everything right. Yep. And, you know, she has a great resume from being like a swimmer to being able to be on a podium. You know, she's really worked hard on her bike and her run. And it's really exciting to see that she is running really well today. I agree with you 100%. As I look through this top 10, notable to say that Matt Russell, American pro uh, Ironman athlete, finished in ninth. He has completed every single pro race here at Ironman Texas, every single one, and uh, didn't obviously compete last year when it was age group only. Uh, but that's notable ninth place, so good to see him back up there. Trevor Foley, the other American, so uh, three Americans in that top. We've got Milan Bronos from Belgium. He's in there as well. Uh, so uh, I'm sorry, not from Belgium, um, uh, but uh, but rather I'm going to have to look him up. But I'm, I guess what I'm doing is I'm looking through the results because we had questions on Facebook. What happened to Sam Laidlow and what happened to um, – uh, Richard Varga, we don't have results for them. Our understanding is that they uh, they may have dropped up, but we don't have confirmed results. We'll get back to you when we do. Uh, obviously, a lot of fun watching Laid Low and, um, and Varga at the front, McKeeley, for a long time. And now that we've lost them, uh, thank you very much. The Netherlands, I appreciate that, Torsten. <laughs> it's a little slippy on my uh, on my recall there. Uh, so uh, giving giving credit that Milan Bronos is from the Netherlands. And now back to the matter at hand. We've got two champions here on screen on the left side of your uh, picture there. We've got Joss McCauley right side, Lauren Brandon, a great way to compare them side to side. Uh, you know, just <laughs> the biggest similarity, they're both fighters. No, exactly. They are, you know, and that's how the race has been all day long. You know, they've definitely done well on their strengths and that's why they're first and second right now. I mean, Lauren, obviously, a great swimmer. And then you look at Jocelyn McCauley, who's very balanced. Yeah. She's not the swimmer that Lauren is, but she was right where she needed to be. And then she was just patient on the bike, and she kept pushing and pushing and pushing until she got the lead and then headed into T2, came out in the lead, and she's been in the lead ever since. All right, it looks like we're going to go for a quick break. We'll be back with more of the women's action shortly. Whether it's on the road or in the pool, your activity has high demands. Rooted in sweat and grounded in science, we understand your unique fueling needs. That is why we created formulas just for you, endurance athletes, helping you replace what you're losing and keeping you fueled. And there's nowhere we'd rather be than with you along this journey, because together we are formulated for farther. 
from the creators of Gatorade. Gatorade Endurance, formulated for you, formulated for farther. Back to Jocelyn McCauley and back to the streets of the Woodlands here in the uh, beautiful backdrop there, Lake Woodlands, and of course all those fine residences on the other side of that uh, body of water. Jocelyn just continuing to do, as we said, look exactly the same as she did earlier. So we talked about it. Hey, there's a limp. It's notable. It's obvious. But if it worsens, we're going to have trouble. Uh, really, she looks about the same. Still kind of that same fidgety head movement. Nothing to worry about. She's just plugging along so consistent. And just essentially what I see here is I see Jocelyn McCauley just winning the race. And she's been doing it for a long time now. Now, she certainly has. You know, she set herself up on the bike to be in this position and yeah, we questioned a little bit about how she was looking form wise, but it really hasn't changed. And I mean, that's what we're looking for. We're looking for the person who shows the least amount of fatigue yeah. that looks the same from the beginning to the end, even though we know that they're getting more and more tired as they clock over the miles. But what I really like about what she's doing right now is like she's setting herself up for a Kona slot, which is super important. Get it done early. Yeah. Uh, that's always a bonus. And then to actually win your first race after a winter break, that's got to give her some good confidence going into the rest of the races for the year. And the nice thing with this race is the conditions are similar to Kona in the fact that it's hot and it's humid. So, it, again, it's nice early season prep for when she gets to Kona if she continues to dominate this race and cross that finish line in first place. Yeah, which it seems to be that she's doing. Uh, we can look back and also reference that back in uh, 2019 when she took second place here uh, in 8.39, uh, she ran a 2.59 marathon. Today she's on pace for more like a 3.13 uh, so we know she's about a half a minute per mile off of that pace. 30 seconds is notable. Uh, it's irrelevant uh, to win or lose. It's She's still in the winning position, and she didn't win last time, but it's just notable. And as I say that, I'll talk about finishes that are notable. And to me, pretty much all of them are notable. Whether five days ago or five years ago, the feeling of an Ironman or an Ironman 70.3 finish stays with you forever. Relive the emotion of the finish line with a permanent memento, the Breitling Endurance Pro Ironman Finisher timepiece, featuring the signature black and gold accents of the Ironman Finisher collection, and embossed with the Finisher series on the back. This watch offers precision timekeeping in a lightweight luxury form. It's the perfect way to commemorate your achievement in a lasting and momentous way. Show yourself that anything is possible. Wear the Breitling Endurance Pro as a reminder of this time, anytime. Discover more at IronmanStore.com. Yeah, anything is possible in an Ironman, that's for sure. That's why uh, we're not saying it's over until everyone crosses the finish line, that's yeah. for sure. But here we have in the in the top frame, we have Josh and McCauley, who's, you know, both these athletes have been in the lead. Lauren was in the lead early in the race. Jocelyn definitely has taken over. She, you know, she dominated the bike. Not running as quick as we thought thought that she could and what she can do, but doing what she needs to do to be in the position of leader. And then yeah. we have Lauren Brandon, who is having a great run. You know, she was, she's becoming an all round athlete, you know, and a force to be reckoned with because somebody who can swim like that, you know, if she can just keep improving her, her run, she's definitely a threat for a top five or a podium in any race that she does. Yeah, you got it. So uh, coming back here to those those two pictures, upper left, Jocelyn McCauley, bottom right, Lauren Brandon, exciting racing throughout. These these two have been have been fighting, if you will. Uh, they did have kind words when uh, Jocelyn overtook Lauren. I assume they looked like kind words. Uh, but the interesting thing to see here is on this course about five years ago, uh, Lauren Brandon set her, her Ironman PR at at, for the run at 319. Uh, so chiseling that PR down, I think she's she's possibly going to do that today. Uh, but also you have to remember that those splits, really where they're relevant is just in the in the mind of the athlete, given the confidence and pushing forward to that next victory, that next race. Uh, because when she won Ironman Boulder, 
it was a ridiculously hot day, and, and she wasn't anywhere near that time uh, for running. I think she ran about 3.36, but it was ridiculously hot, and it was uh, up at a higher altitude, and, and so she got that win by a different different run split. But it's, it's interesting to see she's, to this date, been really focusing on Ironman and has finished 14 Ironmans as a pro. Uh, so she's obviously got the the history now in her legs. And uh, you can see her kind of struggling here, McKeely. It, it, it looks a, a little bit less even. You know, you can see kind of a little bit more of the arms trying to really will the legs to get going, uh, which works fine. Uh, but you can see she's kind of struggling a little bit, maybe a bad patch, but nothing to worry about. She's still uh, she's still making good good movement forward. And I think if we compare, like, the 2019 race to this race right now, yeah, a lot of the athletes talked about in 2019 how oppressive, hot it was but I think the wind has been a big issue here and the temperature may not is has been as high but wind dehydrates you mm -hmm. it dries your skin definitely you know it's an advantage that you get the tailwind but the headwind you know you're going to burn more calories That's you've got right. to push more power you know how is that affecting the run right now like everyone seems to be running slower than they ever have on this course, even though everyone was saying how hot and humid it was in, in, in 2019. And, and that's where the bike has such a huge impact on how you feel on the run and how fast that you can run. And like, we're seeing that as evidence right now, because, you know, this is a fast bike, but it takes a lot more out of you than what you really realize. And I think a lot of the age groupers are going to see that as well. I, you know what? I agree with you. And I'll say this to back up your point. Ben Hoffman and Magnus Dietlieb, two incredibly strong, well-trained cyclists. The miles they have in their body, massive. I think that strength enabled those. Their strength through that windy bike enabled them to run the 240 that they did, each of them. That's uh, totally on point there, McKeeley. Great mention and we will cover more of this race in just a second. Please stay with us. Here we are back into the wooded paths of Texas here in the woodlands. And uh, this is a section where certainly you're not feeling any love from the elements, right? A tiny bit of shade, but I feel like these areas, I remember them to be very humid, a little bit more stifling, uh, just a little bit of love in there from the uh, Texas elements. But I guess we'll give them the shade, so that helps. Um, either way, I, I say this as a point of reference so you can see exactly how hard it is for Lauren uh, to be plugging through this particular section of the course. It's, it's still, I have to say, one of, the, one of the finest courses that we have on the circuit. Yeah, and we mentioned that, you know, it looks like this is a cool part of the course, but it's it's not because the trees are sort of preventing the breeze because they're such beautiful, lush tree yeah. trunks that, you know, it's going to stop any breeze. Yeah, you're yeah. going to get a little shade, but this it's stillness. And, you know, stillness when you've got humidity isn't a good combination when, when you're trying to run fast, let alone run a marathon after riding 112 miles. So they're sort of going to be please that there's shade but the reprieve is probably going to happen once they get out of this where they'll get a little bit more breeze on their skin to help cool them down a little bit yeah i think that's absolutely fair and here coming out getting a little spectator support uh, again we've talked about how great the tri clubs across the uh really across the state come to this event the locals that are here multiple tri clubs in in this region in houston houston proper houston suburbs 
all throughout uh, this this area. So you, they get out there. They love it. They watch it. They're inspired. They have some fun. You saw Hippie Hollow. What a great uh, little boost of energy there. Something goofy, but something different. And so certainly uh, this race uh, draws them in. You can see him lounging there. And there it is, Hippie Hollow giving her a little drum action. He's beating the can. Uh, running along, and that's kind of a little bit fired, you know, fire you up and a little bit annoy you. Say, I got to get out of here, get rid of that guy, uh, run a little bit faster. Either way, it's effective. I love that zone. How creative is that, McKeeley? I mean, imagine what it's going to be like a little bit later when it gets a little dark and the lights yeah. are on. Yeah, yeah it's going to be, the, it's, yeah, the fun party zone, that's for sure. And I mean, isn't that what it's about as well when you're like racing? Yeah. It's that community support that really like makes you think about how cool that race was. And, you know, even though in the moment you're like, oh my goodness, that's really loud and annoying. Like afterwards, that's the moment. So you're going to remember and you're going to go, hey, how cool was it when we were going yep. through that section and they were like beating on the garbage drums. Like that's what I love about triathlon, right? It's not just about you on the race course, even though it is, it's that whole community that really like embraces triathlon. And that's what I love when we get races that come to communities like this. They see the benefit of what triathlon can bring to the community and the success stories that come out of hosting a race at these venues. That's right. I totally agree. And uh, I think it was kind of fun. I, I believe uh, Jesper Svensson, Svensson also mentioned that when he was out there on the run and how cool it was uh, to run through that zone. He did remember it. He did get impacted by that. And it's, it is cool. Have a look at those splits as we approach uh, the end here, at least the final uh, under 5K or under three miles for Jocelyn McCauley. She's eight hours, 39 minutes into this race. She is doing an incredible job managing everything uh, that you have to manage when it comes to Ironman racing. We're looking at predicted finish times here coming up real soon where they say, all right, she's going to be at the uh, 40.8 kilometers at, at 322. So, uh you know, for about about 13 minutes, and then after that, she's going to have another another uh, K and a half. So realistically, uh, we're going to see her under 20 minutes. So you can kind of say right around that nine-hour barrier, we should see her just a tick under, just a tick over. So getting close here for Jocelyn McCauley fans and, and family who's out there, get yourselves ready because here she comes. No, she's certainly coming along, that's for sure. And, you know, still looking very, very consistent. Like, not a lot of changes from the start of the run to now. The paces, yeah, they're a little inconsistent, but that's just a reflection on the course. That, yes. Yeah, they say it's flat, but there are some punchy little sections that, you know, you have to work a little bit harder, and that definitely disrupts your rhythm on this course. And then, you know, you've got the windy sections. So, you know, you have to be a little bit savvy how you run those windy sections because you can definitely lose time or gain time by how, how you run each curb. And then, you know, you've got the long straights. So, you know, you can really, like, try to focus on maybe the person's in front now that, you know, you're getting to the conclusion and there's more and more age groupers. Or you can think about thinking about your form, a good technique. You know, I always tell people, try to control what you can control. So on the run, you can control your form. You can control taking some belly breaths. You can control on thinking about what do I need at the next A station. You can also control, okay, I just need to get to the next palm tree or I just next need to get to the next athlete. So there's little, little mental games that you can play, especially at the closing stages where definitely your mental um, focus tends to wane a little bit. So it's important just to keep control of the things that you can control. Great, well said, and good advice from a coach to a lot of folks that uh, didn't even pay the monthly bill. They just tuned in to watch this broadcast. Uh, but but it's good advice. Uh, it's good advice to take down some of these these ideas. And now we're back to Lauren Brandon. Uh, she's controlling what she can in the moment, and you kind of are always obsessing, uh, uh, um, assessing. You may be obsessing as well. But I think what's important is that when you're an Ironman uh, competitor, finisher, participant, what do you want to call it? You've, you've really got to be vigilant all day long. And it becomes a little bit tiring, but you can't sort of zone out. It's not it's not really that way. You can't, if you zone out, suddenly you forget uh, to pay attention to the fluid intake or the calories or the rhythm or the pace. And I think that's really important. You, you, you want to control what you can control and you want to just, you want to kind of continue to assess. If I feel good, 
what can I do to keep feeling good? If I feel terrible, what put me here? Do I need to, how do I get out of this bad state? Or how, you know, what caused it? Is, is there something I can do? Or if, if, back to your point, you can't control it, just weather it. Just sort of like, I don't know. What about folks? Does anybody here work? I think so. If you work, if you sit at a desk all day and you work eight or nine or 10 hours, is it likely that you're going to go through the day and not have a lull or a, a point where you get angry, hungry, tired, or, or mad or sad? I mean, it happens to us. It's life. And so that's kind of the same on the Ironman course, right? Where occasionally you get happy, angry, mad, sad, or, 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 or upset. So, or hungry or hungry again. <laughs> really hungry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I know that feeling well. Every afternoon around two o'clock, I'm like, what am I going to eat? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, when's dinner? Yeah. No, but that's the thing about Iron Man. You know, you, you're challenging yourself. You're challenged by the elements. You're challenged by nutrition. You know, it's getting all those pieces together in a nice small little box, putting a little bow on it, and then getting to the finish line and you're going, you know what? I did the best I could on the day that I was given. That's right. That is correct. And uh, yeah, well said. So here we are again, taking some of these uh, uh, intricate turns and tours throughout the woodlands, some of these residences. I imagine if you lived there, you bought this house uh, uh, more than 11 years ago. You didn't expect that one day you'd see uh, folks running through your neighborhood, uh, completing one of the most difficult endurance events on the planet. And I bet most of those folks are very inspired by this moment where you get to see this because have a front row seat from their couch of, of uh, again, the world's best and, and just folks that really want to challenge themselves. First finisher to last finisher, that's what it's all about. Challenge. Uh, you sign up for this because you want that challenge. To some degree or another, you're you're not someone that just wants to get by, and, and that's admirable. Uh, giving yourself that stimulus and that challenge. I keep doing that. So here we are, and we're getting close to uh, the finish line for three, four, five, six, all of our folks today. Uh, but certainly these top three in the women's race. In uh, a couple seconds, we'll be back. But right now, we're going to take a break. So stay with us. We'll be right back. And here we are, second place racer, bib number three from USA, Lauren Brandon, and she's plugging along nicely. I think she's come back into a nice rhythm. I think maybe she was in a bad patch earlier, uh, but she looks great, kind of ticking them over. A great run by my estimation. She's she's rolling through. Uh, you can see that they've covered that 23.5-mile marker, uh, but we're actually a little bit closer to the next one, the 25-mile marker. Uh, so... In fact, at by the watch, six minutes, we'll see uh, Jocelyn McCauley come across that line. And then the estimate is uh, about seven minutes behind that is where Lauren is. So about 13, 14 minutes, we'll see Lauren come across this next uh, marker at, uh, of course, 25.4 miles. And then really you're home. I mean, that's that's so I shouldn't say that you're never home until you're home, right? Exactly right. Never count your <laughs> chickens until they're hatched. That sounds like it's, a good expression. We should use that more often. It's Yeah, it's definitely a good expression getting to that finish line. That's for sure. Lauren Brandon, you know, definitely struggled a little bit through some of the stages of the marathon. But I think the confidence that she's going to get from this race is the fact that, you know, she stayed steady. She slowed down a little bit. It's getting really, really windy out there. I don't know if you noticed how yeah. much the trees are, are playing havoc on uh, the course right now, but that's like a strong breeze, and that's going to have an impact on the run and your level of hydration as well. But 
what I'm saying is the nice thing with her run, it's like she was steady. Yeah, she dropped off a little bit, but now she's finishing strong. And I think, again, if she can keep that confidence rolling forward as she moves forward into this season, you know, as I said, you know, she can be a top top five, top ten contender in Hawaii. She's got the tools for it, mental and physical, for sure, and I would love to see that uh, continued progression for uh, Lauren Brandon. As uh, as we come back and we kind of look at uh, the overview here, um, she's she is coming, I think, out of a bad patch or continuing to push into a good patch. Uh, she's really rolling along well. And a heck of a show here, uh, to be honest. When you look back at some of the times she's raced Texas, I think uh, we saw her – uh, we saw her finish this in 2018 in, in a year that was, she did 920. And so realistically, she's going to be under that 920. Uh, we like to see progression. Uh, we'd also, we'd also seen her do a 906 back in 17. And we saw her, um, we saw her do, uh, actually we saw her crack, gosh, we saw her crack uh, nine hours uh, back on a really fast day in 2016. Very good year uh, for the race. Patrick Langa won it that year, and uh, Julia Geyer from Germany. So great, uh, great racing. Gosh, I keep thinking back and looking at some of the results and thinking of some of the stories. We always see good turnout at this event. It's never kind of a flop year, you know what I mean? It's never one where people kind of just pass by. It always brings in good talent, good competition. And uh, it's already been long enough that I'd already forgotten about the amazing sprint finish. I can't wait to watch that on recap. I uh, almost fell off my chair when that one came up. No, definitely the the men's race had us on the edge of our seat uh, and it definitely came down to uh, a few hundred metres to decide who the champion was going to be today and that was Ben Hoffman, you know, a great uh, ambassador for Iron Man, you know, definitely a family man. Um, him and his wife sort of run the triathlon business together because, you know, she basically does his social media you know, does his website design. So, you know, it's nice that you can control that and invite your family in to to help you with it. And I think that makes it super personalized. And I think that's why he has such a good following as well, because, you know, you, you're seeing the real yeah. Ben Hofton out there. There's no pretense that everything is happy and go lucky. And one thing that I like about Ben is the fact that, you know, he understands that as you get older, you don't often get these opportunities to feel so great and, and, and race at your best. Uh, I mean, let's be honest. You, you're referencing Kel Kelsey Hoffman. And Kelsey, she's really the brains, the humor, and the looks of the entire operation. She's really carrying the team. And so while their children are also gorgeous, we'll just really talk about Kelsey for now. No, you're, you're spot on. It's a family biz. It's awesome. They're great. Down in Tucson now. Used to have them here in Boulder, which was great. Uh, but, uh, but certainly... This family, we love them. We love seeing them excel. They're a true triathlon family, and they're doing great at the uh, top of the professional sport. Which is so funny because our leader, Joshua McCauley, is very similar, very family-orientated. Yes. yes. Um, right Correct. now we're, we're back on to Lauren Brandon. She's looking really, really good this point in the race. And, you know, the secret right now is just keep moving forward, just like we see Joshua McCauley right now. You've just got to keep moving forward, you know they're going to start to get excited that they are getting through the closing stages of this Ironman marathon. And, you know, at some point that that hype starts to creep <laughs> up and creep up. As much as you try to push it down, it creeps up and creeps up. And, you know, when you sort of sense that, you know, you're almost done, it's like that's a really nice feeling. It's, as much as you try to keep it at bay, I mean, that's part of the excitement of that finish because – all of a sudden, you know, you've been in this emotional state of you don't know what's going to happen. You know, things are going great. And then, you know, you're in the first position, you're in the second position, you're going to be on the podium, you're going to get a Kona slot. You know, you just got to keep thinking positive and keep controlling the race. So keep control of your nutrition, keep control of those ups and downs, get through when you're feeling bad. Because, you know, they do, even though you're getting closer and closer to the line, you know, it's not like it's getting any easier. Definitely about, the easiness comes from the fact that you know that you're almost there. How about that slap there of the bongo from Lauren Brandon? Another good sign there. You get a little uh, action. And uh, and then, 
and then you know shows the spirit shows her that she's pretty excited um and uh that's a good thing so late in the game you want to keep that excitement you want to keep that going and uh take a look at that leaderboard because some interesting stuff we have seen jen Ennett pop through also look further down we were talking a lot earlier about danielle lewis and she's obviously uh faded a bit and lost quite a few spots she's still in the hunt she's still in the fray for this uh uh first iron man of hers but yeah, I, I don't think earlier we were thinking she was going to grab a podium spot with her run pedigree, but certainly not today uh, going to see that. And our other rookie out there is the Japanese athlete of Ai Ueda. I mean, she's actually been pretty steady. I mean, she was about that seventh and eighth position out the water, and it looks like she's going to finish around seventh right now. So I think that's pretty good to be top 10 in your first ever, you know, Ironman. And, you know, she was great on the ITU circuit, um, had so many podium finishes. So she definitely has had a very successful career. So to sort of be more towards the end of your career and step up to Ironman racing, it's not like you have fresh legs. You know, your motor neurons are tired, fatigued, because you've been in the sport for a long time. But sometimes that little change of that training regimen that you go from ITU style to Ironman can really benefit you when you start racing Ironman maybe a bit later in, in your career. There you go. And and let's do this. Let's talk, call attention to these estimated time splits. We're estimating about three minutes away uh, from the finish line for our winner here today from USA, Jocelyn McCauley. And I can call her a winner and she's three minutes inside. That's not a done deal. I recognize that, but I will say that uh, she's getting darn close. Uh, so I tell you what, folks, if you're at home and you want to see this woman right here on camera finish uh, and see her family, her two young children, her husband, her mom and dad, they're all going to be there waiting for her as well as Mike Riley and a whole host of locals that are on hand and others that have traveled in. So great stuff. Jocelyn McCauley just Going to probably crack the nine-hour barrier here today, uh, but we'll see about that as she rolls in. Estimating three minutes, McKeely, could be close. Yeah, definitely. Uh, she she won't really know until she actually looks and sees that clock banner. But, like, right now, she's just going to be waiting and, and seeing the finish line. She's going to be wanting to hear Mike because he's going to be calling other athletes in and, it's sort of, that's the exciting part as well. You know, Mike Riley is so iconic. You know, you hear that voice and you and you know your day is almost over. And you're sort of making sure that you, like, keep going and keep focusing. But also, yep. as I said, you know, that, that excitement gets even more when you know the job is almost done. The job is almost done. That's uh, <laughs> that's something that pulls you in, right? The closer you get, what's the expression when you? We well, you can horse... always get yourself home, right? Yeah, that's true. <laughs> what what do you, what do you, what's the expression though when a horse is getting close to the barn? Right? <laughs> oh yeah, they like to yeah. they like to go home. Oof, that was a rough turn right there, and uh, I I I don't envy uh, the athletes this finish. Uh, certainly, she's not in a sprint finish, but it's still hard to make those hard turns like that, those difficult turns. Well, that's um, what we saw in the men's race, right? I think that's really what separated our our winner from our second place is the fact that one of them was way better in dealing with the turns on the course than the other athlete. And you know, you saw Magnus like he really suffered a lot more on those those tight corners coming into the finish line. Yes, you're right. A little bit more nimble, quick turning versus the the longer legs and longer stride. And certainly, when we were watching the two run, the 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 speed looked different, even though it was the same. You essentially, they ran the same marathon, got some distance between each other, but kind of the same, but looked very different throughout. And when you know you've got a lot of races in your legs, I think that showed as well that yes. you know definitely Ben's legs were tougher than Magnus's today. You know, he's so used to doing Ironmans for such a long time. You know, it's it's like I always tell people, it's like once you've been there, you can always go back there. But if you haven't been there, you've got to create an environment where you get to that point so you can keep reaching for it. Yes, that's right. That's right. And looking here down on these uh, great shots here, this uh, um, drone shot of the of the runners crossing the bridge. Um, 
realistically, I don't know. I just I love to to see the diversity. There we go, coming back in the diversity that we're seeing here of the course, houses, red, you know, uh, trees, residential foot footpath and now here we're at that final bend check it out trees are blowing as you said but this is that finish shoot and we are at the closing stretch of the 2022 memorial herman ironman texas today the champion going to make it four titles for this young lady out of the united states jocelyn mccauley taking out the crown today our champion Congratulations are in order and the smile to match. Uh, once again, Joss McCauley, the tears to match. You said there'd be tears, MJ. You said you'd probably have them as well. Great stuff as we're watching her come home, the hand in the air, our champion today. Congrats, Joss McCauley. Yeah, big congrats. Look at that family right there to support her. I mean, she's going to be so happy. And I hope Mike asks her a little bit about like her knee and that little hitch to see if we can get any info on that. But well done today. Fantastic effort. And she actually did go under nine hours. Officially, we don't have the time right now. But uh, by my estimate, she's definitely gone under nine hours as she greets, greets her two lovely daughters right now. How fantastic is that? You can cross the finish line and you still have the energy yes. to, to uh, pick up your kid. Look at that, with the little head noise canceling headphones there. So she's not too loud at the finish with that hubbub. And oh, she's upset. upset she's like, Mommy, you're hot yeah. in sweat. Yep. <laughs> no, fantastic. Yep. I mean, just that family environment and being able to finish, you know, as both these daughters get older, they're really going to cherish the moments and that finish line. Especially, you know, it's nice when you see something that your parent does. You may not realize in the moment, but later on in life, they're going to go, Mom, you were pretty cool. Yes, too pretty cool. And uh, I tell you what, we're going to we're gonna get the chance to rush on down with Mike Riley to the Hyper Ice Recovery Zone with our winner, Jocelyn McCauley. And I want everyone to hear from these two live. So I'm going to pipe down as we rush on down there with Mike Riley. Women's champion at the Memorial Herman Ironman, Texas, Jocelyn McCauley, second place in 2019. We go back, you were 15th place, 13th place, I mean, and now you put it all together with this race. When you finally took over on the bike, did you think anybody was going to catch you? Uh, I, there's always the, there's always the chance. You'd be stupid to think there's not. So um, I was biking scared and running scared. Like, those winds on that bike were just awful. So you never know what's going to happen when there's those kind of winds. Well, you, uh, you know, with the family here, they got in late last night, like at midnight, stayed up for the, for the, the girls. Uh, and it's got to be something that you can race and know the family is so behind you and so supportive. <laughs> don't, make me, don't make me cry. So supportive for you. Yes, it's unbelievable. I was able to see Emmy out there and then um, my daughter, Sydney, which we call Squid, um, out there on the last lap of the run course, and I was crying. So um, my family means everything to me, and um, they invest a lot in this. And, um, you know, jumping on the trampoline while I'm out on the trainer <laughs> and, um, you know, putting up with a mom who's, who's tired and wants to sit on the couch and just watch movies. <laughs> For, uh, for family night and stuff like that. So it's unbelievable, and they, I could not do this without 100% of their support. You know, I know you want to, you know, bask in the glory of this great win, but you know in two weeks you've made the commitment to go to the 2021 Ironman World Championship in St. George. Having this race under your belt, now that it's done, I know it's just quickly done. How do you think you're well prepared for that one? I think just two words, bring it. Bring it. <laughs> Jocelyn's going to bring it in St. George. I love that. You brought it here today. Congratulations. Let's bring him a go ahead, Tony. Trip Hippo from Denver, Colorado. You are an Ironman trip. And what do you think? You've been here a lot. What do you think of this Texas crowd? Oh, my gosh. It's just unbelievable. The support out there is just 
un, un, unparalleled, especially out there on the run course. It's just amazing. Like, I think I was sprinting along the waterway and then I would slow down a little bit and then sprint along the waterway. It's just because the, the support, you can't help yourself from picking it up a little bit. And um, so thank you all who is out, who are out there cheering and um, who know me, who don't know me. It meant a lot to me. Well, we know you, Jocelyn, and we know your career is going straight up. Jocelyn McCauley, everybody, your women's champion. Got the family in here. Isn't somebody's birthday tomorrow, too? I, I don't know. I, you know, that's not up to me. You'd like to have that for your birthday? I don't think anybody's going to argue here. I don't think. Okay. All right, from Zurich, Daniel Erdely, you are not. And here we are coming back to you straight away from the Hyper Ice Recovery Zone. What a great champion and really giving all the credit to her family. And it shows a super champion here for the Memorial Hermann Ironman Texas 2022 version. We're going to get back to you in just a second to see these other two finishers on the podium. Stay with us. There's this beautiful moment in time when neither foot is touching the ground. We are free of gravity and weight, moving above the doubts, past limits. When we are light, transformed and hopeful. And if we were to collect all these moments, join them together, well, this is when anything becomes possible. This is when we fly. Throughout my career, people have doubted my ability and I've had it even more so when I've come into triathlon. I think this year will be very different. There will be bigger expectations on me. I love the way that I race with my swim background. I'm almost in the driving seat from the gun. I'm the person that everyone is chasing. I want to be the best and I'm willing to work as hard as possible to get there. And we are back here running under one of these tunnels, one of these pedestrian crossovers here, looking at another turnaround uh, for Lauren Brandon, the woman on the beat. Gosh, she's coming close to the finish line, but uh, close really. No one wants to hear close. It's kind of like the cardinal sin of Iron Man is when a spectator yells out, you're almost there. Because you're never <laughs> almost there until you're actually in that finish shoot. I feel like she's almost there. You feel like she is. But you say that to her, you're lying. She's not almost there, right, until you do that last U-turn, <laughs> and then you're actually almost there. No. Uh, you know, it's one of those things where close, but not so close. And, you know, it's she's done enough Ironmans that she knows, you know, keep moving forward, keep controlling what I can control. You know, I'm not sure if she's aware what's happening behind her, but right now it looks like she does have that – second place wrapped up, which means she'll also get a slot to Kona. Yes. But let's have a little quick chat about Jocelyn McCauley. Let's do it. Right? Finish time, 8.58.13. 56 swim, a 4.43 bike, and a 3.13 marathon today. So just a well-rounded, balanced yes. effort. Yes. And, you know, leading into Ironman St. George in a couple of weeks – you know, definitely a different type of course, definitely the quality of the field being a world championship. But the thing about St. George, it's going to be a little bit war of attrition. So a good steady effort all day long, like she had today. Yeah, a more difficult course. But I think for her, that should be the goal. And I think she'll end up surprising a few people on that day. Yeah, absolutely. I, I mean, you know what? It's, it's interesting to me uh, to... Look at these athletes that are doubling up like that and, and, and hitting it hard here and then hitting it hard in two weeks. It's going to be – that's one of those things that you really can't predict. And even Ben said this. I'm going to get everything I'm going to cover, but it, it might tank. You might find the legs are great for a certain period of time. They might not. We'll find out. But, gosh, they certainly have proven that they're ready to roll. Um, I tell you what, you, I mentioned Ben Hoffman, and all you guys want to know, how did it play out? Well, here's the story. This is how our race got underway. First off in the Roca swim down in Lake Woodlands. And I 
say it started with a cannon sound at 6.25 a.m. All the professional men got after it. And right away, Richard Varga from Slovakia got to the front. We thought he was going to be a solo flyer, but he had company the whole way. He alternated who he was towing through, but the end result was that he strung that field right out and made everyone work for every inch and every stroke and every bit of movement throughout that water. He came out not breaking the course record in the non-wetsuit swim, but certainly giving us a show, a display um, of, of strength and power. He meant business. Simon Shee came out, and I tell you what, he looked great as well. You saw him popping up on shore. And then out onto the bike, McKeeley, it was a wild one out there. We saw two guys get away um, together. We thought that was going to be uh, one of the defining moments as they headed out on the two-lap course uh, south of the woodlands towards Houston proper. When they did so, uh, what they didn't plan on, and those two men being Sam Laidlow and, of course, Richard Varga, those two men, I don't think they counted on what was going on behind them, uh, nor should they have, but they lit it up there, Sam Laidlow. And when the wind started kicking up, it started getting a little testy out there. Uh, things started to get a little bit interesting. Laidlow even lost his uh, visor in that wind as he turned back. Uh, but the man on the move was Magnus Ditlev from Denmark. He came in and did what Uber bikers do, and he passed them all. He actually maximized the tailwind to get off the bike despite a flat tire still in contention. Once out on the run there, that three-lap Hoka run, we saw Laidlow get right into it, and we thought he was going to be a podium fixture. Uh, Richard Varga as well looked so light on his feet, but both men ended up cramping up pretty severely and ben hoffman capitalized on those weaknesses and he went for it the man that ultimately got into a different battle down the road really looked infallible in those early miles and those middle miles of the race did leave after overcoming the flat tire mentally strong he came back up and chased ben hoffman until he caught ben hoffman we had a dane we had an american and we had a battle at hand through these bike paths and these twisty, turny uh, circuits throughout the woodlands. We thought for sure a sprint finish was going to be on tap, but we didn't expect one that exciting. Hoffman, the American, seconds in front of the exhausted Dane, both men on the carpet before we got to see Jesper Svensson from Sweden close out the podium. What a day here for the Memorial Hermann, Ironman, Texas, a true international podium. And then... We're going to rush right back to live action with our women's race where we're getting ready to watch our second place finisher from the USA get across the line. And here she is, Lauren Brandon. She wears number three, but she is going to cross the line in second. And look how excited she is. You know, she had a great day, a great swim, which we expected. Solid on the bike, but I was impressed by her run today. What a way to get to the finish line. Emotional, a big smile, obviously uh, exhausted. But there she is, uh, probably, uh, I think, kind of comparable to some of her times before. I think she's done 9.06 here, 9.20. 9.10 is a solid show. But, a but I think the conditions here, as we, we heard earlier, that the wind had a significant impact on the times today. And a 319 run, something we've seen before, and I would agree. I think that the the wind it sucked the legs out of them on the uh, on the bike, and I think it hurts them on the run. So I would not disagree with you one bit there. Uh, and as we come in here, uh, we're watching another age group finisher from above. What a great finish stretch to come in here and get some high fives and get some love from the crowd as you come across the line. But a great day of racing, and we do still have another exciting finisher to come across the line. We are understanding it is Switzerland's uh, Joanna Reeder, who does have her Kona slot. She's going to come in there, won't be disappointed to, to not get the two today because uh, she's already got that in the back pocket, which is a great place uh, from which to come at this competition. And, you know, Joanna Ryder, like, just worked hard. From the swim, she was down. On the bike, you know, definitely the bike is her strength. And then she just kept piping back people on the run. And that's why she ended up on the on the podium because we had a couple of athletes that were out early that struggled on the run. And then you had Joanna that was 
just a little bit more consistent as we can see her in the picture right now. That's right, nice drone shot here looking down, watching some finishers come through, watching all these competitors get to that finish line. It's always a spot, you said it, the best part of Ironman is the finish line, and how could you disagree uh, with that statement? Uh, that's a quick that's a quick run there, uh, chasing that motorbike down to make this final U-turn around that uh, fence line before uh, she gets to cruise on back. Uh, rider out of Switzerland, an accomplished racer. We saw a fourth place in Cozumel a handful of months ago and now trying to push on for uh, to progress, get that third place finish. Look at that, a 105 uh, swim, a five flat bike, and then a quick run here. Uh, we're going to see she was 257 through the 25 miles. Wow, going to be the fastest run of the day uh, thus far. And we'll get that split to you in just a second. And, and that's she why she's finished third on the podium. That run really got her across the line today, just like it did uh, earlier last year in uh, Lake Placid. That's right, all the time. Yeah, great stuff. I mean, this this uh, uh, Swiss athlete has a lot of accomplishments here in the Ironman world and a great smile. Super happy to be there, I, I'd say, and and to stop running. I feel like that's the thing is let me, let me just stop moving for a minute. I've been doing this for a while. I think she's going to be happy with her, her run for sure today, but that's sort of her style of, of racing behind on the swim, don't counter out on the bike, and then slowly she's going to move through the field, and today with the fastest run out of everyone. 302 was the magic number here that stopped the clock on the on that uh, Hoka run course for Joanna Ryder. And uh, looking down at that red carpet and seeing all those folks receiving these athletes, it, it really is a time to say how grateful we are to be back, not only in commentary watching this live action, the pro race, and all these age groupers, but also just to be back to a semblance of our old normal, where we get to be out there uh, grabbing each other and hugging each other at the finish line. Uh, so it's a beautiful thing to watch these athletes get the job done uh, for sure. So Joanna Ryder, we're gonna get to hear from her as well, because of course we zip on down there to Mike Riley, who's in the hyper race recovery zone with Lauren Brandon, who took second. From Utah, Lauren Brandon. Lauren, we know you always get out of that water with such a strong swim. You did have a strong bike after Jocelyn passed you. You seem to sustain a great pace out there, kind of by yourself. Yeah, obviously it was a super windy day and really tough out there. And so the headwind, I just tried to do my best not to push too hard, like more than I knew I could handle because I wanted to get off and have a good run. So I think I biked within myself so that I could come off and feel good on the run. Yeah, you look good. You look fluid on the run. You've got to be proud of the training you're putting in on the bike and the run to be able to come in in a great time like this. Yeah, I'm super happy. I can't thank Julie Dibbins enough, my coach. It has been a pretty rough couple years, and I'm so happy to have a good one today. So thank you, everyone, for the support out there. You love Ironman Texas. Isn't that support? How would you like this? One of the aid stations or two, huh? It's amazing. My favorite is the hippie village or whatever and everyone's just running after you and I even played the drums each lap I was proud of myself <laughs> I tried to keep a smile on my face um, yeah but this support here is absolutely amazing so thank you so what's uh, what's next on your racing agenda do you want to share that at all I had nothing planned until after I did this race and I got my Kona spot today so definitely Kona so I'll talk to Julie and see what we should do to get ready for that Good for you, because I don't even know what the, uh, I know it's two men, two female, but I don't know how it's been. You know better than I do. Congratulations. All right, we're going to bring Joanna Ryder in. They're giving each other a hug. Joanna, Sweden, I, third place. We were together at Ironman Lake Placid last July, where you took a third. So ecstatic, so happy. You're the same happy today, aren't you? Exactly. And, uh, yeah, in Lake Placid, I got my qualification for St. George. And now I'm already qualified for Kona, so, but yeah, I'm still so happy to, to finish third with uh, those unbelievable athletes. They are so strong, so uh, yeah, I'm super happy. What was, the, what was the toughest part about the race for you today? Oh, it was, it was the bicycle. I did so much, uh, so many errors. I, I fall at, <laughs> again, <laughs> at a mid station. Um, yeah, because of uh, Nate Cooper, you know, she just cut the way and was like, oh shit. <laughs> But, uh, 
Yeah, and I, I took the, the wrong way at the beginning. You know, someone told me on the left side, and I was left, and then I was like, but I'm lost, <laughs> and it was right. So, but yeah, it was it was great. Too. Then I had to push more. But uh, <laughs> how do you, how do you like this uh, Iron Man Texas crowd, huh? Oh yeah, it was incredible. Like in Lake Placid, in fact, like I, I said in um, in Lake Placid, I love to do races in the United States because the crowd, the supporters are incredible, really. Like the all day, the all night, they will stay, I'm sure. So thank you so much for all your support. I was uh, really, it gave me so much power. So thank you so much. Well, Joanna, we can't wait to see you in St. George in a couple of weeks also. Congratulations on your third place. Joanna Ryder, everybody. In just a little bit, we'll do a podium presentation. What a great show there. A great podium. Females. And it's nice to see USA, USA, and Switzerland on those top three. We will be back to give you a recap and a summary of that podium in just a minute. Please stay with us as we say a short goodbye. Whether it's on the road or in the pool, your activity has high demands. Rooted in sweat and grounded in science, we understand your unique fueling needs. That is why we created formulas just for you, endurance athletes, helping you replace what you're losing and keeping you fueled. And there's nowhere we'd rather be than with you along this journey, because together we are formulated for farther. From the creators of Gatorade, Gatorade Endurance, formulated for you, formulated for farther. And we're back here to the Woodlands and the 2022 Memorial Hermann Ironman Texas. We're going to have a podium celebration in a matter of moments. Get to see Jocelyn, Lauren, and Joanna jump up on the steps and celebrate their accomplishments. What a great moment, as I said before. We're so grateful to be back here in studio covering this exciting action and watching uh, these athletes of all caliber from all over the world push themselves to the furthest uh to their limits and beyond and and it, it really has been a treat uh McKeeley, before we get down there with mike don't you think it's just been a great race today oh both races were fantastic and you know the women's race to have jocelyn mccauley take the victory after finishing here second in 2019 you know you saw it she was super ecstatic her family the emotion the tears i think that really summed up the race for her that you know to win an Ironman is, is so very, very special. And then you had someone like Lauren Brandon who finished second. Another great performance today, you know, not probably the times that we were expecting, but that win played havoc on, on, on the bike for a lot of the athletes. I mean, they all mentioned how tough it was. And then Joanna Ryder does, did, does what she's done at Lake Placid, you know, a super strong run and finished third today. So. Amazing performances by our top three women today. You know, they, there was a time of 8.58 for the win, 9.10 for second, and 9.13 for the bronze, basically. You've got it, and I'll say this, the men's race, equally exciting there, uh, watching that sprint finish, watching uh, um, Ditleave come back from the flat and, and seeing uh, just Jesper Svensson be smart all day long. Pretty do, exciting stuff. Do you stuff. think, this is a question I have to you, do you think Magnus is going to be questioning what if? Oh, of course. Absolutely. 100%. He's going to go back and say, could I have won? Would I have won? How much would I have won by if I had only not flatted? But you know what? That's the what they say, the the, uh, the agony. We much defeat. preferred the way it ended. <laughs> I mean, to have like a finish so close. I mean, what a fabulous way to end the Correct. finish race with all the drama that was unfolding. Correct. Correct. And that's right. So as we look at this, you know what? That's why they created the expression, the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat you get to second guess it all but let's do this let's talk about those two men each of them going to be screaming for recovery and i'm going to say this hype race is, hype race is proud to be the official recovery partner of iron man athletes can immediately start their recovery journey by visiting the hype race recovery zone it's located beyond the finish line this area will be a critical stop on the iron man athlete journey Athletes are going to have access to Hypervolts, a percussion massage gun that relieves tension and stiffness. 
They're also going to be able to demo Normatec's compression leg system. A single session of that increases blood flow, uh, ridding muscles of lactic acid, and clearing the way for an accelerated recovery. So that's all there at the finish line. And I promise you, Ben Hoffman's probably still in those boots, okay? <laughs> he's got a race in two weeks. Uh, I have three of those athletes do, but... Yeah, he's great. probably going reset, <laughs> reset, reset, higher, higher. Especially, you know, because when you cross the finish line, your legs are going to be a, a little bit uncomfortable. So he's going to slowly crank up the numbers so that compression is even more. I, I agree. Uh, could not agree more. And I tell you what, we do, of course, get to look in on this podium and... We also get to see a recap. I think what we might follow up with here next too is just showing you guys how it played out. Uh, but but first, you'll get to see those three women jump atop the podium, and we're almost ready for that. Collecting the official results, and then we're going to zip back down there with Mike Riley and see them celebrate their accomplishments today, folks. Uh, here we go. We're going to give it away to Mike Riley. In third place with a total time of 9.13.24. She hails from Sweden. Let's welcome Joanna Ryder. <laughs> Rachel Zelenka is way to go, Rach, from Scottsdale, Arizona. In second place, from Colville in Utah. She had a day of nine hours, 10 minutes, 43 seconds. Second, welcome Lauren Brandon. Way to go, Robert, you're an Iron Man. Our Memorial Herman, Iron Man, Texas. Female champion from Eagle, Idaho. She swam 56.04, had a 4.43.02 ride, 3.13.51 for a total day of 8.58.13. Let's welcome your champion, 35-year-old Jocelyn McCauley. There they are, your top three with a tremendous day. Cheers, cheers, and, and yeah. Spoils to the victor. One more time with Joanna, Lauren, and your new champion, Jocelyn McCauley. And there you go. Those three women excelled above all others today. Thus, the podium celebration. What a moment. And trying to get down, possibly the hardest task of the day for Jocelyn McCauley and for all. However, you're wondering how it went. Well, here's the story. We started off in Lake Woodlands with the Roca Swim, one lap. And these women made quick work of that 2.4 miles. Lauren Brandon, she did what she always does, but she did it in a different fashion. Usually when she takes off, she takes off well and away from everyone in this instance she had company throughout the day. The beautiful stroke of Lauren Brandon was accompanied this time by another gorgeous uh, stroke, Rachel uh, Zelinsky there. <laughs> I've said that wrong, but she came out of the water just behind Lauren Brandon, and Lauren did not set a record, but she got herself free and clear of everyone as she tackled uh, transition two. A not an easy task, but it led to this bike course. McKeeley out on this two-lap course. Uh, really, things started to shake up right away because uh, Lauren got out second. And we thought, oh, wow, she's behind Rachel. What's going to go down now? And then she just went for it. At that moment, we knew uh, Lauren Brandon was going to set the tone and set the tempo, as she typically does. She later revealed to us she tried to be conservative and not chase when she got caught, trying to save a little for the run. Uh, a great gamble and something that you'll learn from. But Jocelyn McCauley, let me tell you, when she caught up, uh, we knew it was going to be an awesome race. 
Didi Griesbauer, who sadly and ultimately retired from the race in transition two, gave a great show on the bike, didn't she? As these women battled fierce headwinds uh, on the way out of town and benefited by the ensuing tailwind coming home. But it was quite a day, and we really believe that everyone from Jocelyn to Lauren to Didi had their legs drained dry from that wind out onto the run. Three laps of the Hoka Run course, Jocelyn McCauley just never looked back. Despite what appeared to be an obvious limp, she had no trouble staying away, getting away, and winning this race. We saw her out there kind of pushing through, noting that having her family uh, cheer for her was remarkable. And Lauren Brandon, always grateful, always uh, pushing the limits, also put on a great show. Her former home state of Texas welcomed her and pushed her along all three laps. She thought maybe for a second she was getting threatened by this uh, Swiss athlete, but ultimately uh, Lauren and Brandon was able to hold off Joanna Ryder. You see fueling at its finest there for Jocelyn McCauley. As she came home, a four-time Ironman champion was able to come around and really make it stick uh, despite a solid performance. Lauren Brandon really, uh, I think, chiseled out some great lessons, some great fitness, and really just put on a great show, didn't she? Looking forward to some more racing. Jocelyn, a huge smile at the finish line. We can call her a four-time winner of Ironman competition, taking out the title with a smile and greeted by her husband. There it is, a family affair. We talked about this. That's beautiful stuff there. Also beautiful is to see uh, this woman cross the line, ecstatic, grateful, and fast. Lauren Brandon giving herself a round of applause and snagging that second Kona slot. And then uh, what appears to be um, a very happy uh, Joanna Ryder. She came across and said, I had a couple struggles on the bike, but you know what? I'm happy. I'm going to St. George in two weeks. I'm going to Kona this fall. What could be better? No, exactly. What a fierce day. We had fierce wind conditions and we had fierce competition. You know, such a great race in the in the men's race as well. And that's right. What a show. This, of course, was the Memorial Hermann Ironman Texas. You got to see it here. For me, again, I said this when I saw it. Highlight of the day, watching Magnus Dietlieb come back from a flat tire and continue to fight. Not just fight, but get seconds away, inches away from the victory. Moment of the day amongst many great moments. McKeeley? Yeah, definitely. That was, you know, my moment for an athlete to fight adversity and have a sprint finish with our champion, Ben Hoffman. Definitely Magnus gets my vote today. And in the women, I mean, Jocelyn McCauley, like, looked solid all day long. You know, we sort of thought that maybe she faltered a little bit with that little bit of looked like an, in, an injury of some sort That's or a right. little hitch in her gait. Lauren Brandon, solid day. Joanna Ryder, what a runner. Amazing stuff. And I'll say this, it's been a pleasure to be back on behalf of McKeeley Jones. I'm Michael Lovato. We appreciate you joining us today for the Memorial Hermann Ironman Texas. We'll see you soon in two weeks time at the World Championship. For now, have a great day.